Hello and welcome to the introduction for this course. What are the course requirements? You need a computer and internet connection to follow along with this course. Who is this course for? This course is for anyone who wants to learn something new. What is the course format? The format of the course is video. Hello and welcome. In this video, I will introduce you to JavaScript. JavaScript is one of the three languages that a web developer must learn. What is JavaScript? JavaScript is a programming language that adds interactivity to your website. The interactivity can be when a button is pressed or when data is entered into a form. It can even be animations. So when you go to a website, anytime you notice some interaction or where you have to press a button, maybe complete a form, those interactions are made possible by JavaScript. When JavaScript is applied to an HTML document, it makes the document dynamic and it adds interactivity to the website. JavaScript was invented by Brendan H, who is the co-founder of the Mozilla Corporation, which also is responsible for the Firefox web browser. JavaScript is not Java. There is a completely separate language, programming language called Java. So they are both different in design and other aspects as well. JavaScript is one of the three languages all web developers must learn. The other two languages are HTML and CSS. Another key distinct feature of JavaScript is that JavaScript is case sensitive. So if you declare something with a lowercase and later on try to access that with an uppercase, it will not work because they are two separate things. It treats cases separately. So uppercase and lower and lowercase are two different things in JavaScript. So when you write in JavaScript code, you need to be careful with your cases. If you're using lowercase to define something, stick to lowercase. So that's it for this introduction to JavaScript. Thank you and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I will show you how to access the developer tool console. What is the developer tool console? The developer tool console is one of the most powerful and free tools available for you to debug your front end applications. By front end, I mean in things that you can access through the web browser. Debugging basically is a process of trying to find errors that have occurred in your web based applications. So when there's an error in your code, is usually referred to as a bug and the process of trying to detect and fix it is referred to as debugging. The developer tool is a very useful tool and the console within the developer tool also allows you to write and experiment directly with JavaScript. So you can write some JavaScript inside the console directly and use it to test different things. Almost if not all web browsers have a developer tool console and there are different ways you can access the developer tool console. The most common way is to right click on a web page. If you're on a web page currently, just right click on it and it will give you a context menu. Just select inspect element and that will give you access to the developer tool console. Another way to access it if you're on a Mac, there is a key
keyboard shortcut which is alt command and i that would take you directly into the developer tool console if you're on the windows it will be control shift and i i have opened up my web browser i'm using google chrome so i've opened up the google chrome home page and all you need to do you don't have to be a google any website or web browser you open is fine but i'm using google chrome to illustrate how to access the developer tool console just right click anywhere it doesn't matter and click on inspect yours may say inspect element as long as it's got the word inspect just click on it and that will open up the developer area so this area here is the developer tool areas and the one we're interested in is the console so click on the console and within the console is where you can do different things for example you can experiment directly with javascript on the console for example i could do five plus five and press enter and that will give me 10. i can do maybe 10 times two and press enter and that give me 20 so you can experiment with javascript directly inside the console the developer console you can also troubleshoot errors in your program if you got a web-based application that is having some errors or the program is not working as it should usually you can come to the console and you should see some error messages that will help you or give you a guide as to how to debug or fix the error messages that your application is experiencing there is no substitute for practice so in order to get better at anything you need to practice the developer tool and the console area here is a very good area for you to experiment with code especially with javascript so thanks for watching hello and welcome in this video i will explain what a syntax is what is a syntax in programming language a syntax basically refers to the vocabulary and grammar that is used to construct a program just like with the english language you'll have to create valid sentences using words and punctuations in programming the syntax is a set of rules that guides you in doing that so these set of rules will guide you as to how you construct your computer programs now every programming language has its own syntax just like american english is different in some aspects to british english so the syntax is basically a bunch of rules that enables you to construct a valid format and this also includes a combination of instructions that you use in putting a program together so let me show you a basic example of a javascript syntax so this is a javascript syntax it's just a basic one and in this example here we've got some key words here this word var is basically known as a variable it is used as a storage container so in this example here i've got a variable called first number and i'm using the equals to to assign it the value of seven so what that means is that this value seven is going to be stored in this container called first number and here i've got a value eight which is going to be stored in this container called second number so the the this number first number second number are names that i've given to this keyword variable var var is a keyword and part of the javascript programming language so it's a syntax component of the javascript programming language the equals to here is known as an assignment 
operator. It's also part of the syntax. It is used to assign a value. So whenever you see this equals to sign in a syntax, in a programming syntax, is basically referring to is is using that to assign a value. It's an instruction to assign. So what this is basically saying is I put this value seven inside this box called first number, put this value eight inside this box called second number. So this equals to is an assignment operator. It's known as an assignment operator. In some programming language, you, you don't necessarily have to put a semicolon after you've declared something in javascript you do once you declare a variable in javascript you need to put a semicolon that is part of the javascript syntax so every programming language has its own way of doing things which is referred to as a syntax so the key thing to take away when you see the word syntax is referring to a programming language's vocabulary and grammar basically what this means is basically a set of rules of how your programs are constructed thanks for watching and bye for now hello and welcome to this video in this video i will be introducing you to javascript variables what are variables in javascript JavaScript variables are containers for storing data values. In order to create a variable, you need to use the var keyword, which is spelled V-A-R. It has to be in lowercase. Also, when you create variables, creating variable means declaring variables. It's the same thing. When you declare variables, you have to assign a value to variables and you use the equal sign to assign values to a variable for example if i wanted to create a variable x i'm going to give it a value of seven also if i want to create a variable called say my car and i give it a value of posh when you are creating variables, it's always good practice to name your variables closely to what they are going to store, the type of data they're going to store. For example, here I've named this variable my car, which is an indication that the type of data I'm storing is relating to cars. Notice the two difference in the two values here. This one here, the value is seven, which is a number and notice here the value here is a posh and i've put quote around it when you are declaring variables if you are declaring a text you have to enclose it in quotes you either have to use single quotes or double quotes but you can't mix them you can't use a single quote here and then a double quote here that's the only way the computer will understand that it is dealing with a text you need to enclose the values in quotes you don't need to do that with numbers because the computer knows that that is a number but if you want the computer to know that is a string they call it a string in programming if you want to know that this is a string you need to enclose it in quotes also notice i've used semicolons here which is important that indicates that that is the end of that statement a javascript program is basically a collection of statement. This indicates this is one statement. This indicates this is another statement because of the semicolon. So you have to do that when you're declaring variables. You can also declare variables without assigning them a value. So when you declare a variable without a value, it is known as undefined. Once you have defined or declared a variable, you can change its value. For example, here I've already defined a variable called my car. If I wanted to change the value from Posh, for example, to a Range Rover, all I need to do is call the variable by name and assign it a different value. So that way I've already changed the value. Once you've declared the variable, you can change the value. A variable that is declared without 
a value is known as undefined. Also, it's very important to know that JavaScript is case sensitive. So for example, here I've declared this variable, my car, car with uppercase C. If I try to reference it with a lowercase C, it will not work. You can experiment with JavaScript inside your web browser console. If you are using a Mac, you can access your web browser console by clicking on option, command, and J. Once you've got the web browser open, if you are on a Windows based computer, once you've got the web browser open, you can just press F12. That will give you the web console. I have got the Google homepage open. So I'm going to access the web console just by hitting the F12 on the keyboard. And that will give me the console. So this, it, this is the developer console where you can experiment with JavaScript. So there are different ways you can dock it. So if you click here at the moment is dock to the side, you can also dock it to the bottom and that will give you the page, the web page you're currently viewing. And then you can experiment with the code on the side or you can do it on this side, dock it to the left. So depending on whatever you fancy, you can dock it wherever you like. I'm going to just dock it underneath for now. So let's try and experiment with some JavaScript. So I'm going to declare a variable inside the console here. I'll just type in VAR to declare a variable and I'll give the variable a name of X, give it a value of seven. So now if I want to call this variable, all I need to do is call the variable by its name. If I press X, it will return the value of seven. Now that I've declared the variable, I can also change its value. All I need to do is call it by its name, use the equals to and assign it a different value. Now, if I call the variable X again, it no longer stores seven, but it now stores eight. Same thing, if I declare another variable called, let's declare a new variable. I'm gonna call this variable my car. Okay. My car. Okay, you know, I'll give it my car and I'm gonna give it a value of, say, Porsche. Okay, and I need a semicolon to end that. So now if I call this variable by its name, if I say, for example, if I call, call it by car, it will not work. You know why? Because I've referenced it in lowercase. You know, the C I use is in uppercase. So it's very important that you reference your variables the way you've defined them. If I now go back and call it again with uppercase C, it should return the right. You can see it's giving me the value of posh. And once you've declared a variable, you can easily change its name, change its value. So if I want to change that to something else, I'll just call it by name. So I want to change this to a Ford, for example. All right, and do a semicolon. Now that's changed it. If I call the variable again by name, it will no longer store Range Rover, it will be now storing Ford. So these are some of the basic examples you can use to play around in the browser console. The console is very useful for playing around with little, little, little values like this. So you can experiment and get acquainted. So that's it for this video on JavaScript variables. Many thanks and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I'll be showing you some variable naming convention. These are basic rules that you need to follow when 
give in your variable names. So I'm just going to read through this table. So the first thing to take into account is that variable names cannot start with numerical. For example, you can't use a number. You can't name a variable 3x or 4 cars. Just for example, those would be illegal variable names. However, you can combine the numbers with text. You can call a variable maybe cars for or go for it and things like that. They are perfect valid variable names. You cannot use operators. Operators, I mean, either mathematical or logical operators. You can't use that in variable names. For example, you can't call a variable this plus that or this minus that or this times that. You can't do that. You cannot use any punctuation marks of any kind in a JavaScript variable name other than the underscore so you can't call your variable car colon or car hash but you can use an underscore underscore is allowed so you can give your variable name underscore car for example or something underscore something or thing that is allowed javascript variable names must never contain spaces never for example you can't name your variable my car space car that's not allowed however you can give it my car that is legal there cannot be any spaces between variable names variable names are case sensitive for example if you declare a variable called my car is different from a variable called my car or my car they are all different variations so when you declare variable names you've got to be careful the case you use so that when you want to refer to that variable name you are referencing the correct variable it's like having the key to the wrong door if you don't have the right key you will not be able to open the door so you must make sure you have your variable names correct in the correct case finally you cannot use any javascript keywords keywords are parts of the javascript language itself you can't use any of that for variable name for example window is a keyword in javascript it's part of the language things like open is part of the language location or string those are all part of the javascript language so it will be illegal to use them on their own however you can use them in combination with other things or that other keywords for example you can call a variable that window or maybe my string or whatever you can combine them with other text that is acceptable so these are just some key basic rules you need to take into consideration when you are giving your variable names that's it for this video thank you for watching bye for now hello and welcome in this video i will explain what statements are in computer programming what is a statement in computer language statement basically is a group of words numbers operators that performs a specific task now this group of words could also include things like comments comments are basically a way of explaining various parts of your computer code so a statement is a combination of words numbers operators and the various components that the programming language needs to create a program so the various components of a statement can include values values are like the data that the computer program needs to function for example a value could be a number it could be a text which in programming terms is referred to as a string it can also be expression it could also be operators like a plus operator 
minus operator, those are known as operators, could be a keyword like var, could be comments. So these are various components that you can have in a statement. When the computer program runs, it looks at the statements in the code and it runs or executes from top to bottom, left to right, one by one. Just the way you hopefully read a book from top to bottom, computer programming is executed or runs the computer programs from top to bottom and from left to right. So usually the order is executed in the same order in which the statement is written. In computer programming, to run a program means to execute a program. A statement is just like a sentence in English language. And just like in sentences, you can have different components that make up the sentence. A typical computer program will consist of multiple statements. I have opened up a blank web page and the web page is called about colon blank. So if you type this into your web browser and just press enter, it will give you a blank page. So what you are going to do is going to access the developer tool console. So to do that, if you just right click, click on inspect and click on console and that will give you the console area. So in this area here, we can play around and experiment with some JavaScript code. So I'm going to write a very simple JavaScript statement. So I'm going to say a equals to B times seven. This is a complete statement. Even though it's simple, it's a complete statement. Just like in the English language, you can end your statement with a full stop. In some programming languages, they have different punctuations depending on the language. In JavaScript, you typically end your statement with a semicolon. So this is a typical valid statement in JavaScript. Let me quickly run through the statement with you. The characters A and B are called variables. Variables are basically like simple boxes that you can use to store any of your stuff in. In computer programming, you can use variables to store data. Okay. In programs, variables are used to hold values. A value could be a number like seven um, and the values are things or data that the program will use. So you can think of variables as a symbolic placeholders for the values that they contain. Now this number seven here is basically is a value in itself and it's called a literal value. This is because it stands alone without being stored in a variable. The equals to and this asterisk here, both characters are called operators. They are used to perform actions with the values and variables such as an assignment and math mathematical multiplication. This equals to is known as an assignment operator. And this asterisk is known as a multiplication operator. So basically what this is doing here is saying that A is equals to the value of B times seven. All right. So once you get the value of B times it by seven and store it back in A, that's basically what that statement is saying. There are different types of operator. This is just one that I have illustrated with. 
Now, most statements in JavaScript end or are concluded with a semicolon at the end. Um, this is specific to JavaScript. Other languages have different syntax requirement. So this statement a equals b times seven basically tells the computer to get the current value that is stored in the variable b. Multiply that value by seven, then store the result back into the variable we call a. That's what the statement is saying. So programs are just a collection of many statements which together describe all the steps that it takes to perform a computer program. So you may have a basic program, for example, that adds numbers together. So the various steps that you have to specify for the computer to follow, they are collectively referred to as statements. Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to what executing a program means. In programming, to execute or executing a program basically means getting the program to take some kind of action. So often you hear developers or programmers using the word execute or executing. What they basically mean is that they're getting the computer or the program to do something. Another word you may hear is run. So executing and running a program is basically the same thing. To execute the program, you're telling the computer to run or get the program to take some kind of action. The programs can be executed in various types of environments and also in different ways. For example, if you have a bunch of code in the developer console, you can execute a statement or several statements inside the developer console. So depending on the environment you want to execute your code, there are different ways you can do that. I have got three complete JavaScript statements displayed inside the developer console. To get, for example, if I wanted to get the value for the third statement, which is the variable add numbers, if I wanted to get the computer to compute that value and display it, there are a couple of ways I can go ahead to execute or run the statement in order to get the desired output I want. Output basically is what the computer gives back to you. All right, so for this statement, if I want to get an output, I want the computer or the program to compute the value here, first number plus second number, and I want it to display it in a pop-up window. Now, a pop-up box is something you may have come across before. Um, it's usually used to display different types of messages. And to do that, we use an alert function. An alert is a built-in function in JavaScript. A function is basically a bunch of code that does something specific. The purpose of an alert function is to display messages in a pop-up box. So in order to execute the statement on line three, which is this add number, I'm going to use a alert function, which is a pop-up box. So I type in alert. It has to be in lowercase. And then in parentheses, I need to add what I want to pop up. Okay, so I want this variable called add numbers. That's the code I'm trying to execute. All right and I put a semicolon. So what that will do, it will add the first number, which is 27, 
plus the second number which is 47 so it will add these two variables together and display the result in a pop-up box alert is a built-in function in JavaScript that pops up messages so the message I wanted to pop up is this one here is this variable and this variable is equals to this variable plus that variable so if I press enter I should get a pop-up box you can see here it displayed the output here which is 74 so it's saying if I add this plus this it will give me that so this is known as an alert pop-up box so the app have now executed this statement in an alert box so I just click OK and the message will go away now I can also execute the same statement in a different way. I want, if I want the result to display inside this console, I will use another function which is called the console.log. So I just type in basically what the console.log means, it will display the output inside the console. So let me do the same thing. I'll do a console and in parentheses. I add what I want the console to display which is the variable called add numbers so it'll be console dot log okay so you type a console dot log and inside parentheses you have to add the semicolon and then you press enter you can see here the console dot log which is a function I've passed in, I've given it the information I want to be displayed. And the information I want is this variable here called add numbers. So you can see here is displayed it, the, the output inside the console. Output basically is the result that the program gives back. So it's been displayed in the console. So these are some basic examples of executing a program. So when you hear the term executing or to execute is the same thing as running a program or to run a program. It means you get in the computer or the program to take some kind of action to display some output. So that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I will introduce you to some JavaScript data types. In programming in general, and also in JavaScript, the data type basically refers to the classification that specifies the type of value that a variable has or stores. There are different types of data types in JavaScript. Here's a basic table with some basic JavaScript data types. So I'm going to start with the top one which is a string. A string basically is a sequence of text that must be enclosed in quotes. You can use either single quotes or double quotes but you cannot mix the quotes. For example here you can declare a variable called my data and set it to this value you can see i've got quotes around it i've got my web console open so the way to access your web web console if you are on a windows computer open up just google home page and type in Control shift and j on your keyboard or f12 and that will give you access to the web console if you are on a mac you do command shift and j that will give you access to the console so let's create a simple variable that will store a string data type so in my console i'm going to create a new variable by typing in the keyword var and i'm going to call this variable my colors okay and i'm going to give it a value I'm going to give this value of red so that's the value you can see I've enclosed the value 
in quotes, which means it's a string data type. The computer will recognize that as a string data type. So if I want to reference this variable, all I need to do is call it by its name and it will just return the value red. So that's a simple example of how a string data type can be used. The next data type I want to mention is the number data type. Basically it refers to any numerical value and it does not need to have a quote around its value. So let me illustrate by creating a simple variable that will store a number data type. So I'll declare a simple variable by typing in the keyword var and I'll call this variable door, door number and I'll give it a value of seven. So this is known as a number data type. You can see it doesn't need quotes around it. So if I want to reference that variable, I just call it by its name, don number, and it will return a value of seven. The next data type I want to mention is called a Boolean. A Boolean basically represents two values. That one can be true, the other can be false. And when you're using Boolean values, no quotes required. To illustrate a Boolean value, I'm just going to compare two values. I'm going to say four is greater than three. That will return true. And if I say three is greater than four, and that will return false. So that's basically how Boolean value data types work. The next data type I want to mention is called an array. An array is a data structure that stores multiple values as one single reference. Basically what that means, a variable can store only one value, but with an array, you can store multiple values as one single reference. You can see here, I've got two values here, Ford and Toyota, but I'm referencing it on that one variable called my cars. So let me show you a quick illustration inside the console. So I'm going to declare a variable called my cars. And I'm going to set it to equals to, and this is how you declare an array with square brackets. And inside the square brackets is where you place the values. So let's say the first value, I say it's a Ford. And second value I say is a Toyota. When you are using arrays, you separate each of the values with a comma. But the only way you don't need a comma is the very last value. So this basically here is an array. And the way you access the values in an array is via their index. So the way an array is referenced is by their index. So this will be known as a zero index. This will be one. If you have several, you can have as many as possible inside the square brackets, but you need to separate the values with a comma. And if they are of a string data type, you enclose it in quotes. If they are not, then you don't need to enclose it in quotes. So for example, if I wanted to access value number one, this is zero, index zero, which is Ford. All I need to do is type in my cars and in lower case, type in my cars and then in square brackets, I type in value zero, which will represent the index I'm trying to target and that should return. You can see it has returned forward. So that's how you, if I had like 20 inside here, I will reference it by the index based number. 
So for the very first value is a zero index, Toyota will be index number one and so on. So that's how you access the values in an array. So the key difference between an array and variable is that an array can store multiple values as one value. If you see here, I got just got um, this variable called my colors and it's only stored one value. Here I've got a variable called my cars and it stores multiple values but reference as a single value is called my cars. The next data type I want to quickly mention is called the object. Everything in JavaScript is basically an object. So all the examples I've shown so far, they are basically objects. You can also represent JavaScript objects with curly braces, as I've done here. I've declared a variable called person and set the value to equals to the first name, got John, last name, Doe. So you can represent an object like this way as well, but by using curly braces. So if I wanted to access this object here, all I need to do is call the variable by its name and it will return the, you can see it's returned the first name as John, last name as Doe. Another data type I want to introduce you to is called null. You may come across this um, in your learning with JavaScript. And basically a null data type is something that does not exist. Um, you can also use the null data type to empty the value of a variable. And a null is also an object data type. So you can see here, I've got a variable here called door number and uh, with a value of seven. So I can empty that value by just typing in the name of the variable, which is dot number and setting the value to null. And that will empty the current data it stores. So if I call this variable called door number now, it will come back saying null because I've emptied out the whatever it was storing. Okay. So a null data type means basically nothing. It doesn't store anything. There's nothing in there. The final data type I want to talk about is called undefined. Undefined is similar to null. The only difference is that they have different data type. Undefined is undefined while a null data type is also an object data type. So if you declare a variable and you don't give it a value, that will become undefined. For example, if I come here and say variable suites and I don't give it any value, that will become undefined. If I try to call it by its name, it will come back undefined. So that's the key difference. The key difference between a null and undefined is that undefined is not an object data type, while null is an object data type. So that's basically it for this video on JavaScript data types. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I'll be showing you some basic examples of how you can mix data types. When you are creating certain variables or objects in JavaScript, you can mix the data type. For example, in an array, you can have an array that contains a string and also a number. So let me create a very basic variable. I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to call this variable X. I'm going to give it a value which is going to be an array. You can tell it's an array because I'm using square brackets and I'm going to give the first value in the array. I'm going to make that a string. I'm going to call that John. So you separate each value in an array with a comma. And I'm going to make the second value in the array a number. 
So here I've created a basic object, which is an array that has two values, which is also known as the length. So the length of this array is two. So if I press enter, it comes undefined because I've not referenced it. So if I want to reference it, I just call it by its name, which is X and press enter. So it tells me here that this is an array and it has two values or length two. And it tells you here the values, John and zero. So if I expand this now, you can see an array basically is referenced by the index. So the very first value will be index zero and the second value with it will be index one. So if I wanted to access, for example, this value called seven, I'll have to reference it by this index one. And it tells you a length, that means the length of the array is two, it's got two values. So you can see it's possible to mix data types. So I've mixed a string and a number data type inside an array object. When mixing data types, you also have to be careful because it can lead to some unexpected results. For example, when you are performing calculation, so you've got to be careful not to mix a string value and a number value. So let me illustrate. So let's say I create a variable A and give it a value of say seven plus seven. All right. And I create another variable. I'll call this variable B and I'll give this a value of seven plus seven. So I've got two variables now. If I call variable A, variable A will return a value of 14, which is seven plus seven. If I call variable B, it will return a value of 77 because the first value is a string. So it uses this plus sign to concatenate or add the seven to the string. So if I call the variable B now, it will return 77. So you gotta be careful when you're doing calculations so as not to mix a string and a number if you don't want unexpected result. It's okay if you're expecting the values that gets returned, but if you're not expecting it, then you need to be cautious when you are mixing a number, for example, and a string. If I, for example, create another variable here, I'll call this variable C and I'll set that to equals to say a string and I'll call this hello and I'll concatenate this. I'll add a number seven. Now, if I call this variable C, I expect it to return hello seven. All right, so that's basically how you mix variable, but you gotta be careful when you're doing calculations so you don't get unexpected results. So that's basically it for this video. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be introducing you to JavaScript operators. An operator is a mathematical symbol which produces a result based on two values or variables. You should have already come across some of these operators. Um, for example, the addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. These are all referred to as arithmetic operators. There are different types of 
operators in JavaScript. We've got the arithmetic operators. We've got the assignment operator. We've got a string operator, sometimes called concatenation. We've got the comparison operator. We've got the logical operator and the type operators. I will be briefly explaining each of these operators in separate videos. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be explaining what arithmetic operators are and also showing you basic examples. Arithmetic operators are operators that are used to perform arithmetic actions or functions on numbers or variables. Here's a table of some basic arithmetic operators. So I'll start from the top where we've got the addition operator. And basically that is used to add numbers or values together. For example, two plus two, we've got the subtraction operator, which is used to subtract numbers or values. Example four, subtract two. Next, we've got the multiplication operator, which is basically used to multiply numbers or values. Example, seven times three. In programming and in JavaScript, multiplication is represented by the asterisk symbol. Next, we've got the division, which is used to divide numbers or values. Example, we divide four by eight. Next, we've got the modulus, which is represented by the percent sign. A modulus operator is used to return the remainder from a division. So when you divide two numbers, modulus will return only what is left from the division. Next, we've got the increment operator, which is represented by two plus symbols. What that does, it increases the value of a number or a variable. For example, if you've got a variable that has a value of seven, and you want to increase that value to eight, you use the call the variable name, and then you add the plus plus symbol, which is the increment operator, and that will increase the value by one. The opposite of that is the decrement operator, which is used to decrease the value of a number or a variable by one. So these are the basic arithmetic operators in JavaScript. You also find that these are identical to most programming languages as well. So I'm going to go over to my console and basically show you some basic examples. Open up Google homepage and on the Google homepage to access the console. If you are on a Windows computer, you press Control, Shift and J. If you're on a Mac, you press Command, Shift and J. That will give you access to the console. So I've got my console open and you should have this underline next to the word console. So let me just run through the basic arithmetic operator. The first I want to illustrate is a basic addition. You may already know this already, so do apologize if I'm going through this again. So I'm just going to illustrate by adding two numbers together. I'm going to do two plus two and press enter and that will give you four. Next, let me illustrate the subtraction. I'm going to subtract two numbers. I'll subtract four from two. I'll press enter on my keyboard and that will return a value of two. Next, I want to multiply two numbers. So I'll do a seven and an asterisk. Asterisk is what you use to represent multiplication in JavaScript. And I'm going to multiply seven by three. I press enter. That returns 21. Next, I'm going to illustrate a division example. 
I'm going to divide two numbers. So I'll divide 8 by 4. And you represent division with the slash symbol. Press enter and that will return 2. Next, I want to illustrate the modulus operator. Modulus will only return the value of what is left after a division. So I'll do 5 and the percent to represent modulus. So I expect this to return 1 because 2 can only go into 5 twice and it should be remember 1. You can see it's returned 1. Next, I want to illustrate how the increment operator works. First, I'm going to declare a variable called x. I'm going to give it a value of 7. So now if I call that value variable x, it will return 7. So if I want to change the value from 7 to 8, I can use the increment operator by just calling the variable by its name and doing plus plus twice and that will increase it. If I now call the variable by its name, it should now return a value of 8. Next, I want to illustrate how the decrement operator works. First, I'm going to declare a variable called y. I'm going to give it a value of 5. Next, if I call that variable, it will return the 5. Say, for example, I want to decrease it to 4. I'll just call the variable by its name and use the decrement operator which is two dashes and press enter now if i call that variable y it will now show me a value of four so that's basically how the decrement operator works so these are just very basic examples to illustrate how the javascript arithmetic operators work thanks for watching bye for now Hello and welcome. In this video, I'll be introducing you to JavaScript assignment operators. Assignment operators are basically used to assign values to JavaScript variables. This is a table of a basic assignment operator. We have used this so far in this course. The assignment operator is represented by the equals to sign and that basically assigns a value to a variable. For example, you can have a variable called x and assign it a value of 27. There are also other types of assignment operators. For example, if you add a plus in front of the equals to sign, what that will do, it will add a variable to another. So for example, here I've got a variable x and I've added a plus in front of the equals to sign and then I've signed it a value of y. Basically that is the same thing as x equals to x plus y. You can also add a subtraction sign before the equals to and that will subtract. If you had a multiplication sign before the equals to sign that will multiply if you have a division that will divide if you have a modulus and so on so it operates in the same principle as the plus and equals to sign works so i've got my console open so i'm just going to declare a simple variable and use the assignment operator to give it a value so i'm going to create a variable called Z and I'm going to use the assignment operator to give it a value of 15. So the assignment operator has now assigned the variable Z a value of 15. So if I want to call this variable, I just call it by its name, which is Z, and it will return a value of 15. Now I can add or subtract to that value. For example, I can call the variable z and use the plus and equals to operator 
and assign it a value of say five that will now give that value 20 you can see the value has increased to 20 so i can also do the opposite so i can do variable z and i'll use the minus and equals to sign and say i make it eight that will decrease the value from 20 to 12. all right and you can do the multiplication the same way and do division and then modulus so that's basically how you use the assignment operator but the most popular way to use the assignment operator is just the first example here where i just assign you use the equals to sign to assign a value to a variable but you can also use it in combination with the arithmetic operators to add subtract divide and do remainders and all kind of stuff so that's basically it for this video on assignment operators thank you for watching bye for now hello and welcome to this video in this video i'll be introducing you to javascript operator precedence operator precedence basically describes the order in which operations are performed in an arithmetic expression the best way to show you this is by actually illustrating an example so i've got my console here so i'm going to create a variable so i'm going to create a variable called j you could call your variable anything i'm going to give it a value of 150 plus 70 and multiply by 4 this is going to be the value for my variable called j so if i press enter and try call this variable by name it's going to give me a value of 430 now if you use a calculator you get a different result so if you input 150 plus 70 times 4 on your calculator it will return a value of 880. the reason we get a different value here inside the console is that in programming and also in javascript there is a precedence of operators so what that basically means is that in terms of the order in which the operations are performed multiplication and division have a higher precedence than addition and subtraction that is why the multiplication is done first so it will do the 70 times 4 first before it adds the 150 so that is known as a precedent so the precedent is that where there is multiplication and division involved it will take higher order than where there is addition or subtraction involved so it does the multiplication first then the addition if there was division it will do that first and then the multiplication there is a precedence in the operator action however you can use parentheses to change that order if you wanted the addition to be done first all you need to do I'll come here do a variable j and i'm going to set that to equals to i'll do a parentheses and type in 150 plus 70 and i will we close the parentheses so what that does it will do the addition first because i have wrapped it around the parentheses which gives it a higher order and then i can now do the multiplication so if i do this return this variable it will now give me 
a value of 880 because I have forced the addition to compute that operation first before the multiplication is done. So I press enter. If I call the variable J now, I should get 880, which is the figure you will get if you had used a standard calculator. But in programming and in JavaScript, there is a precedence in the way the operator actions are performed. So if you want a particular operator to compute its value first, you need to wrap it round parentheses and that will give it a higher order in the operator precedence. So that's basically how operator precedent works. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, I'll be introducing you to the JavaScript string operators. String operators are used to add strings together using the addition operator. When the addition operator is used with strings, it is referred to as concatenation operator. So when you're using string operators, you can use the addition operator, or you can also use the addition and assignment operator, which is the plus equals to, which is the assignment. So you can use both types of operators to achieve a string operator function. So let me quickly illustrate with a couple of basic examples. So I have got my console here and I am going to create some variables. So to create a variable, you just type in VAR and give the variable any name. I'm going to give this variable a name of one and I'm going to give it a value of show me that is the value and I'm going to create another variable and I'm going to call this variable number two. I'm going to assign this a value of the money. So that's my value for variable number two. I'm going to create another variable, variable number three. And I'm going to make this variable value of variable one plus I'm now using the string operators to concat the value. So I'm adding variable one and I'm using blank quotes here. The blank quotes here basically will create a space between the two variables. And I use another concatenation to add the variable number two. So now variable number three will equals to the value of variable number one and two. So now if I call variable number three, it will give me the value show me the money. So that's one way of using the string operator using the addition operator. When you use it this way is called concatenation. So let me show you a second way where you can use the assignment operator. So I'm going to create a variable called C and I'm going to give it a value of hello. Okay. That would be the value of that variable. Now I'm going to use the assignment operator to add to the value of that variable. And the way I will do this, I'll just call the variable by name, which is C, and I'll use the assignment operator. So I'm using the addition and the equals to together, and I'm going to add a value. I'll do a space so that to create some space between the text. I'll say world and you can see now it has now added the word world to hello. So I've now concatenated 
or use added two strings together. So I've used the assignment operator to achieve that. And I've also used the addition operator in this case to achieve that. So that's basically how you use string operators. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I'll be introducing you to the JavaScript comparison operators. JavaScript comparison operators are used to compare values and will return a Boolean result. Boolean basically means true or false. So when you use JavaScript comparison operators, it will always return either a true value or a false value. So this is basic table illustrating some comparison operators. So I'll start from the top, which the first is known as the equal operator and it's represented with the double equal symbol. So what that does, it checks if values are equal. Okay, so if you want to compare if two values are equal, you use the equal to operator. If you want to check if values are equal, both in value and data type, you use the strictly equals to, which is represented with a triple equal sign. A single equal is used to assign a value. So you must be careful between the distinction between single equals or double. If you want to check if something is equal to something, you use a double equal. So if you want to assign a value like you do in variables, you use just a single equal. If you want to compare that the values are strictly equal in both data type and value, you use the triple equal symbol. If you want to check if values are not equal, you use the exclamation mark and the equals to sign that will check if the values are not equal. If you want to check if the values are strictly not equal in value and data type, you use the exclamation and double equal symbol. So if you want to check if a value is greater than another value, you use the greater than sign. For example, you want to check if five is greater than two. If you want to check if a value is less, you use the less than symbol, which checks if a number is less than another number or value. You can also use the greater than or equal to, which is represented by the greater than sign and the equals to sign. What that does, it checks if the values is greater than or equal to. The less than or equal to is represented by the less than symbol and the equals to sign. This checks if the value is less than or equal to. So I'm going to jump into the console now and give you some basic examples of these comparison operators. So when you're using comparison operators, they will always return either a true or false result. Say for example, if I want to check if four is equals to five, that will return false because four is not equals to five. If I want to check if a value is strictly equals in type and also in value. So what I'll do first, I'll create a variable, call a variable called X. I'll give this a value of seven. I'll create a variable called Y and I'll give this a value of seven, but the seven will be a string value. So which means the data type is different from variable X. So now I can do a comparison. I can say X is equals to Y this will return to true because both of them have a value of seven. Now, if I use the triple equals to, it will return to false because the data type is different, but the value is the same. So if I do X 
triple equals to y that will give me a result of false because they are not equal in data type the variable y has a data type of string you can tell because of the quotes that is enclosed around the value and variable x is numerical which has a value of seven so they are the same in value but not the same in data type so if you want to check if two values are the same for example if i say eight is not equals to seven that will return true because eight is bigger than seven so it is not equal to seven so if you want to check if a number is greater than another number you want to check if nine is greater than say eight that will evaluate to be true because nine is greater than eight if we say eight we call eight is less than say seven that again we evaluate to be true because eight is greater than seven so here i'm using the less than sign comparing if eight is less than seven that has returned false because eight is greater than seven if i was to say seven is less than eight that will evaluate to be true because seven is less than eight so let me create a couple of variables i'll create a variable a i give it a value of 17 and i use the comparison so if i say a is greater than or equals to 17 that will evaluate to be true because a the variable a here is 17 so i'm saying a is greater than or equal to 17 so that evaluates to be true if i create another variable say i create a variable b and assign it a value of 10 and i want to check comparison so if i say is variable b less than or equals to 9 that will evaluate to be false because b is 10. so these are basic examples of comparison operators once you understand the basic concepts then it'll be easy for you to use the comparison operators that's it for this video thank you for watching bye for now hello and welcome in this video i'll be introducing you to the javascript logical operators the javascript logical operators are used to determine the logic between variables or values so this is a basic table that shows you two logical operators the first is called the and and is represented by the ampersand symbol what that does it checks if all the conditions are met and it will return a boolean result either true or false if all the conditions are met it will return true if not it returns false the next is the or operator which is represented by the pipe symbol it checks if any condition has been met and it will return a true boolean result so the key distinction between the and and the or is that when you're using the and to check conditions all the conditions has to evaluate to true if they are not met then it will return a false boolean result boolean result basically means true or false in the or operator you only have to satisfy one condition it will return a true result so let me quickly illustrate how the logical operators are used in the console so i'm going to start by creating a couple of variables i'll create variable x i'll give it a value of seven i'll create another variable and i'm going to call this variable y 
and I give it a value of 6. Now I can use the logical operators to check the condition. So I can say x is less than 10, if x is less than 10, and y is greater than 6. This will evaluate to be false because the first condition is true, x is less than 10, but the second condition is false because y is not greater than 6, so it will evaluate to be false. So if I use the OR operator with the same condition, it will return true because one part of the condition is true. So it will return everything as true. For example, the same illustration, if I come here and say x is less than 10 or y is greater than 6. This will evaluate to be true because the first part of the condition is true. X is less than 10. So that's basically how you use a logical operator in a nutshell. Once you understand this basic use of it, then it will be able to, um, it will make more sense when you start using it later. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I'll be introducing you to JavaScript arrays. What is an array? An array is basically a structure that allows you to store multiple values in one single reference. Basically what that means is that it stores multiple values in a single variable. So an array is a special variable which can hold more than one value at a time in comparison to a variable that can only hold one value at a time. An example of an array is this here. For example, you create an array called my data and you use the equals to, to assign the values. You can tell it's an array because the values of an array are enclosed in square brackets. Also, you can have different data types in an array. In this example here, I've got both number and string data type as values in an array. So let's create a simple array using our web console. To create an array, you have to create the variable first. So you just type in var to create or define the variable. You do a space followed by the name you want to call the variable. I'm going to call mine my, my data. You then use the equals to sign to create the array and you use the opening square brackets and you add the values or the elements in the array. You can mix data types. In my example here, I'm going to mix the data type with a string and also a number. So I've got a number and a string. I'm going to add another number and then I'll add another string. When you are using string, don't forget to enclose them in quotes. And when you are using arrays, you separate each of the elements in the array by a comma. You can see I've got comma here and comma here. Only the last value or element that does not require a comma. So now that we've created an array, to call the array, we just need to call it by its name, which is my data, and it will display the information. The information here tells you that we've got an array of four elements, which is one, two, three, four. 
and it gives you the values. If I expand this, you will see all these figures here, they are known as index. The way you access the elements in an array is via the index. So the very first element or value has index zero. The next one will have index one. And so on. you can see here, index zero belongs to seven. Index one belongs to John. Index two belongs to 17. Index three belongs to Jane and so on. Tells you here the length of the array is four because it has four elements or values inside the array. So if I wanted to access Jane, what the way I would do that would be my data and then square bracket and I'll type in three because that's the index for Jane and press enter and see it's giving me the value of Jane because Jane has an index of three as you can see here from the index. So always remember that when you're trying to access the values in an array, you have to access them using the index and the index starts from zero upwards. When you work with arrays, it is easy to remove elements and also add new elements to an array using a process called popping and pushing. If you want to add elements, you use a method called pushing to add an element. And if you want to remove, you use a method called popping. So popping will remove and pushing will add an element to an array. So let's add an element to our array. And the way we do that, we call the array by its name, which is in my case is called my data. And then you add a dot and type in push. And then in parentheses, you specify the value you're trying to push into the array. So let's say I'm trying to add a number 10 into the array and I press enter. So you can see now it's now showing that the array has five values. So if I want to call this array again called my data, it, it will now show that the length is five. You see, because I've now added a new element, which is this number 10 here. So if I expand that, you can see the index. We've got a new index for four, which is number 10. If I wanted to remove an element from the array, okay, so I can do that using the pop method. The pop method will remove the value that I've just added. So let's remove the value I've just added. So I'll type in my data dot pop and this will remove the very last value I have just added on. You can see here it tells me 10 has been removed. So if I now reference this array now, it should go back to the original value, which is an array of four. You can see here, this is the original length. So that's basically how you can add and remove an element from an array. So this concludes this brief introduction to JavaScript arrays. There are other types of arrays and there are so many things you can do using JavaScript array. This is just an introduction to what an array is. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the type of operator in JavaScript. This operator is basically used to find the data type of a JavaScript variable. If you are not sure what type of data that a variable stores, or you want to find the value, you use the type 
of operator to return the type of data or variable. The best way to show you how this works is by actually illustrating this in the console. Say for example, I got a variable and I've got it said to say John and I'm not sure what John is, if it's a string or a boolean. So you can use the type of operator followed by the word John and if you press enter that would tell you what type of data it is. So it's telling you John is a string. So if I do type of followed by number it will return number because it's a number data type. If I do type of space force it will return boolean because it's a boolean value. If I do type type of and I call this say my car this is an object so it will return undefined. It's returned undefined because it hasn't got a value. Once it has been assigned a value, then it will no longer have the undefined data type. If I do type of followed by null, this will return an object because null is an object data type. If I do type off and I do square brackets. Remember anything with square brackets indicates an array. So this is an array here and I've got four values in the array. This will return an object because an array is kind of a JavaScript object. Everything in JavaScript basically is an object. So that's basically how you use the JavaScript type of operator. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, I'll be introducing you to conditionals. Conditionals are code structures which allow you to test if an expression or a condition returns true or not. They are used to perform different actions based on different conditions. The common conditional statements are an if statement. Basically an if statement is used to specify a block of code that will be executed if a specified condition is true. We also have an else statement, basically that checks if the condition that is set within the if statement is true or false. If that is false, then the code inside the else block will execute. So the else statement will only come into effect if the condition set within the if statement returns false. So in my console, I've got a variable here that I've defined called my number and I've given it a value of seven and I'm using an if statement, which is a conditional statement to test a condition. So I'm checking if the variable called my num is equals to seven. If it is, the code, this code here will be executed, which says console.log basically means it will print out this message inside this console. It will say lock is seven if the condition is true. But looking at the condition, this condition is definitely true because the variable has a value of seven and I'm just checking here, this is the condition. The expression inside the if, which is this here, 
is the test okay so this uses the identity operator which is this equals to here to compare the value to compare if this value here is seven if it's equals to seven if it is it will print out that so i'm just going to press enter and it will print out lucky seven in the console so in this case the condition is true so no other code needs to be executed however you can also create a condition in which you add an else statement so that if the condition inside the if statement is wrong then a different block of code will execute which is located inside the else block so here i've got another variable same called my number i've changed the value to 10 and here i've included two statements the if statement and the else statement so what happens is the comparison is made the condition is tested and the test is inside the if block inside here so it's testing if this variable my number is equal to seven this will return false because the value is 10. so what that happens this block of code here that says lock is seven will not run so it will not get executed because the value is wrong so what happens it will skip this block and it will execute this code because this condition inside the if is wrong it doesn't evaluate to 10 so once the comparison has been made it will run the code that matches the comparison so in this case the code inside the comparison is made inside the if block so it's tested the condition the condition has tested false because the value 7 is not equal to 7 so it's not equal to 10 so this block of code here that says lucky 7 will not run instead it will run this inside the console anywhere you see console.log means it's going to print a message inside the console so if i press enter you can see it's saying you're not very lucky today because this condition that we tested did not evaluate to true so this code here is executed instead so in a very simple uh, example here to illustrate how the conditional statement works so there are other types of conditional statement but the very basic is the if and the else statement so the key thing to note here using the if and else statement is that the condition to be tested or the expression to be tested is always located in the if block so that's where you set the condition you can see here i've set the condition here so if that condition does not evaluate to be true then the block of code inside the if statement is skipped and the one in the else block is executed so in between the curly braces that's the opening curly braces and that's the closing curly braces is where you write the block of code that will execute you can see here this is the block for the if and in the elf one you got the opening curly braces and the closing curly braces and in between you you've got the code block that executes if the condition within the if statement or the if block is wrong so that's it i hope it makes sense if not please let me know thank you and bye for now hello and welcome in this video I will be introducing you to JavaScript functions. Functions are a way of packaging functionality that you wish to reuse. So a function basically can refer to a block or a piece of code that is designed to perform a particular task a javascript function is executed when something invokes it by invoke i mean cause it so in order to activate a function after it has been created you need to invoke it or call it and usually you do that by its name javascript has 
many built-in functions that you can use. A very popular one is the alert, which enables you to create pop-up box messages. JavaScript also enables you to create your own functions. And the way you create your own functions in JavaScript is by using the function keyword. Functions often takes arguments. Arguments are bits of data that the functions need in order to perform or do their jobs. And these arguments are placed inside parentheses, which are separated by commas if there are more than one argument. So inside my console, I have created a function. And the way you create a function, you basically have to type in the keyword function, followed by the name you want to call the function. When you're creating function, it's very nice to name your functions as closely as possible to the task that the function is meant to perform. See my function, I've called it add num, which indicates that this function is going to be used to add numbers together. So when you create a function, you first of all have to type in the word function, followed by a space, then the name of the function, and then you have to have parentheses. Sometimes the parentheses can be empty, but you must have that in order to create a function. And then if you've got any arguments, you pass that argument inside the parentheses. If there's more than one argument, you separate them by a comma. You can see here, num1 is an argument, num2 is referred to as an argument. And once you specify the arguments, if there are any inside the parentheses, and then you have this curly braces, you've got the opening curly braces here and the closing curly braces. And inside, in between the curly braces is the block of code that has to be executed when the function is invoked or called. Notice here I've also got a return um, statement here. Basically the return statement tells the browser to return the result variable out of the function so it is available to use. All right, this is necessary because variables defined inside functions are only available inside those function. This is called variable scope. So when you create a variables, variables can be available throughout the application or throughout the scope, which is known as global. So if you create a variable and you declare it outside the function, that makes that variable global. That means you can use it anywhere within the block of code. But if you define a variable inside a function like I've done here, I've defined a variable called result and I've set that variable result to equals to whatever value is passed as number one and add added to value passed as number two. So this variable is local to this function. So it can only be accessed inside this function. So when a variable exists inside a function, once the function has been executed, the variable basically is destroyed or, you know, it's, it becomes on you. You can't use it again. Once the function has been called, that's it. It served its purpose. However, if you want the variable to be available, you have to use the return statement. That way it will tell the browser to return the result of the variable out of the function so that it is available to use. You only do this for variables defined inside the function. Um, they are known as a local variable scope. So variables defined outside the function are global. So you can access them from anywhere within the, within the JavaScript code. Whereas variables defined inside a function like I have done here, are referred to as a local scope variable. So here I have defined this variable called addNum. Now to make 
or to invoke this function, now that I've created it, all I need to do is call the function by its name, which is add num. And then I have to, you must add the parentheses. And then I'm going to pass it two values because I've got two arguments there. So if I say 10 comma 20 and I close the parentheses and I press enter, that will add 10 and 20 together and give me 30. All right. So anytime I want to use this function, all I need to do is call the function by its name and then pass in two arguments. You can see it saves me having to rewrite the function again. I've already written it, defined it. All I need to do is just call it and pass in whatever arguments I need for the function. So for example, you can create the same thing maybe for multiplication or anything. This is just a basic um, illustration to show you the importance of functions. So you can create functions for different kinds of tasks or to do different things. But once you've created a function, you don't have to write all the code again. All you need to do is just call the function by its name and pass in whatever arguments you need to do, like I've passed in here. And then, you know, the function executes. If I want to add passing more arguments, I just call the function by its name and I'll pass in, say, I do six and six and that will add six and six together. It will return 12 because I've already done written all the, the functions here. So all I need to do is call it by its name and pass in the argument. So that's basically how you create and use a function. Function is a very powerful concept in JavaScript. Um, I've only, you know, barely scratched the surface here. This is just an introduction to JavaScript function. There's a lot more to it. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this project, we will be creating a basic calculator. So let's have a look at the overview. We'll begin with the objective and requirements. So the goal here is to create your own basic calculator, a functional calculator that you can use on a day to day basis. The development tools we're going to use to create this calculator are HTML, CSS and JavaScript. The HTML will create the structure. The CSS will make the calculator look pretty. The JavaScript is what creates the functionality for it to be a calculator. We are going to need a text editor to write the code and a web browser to view the code. Also, we will cover introduction to the app, creating the project directory, creating the structure for the app using HTML. We'll be also creating the styling using CSS. And finally, we'll be creating the functionality for the app using Java script. Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to download and install Visual Studio Code. What is Visual Studio Code? Visual Studio Code is a free open source modern text editor. By open source, it means the source code is open for developers to contribute in making it better. Visual Studio Code is cross-platform. That means it will work across multiple operating systems. So it will work on Windows. It will also work on Mac. Visual Studio Code can be extended in functionality by installing extensions. So if you want to add functionality to Visual Studio Code, you can download and install extensions to extend its functionality. 
the official link to the Visual Studio Code is displayed on the screen. You can download the Visual Studio Code from this link and also learn more about the text editor from the link. To download Visual Studio Code, just go to the link that I previously showed you and that's the link there displayed and it will show up the download tab for your respective operating system. If you're running a Mac, it will display a download button for a Mac. If you're on a Mac, just download, extract, and then drag the DMG file, which is a disk image file into your applications folder, and that will install it for you. If you are running a Windows like I am, just click on the download for Windows, and that will start downloading the files. There you go. It's downloading the files for installation. So I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes to complete the download. There you go. It has completed. So I'm just going to double click and begin the installation. So you will get a pop-up like this. I'm just going to click next. I'm going to check this tab to accept the agreement and click next and it's prompting me for a location. I'm just going to accept the default location. It's telling you the disk space that is required. So I'll click next. Again, asking you to select a folder that it will install into. It's suggested a default here. I'm going to accept that and click next. And then we have some boxes here. It's checked here, add path. This I would recommend you leave if you want to add, for example, a shortcut icon. I'm going to click on that so it creates a desktop icon on my desktop and just click next. If you're interested in the other options, just check it. Once you're done, click next and click the install button and that will begin the installation. Once the installation completes, you are given this completion screen. And there is a box there to say launch for just to do code. If you don't want to launch it, you can uncheck it. It also, if you've checked the option to create a icon on your desktop, you will get an icon like this on your desktop. So I'm going to leave the launch for just studio code so that it launches it. I'll click the finish button and then it will launch the application. So I'll click finish. So this is what the interface looks like here. So there's a file option that also has a preferences tab and a settings option. If you want to change the theme, for example, you can customize it by going here. The, you can see I've got a dark theme at the moment. If I click on color theme, and if I wanted to select a lighter theme, it will give you the options to, it tells you here, this is my default team, which is dark. So if you want a lighter team, just select one of here, one of the options. So this is where you can go and change your theme. If you haven't got the theme that you like there, you can always click on the extensions option, this option here, yeah, this tab here, that says extension. If you click on that and there's a search option that you can type in whatever extensions you want to install. While I'm here, there is an extension I want to install. It's called paste and indent. And what that does, it allows you to automatically indent your code. If you paste the code into your code editor, it will automatically indent it. So this is it. So if you want to install it, just click install and that will install it. And you can see here it's doing the install. Once it's done, you can click reload and that will reload the editor and tells you here the option has been enabled, paste and indent enabled. To learn more about the editor, there is a help option here and there is a documentation here you can always go to. So that's it for this video. In this video, I showed you how to download and install Visual Studio Code. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.
Hello and welcome. In this video, we will download and install Sublime Text. What is Sublime Text? Sublime Text is a open source and modern text editor. By open source, it means the source code is open for developers to contribute in making it better. Sublime Text is cross-platform. That means it will work across multiple platforms like Mac, Windows, Linux, and so on. You can also extend the functionality of Sublime Text by installing extensions or packages. The website to download Sublime Text is sublimetext.com where you can also find documentation relating to Sublime Text. So this is the official website for Sublime Text. So depending on your operating system, it will present you with the relevant download button. I'm on a Windows, so it's giving me the download for Windows. If you're on a Mac, you get presented for a Mac download button. So I'm just going to click on this to begin the download. So that's the file there. I'll give it a few minutes to complete and then I'll run the installation files. So the download appears to have completed. So I'm just going to double click and wait for it to launch. You may get an antivirus pop-up. Just click allow and that will allow the installation files to load. So this is what you get. Just click next. It will give you a default location. If you don't want to install it there, you can browse and specify a different location. I would recommend you leave the default location. It's also saying that this is the space it needs. So make sure you have enough disk space. Click next and you can add that to Explorer context menu if you want. If not, click next and just click the install button for the installation to progress. You can see here it says completing the Sublime Text 3 Setup Wizard. Just click Finish. If you want to launch it, just go into your Programs menu. That's the icon there for Sublime Text. Just click to launch the application. So this is the default screen once you launch after installation. And here it will have the title on Registered. Um, because you've not given the file a name, so it has on titles listed, but you notice it's got on register. That's because you have not paid for it. It will allow you to use it uh, with this full functionality for a while. After that, you start getting prompts. So you could be typing away and you just get a pop-up saying, asking you to please purchase the copy you have downloaded. So that's it for the installation of Sublime Text. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to show you the calculator that we will be creating for this project. So this is the calculator we will be creating for this project. It's a very basic calculator um, that you can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So let's do a quick test. So if I do 12 plus 5 and do equals, it gives you 17. And the C here is to clear it. I do say 45, take away 5, gives me 40 clear. I do 7 times 4. That gives me 28. I clear. So I do say 42 divided by 6 gives me 7. So you can see it's actually working. So this is what we'll be creating for this project, a very basic functional calculator. To be honest, I, I'm i quite used to this calculator now. I use it quite often. So it's on my desktop. 
So whenever I need to calculate something basic, this is what I actually use. So we'll be creating something like this for this project. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we will be creating the directory for our project and also creating a couple of files we'll use for the project. I am on a Windows machine. So I've already created my directory, which is this, and I've got my files in there. So to create a directory, all you need is just right click on the desktop, go new folder, and then name it whatever name you like. I have called mine, I've called my directory, my calculator. If you are on a Mac, you should just do the same. Just create a folder. Okay, so I am using Sublime Text Editor for this project. It is free to download and use for a while, but you are advised to pay for it if you enjoy using it. So this is my Sublime Text Editor. It comes up as unregistered because I'm still checking it out, trying it. I like it so far, so I will be purchasing it short very soon so this is the folder um you can once you've created a folder or a directory you can always reference it file go to file and then open folder and you can browse to the location of the folder i've also created a couple of files inside this directory if i expand the directory here um i've got an index.html file which is a file that we will use to launch the application and we've got the CSS file here dot CSS which is what we'll use to apply styling to the calculator so just to if you are using sublime text to create a new file or folder is quite easy you right click and go new file or you right click and go new folder yep yep so you can create new folder and you can create new file. You can also delete them as well. So now we've got our two files. Make sure your files are called index.html and CS and you don't have to call it my style, but it has to be something dot CSS. So it's good. It references the CSS file. Make sure it has a dot CSS extension and a dot HTML extension so that's it for this lecture we have got the directory in place and we have also got a couple of files so make sure you've created these two files inside your directory so these are my files that's the index and that's the css file inside my directory here this directory that's it for this lecture Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to be creating the structure for the calculator using HTML. So this is my text editor I'll be using to write the HTML code, which is a text editor called Sublime Text. The way I'm going to structure this lecture is to add chunks of code at a time and then I explain the code to you rather than you watch me type and take up too much time. I have added some basic tags. These are tags that you will find in every web page or every web application they are standard tags that you will see so let me explain each one very quickly on line one we've got the doc type the doc type basically is there for information and purposes what it does it instructs the web browser or any browser that's trying to display the page it just lets them know that the content of the page is HTML. That's the purpose of the doc type. And the HTML next to it just indicates it's an HTML 
document. So the actual HTML content is between this number two, line number two and line 14. So any of the content that is displayed on the web page, the content starts from the HTML there to this HTML tag here. So most tags have an opening and a closing tag. So they all come in pairs. The head, notice also it's indented properly. So you can tell that the head and the body are both children of the HTML element. And the title here, tag, is a child of the head tag. The in between the head tag is where you find things like the title, a link to any CSS or script or JavaScript. Most times you can in, you can include them in the head section. You can also include several meta tags. Meta tags are used to provide extra information about the document that you are trying to display. And the actual content of the page that visitors or anyone sees is between the body tag. So anything between the body tag is visible. I have added some more chunk of code. I've added from line four to line seven. So there's a few meta tags here. Line four basically is a meta tag and it's got an attribute of car set with a value of UTF-8. The car set attribute basically specifies the character encoding for the HTML document. Line five here, again, it's another meta tab with the attribute of name equals description. And also we've got another attribute here, content equals JavaScript calculator. So this is descriptive of the document. These information here, the meta tag, they are used to provide extra information, which helps the search engines um, to display data, relevant data. Line six, the meta tag here with the name of attribute, with, a, with this attribute here called name and the value of viewport. Notice most of the, and most attributes have the values enclosed in quotes. So here on line six, the value for this name meta tag, this name attribute is viewport. And then we've also got the content here and the value is width equals device dash width. And it's also got an initial dash scale equals one. <coughs> What the viewport is, the viewport refer is, refers to the screen that is going to view this calculator. So it will resize to whatever. So this one makes this web, makes the web page or the web application displaying this calculator makes it responsive. That means it will be responsive to any device regardless of the size. It will auto resize itself to fit that screen device, Re regardless of the device type, it will fit the screen. And this initial scale here is just to zoom, is the initial zoom. So if you want to zoom higher, you can zoom as you want in and out of the device. That's what this scale is, it's just a zoom. Line seven is a reference to the style sheet that I'll be using. I'll be using this. This is the style sheet here I've defined on here. So this is just a link to the style sheet. Line nine, we spoke about line nine before. It's just a title for the calculator. So I've added some more code here. Line 14 and 15. Line 14 basically is a heading tag that we'll use to give a title to the application page. So that's just what it is. It's a head heading tag. And the BR here is a break tag, which means after this line, it will give a space underneath. That's basically what the break means. It means once this, once you get to the end of this line, create a space. So anything else that needs to follow will come after this space has been created using the BR tag. I have added some more code 
on line 16 and 17. Line 16 is I've created a form. The calculator is going to be created inside the form. So all the inputs and everything will be enclosed in the form. So the form, I've given it an ID equals to my form. And I've also given it a name equals to calc, C-A-L-C. So giving it an attribute. So this is an attribute, um, a name attribute, giving it with the name of CAC. All right, so it's got two attributes. One's an ID and then one is a name. I've also on line 17 created an input field. This is where the answers for the calculator will be displayed. So giving it a name attribute and, uh, with a with the value of display. So actually, let me save this and see if we can see the if we can see the input. Okay, so this is the input we've just created, and that is the heading tag. So we can see the input here. So the answers for the calculator will be displayed inside this input. On line eighteen, I've got another input tag but the type of input is a button so the the attribute type here equals the value of button and the value of that button will be zero so this is where we'll be creating the actual keys for the calculator so let me show you let's see what it looks like because all we're going to do is just copy and paste it and create the other keys. You can see we've just created a zero. So I'm going to copy the same and change, just change a few things and we can get the rest of the keys popping up. So that's just how you create the individual keypads on the calculator using this input, in, the, using this input tag with a type equal button. The value will be the key. So be zero followed by one and so on. Okay, I have now added more code to create all the keys we'll use for as keypad for the calculator. So basically, this is how you create the keys. So the first one with the value of this will be keypad zero, one, two, three, and this will be this plus symbol. Notice this break here means after the plus symbol, give a break and start a new line. So we've got three, four, five keys. And then after that, we've got the minus key and then a break. Next, we've got six, seven, eight. And then this is a multiplication symbol and then a break. This is number nine. To, to add a, this is an entity. This is what we use to create the division symbol. Okay, so it's used, you notice here we've got equals to, but for division you need to use this entity, HTML entity, to create the symbol. So let me save that and then you can see how it looks. So this should give us the full structure of our app. I'll just refresh. As you can see, we've got all the keypads we need for the calculator. So we've got the structure, the HTML structure in place. Um, in the next lecture, we'll be styling it to make it look prettier. That's it for this lecture. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to be creating the styling for our calculator using CSS. So we'll be using a combination of external CSS and inline CSS. So this is what the calculator looks like at the moment. So by the time we're done with this lecture, it should look a little bit prettier. So this is my text editor and this is my style sheet where we will implement the external styling for the calculator. The way I'm going to structure this lecture is to add a chunk of code at a time and then explain it to you. Okay, I have added some code 
from line 1 to line 10. So let me run through this. Some of these you may already know. Um, the line 1 here, I've got input. Input, this is known as the selector. So you must have something that you want to do something to. For example, if you're going to have a haircut, your hair will be the selector. And then you have to tell the barber what to do to the hair. So CSA works in the same way. The input here is the selector. And the items in blue here, this on the, the items on the left of the colon is known as the property. The property is what we want to apply to the selector. And the values outside the colon here is the va is what we want to, to have. For example, I want the width, which is a property of the input, to be 150 pixels wide. Okay, so you separate the property from the value with a colon and then you end with a semicolon. Without a semicolon, it will not work. So make sure you end with a semicolon once you've finished. The height, I've set it to that. The font size, which is the size of the text, I've set it to this. The border radius, border radius is what gives it a bit of rounded corner. So this is the border radius property, and I've set it to 10 pixels. These values, feel free to play around with them so that you can see how they work. The beauty of um, browser development is that you can see what the result of what you're developing straight away. Okay, the margin, I've given it 10 pixels. Margin refers to the space outside. Say, for example, you've got a box, so the space outside is known as a margin, while the space inside is known as padding. So where you've got, with the margin, there's usually four corners. You've got the top, the right, the bottom, and the left. That's how the styling is applied. The way I remember it is by using the word trouble and then taking out the vowels, which are the O's. That leaves you with top, right, bottom, left. So when you have just the one value specified, it will use that value on all the four corners, like top, right, bottom, left. The background color, I've set it to this. I've used hex color, hexadecimal colors. You can also use the name of the color if you know it. For example, this means black. So I could use black instead of that. And then the color, this color here refers to, refers to the color of the text. So this is white in extra values. And then border style is not. So I don't want any shadow or anything on the borders. So this is a styling for the input. The input basically is the, yeah, yeah this is a styling for the input tag. I've added some more code here from line 12 to 24. Line 12 here, I've got my, I've got an ID here. You identify an ID with the hashtag. So the ID here is my form. So this form here, these are the styling I have applied to it. Um, I don't need that. This is just a comment. So if you want to write a comment on a on a CSS page, this is how you implement a comment. So anything that you've got a comment on will not reflect on the styling. Okay, so comments are quite good. You can use them for troubleshooting or trying things out. So this ID here, this is the styling I'm giving to the ID. I want the margin from I want the margin on the left to be 225 pixels. So what I'm saying is that from the left of the from the left I want it to move 225 pixels. And then from the top I want it to drop down 20 pixels. That's what that means. And then this here is the styling for the H1 tag which is the heading tag. Again, the text align, I want the text to be centered. I've given it a font size of 80 pixels. That's how big I want it to be. And the margin, I've said from the right, I want it to move 
fit 150 pixels and from the top I want it to drop 20 pixels so let's save that and see what it all looks like at the moment so this is our calculator if I refresh this is what you can see is looking a little bit prettier okay so this is what it looks like at the moment with the styling we have used next we are going to use some inline styling that means we're going to go inside the HTML document and apply the styling in line with the actual tag okay so I am on the actual HTML document which is the index of HTML here and on line 17 which is the actual input for the display which is the screen that will display the results of the calculator I have attached some in inline styling so this is inside the actual tag itself I have added a style tag so you begin with you use the style as an attribute so the actual style becomes an attribute and the value will be the become the property and the values for that input tag so this input tag here I've given it a width of 675 pixels I have given a height of that the text aligned to be centered that means any text that is that it displays I want it to be centered I've given it a background color of this and this break tag here basically creates a space underneath it so if I save that and refresh you should see the display should be blue now you can see here so it's now blue so this is what we have just applied styling to I have added some more inline styling inside the HTML document so on line 21 here um, I want the buttons for the operators that means the plus the minus the equals the times and the division I want them to all have different colors so that's the styling I've implemented line 21 here I've noticed I've used the style here as an attribute and then the value equals to the properties the property I want a style and then the value for the property so the background color here basically I've set the background color for the plus I've set the background color on line 25 for the minus and on line 29 for the times on line 31 for the C which is a clear function that we clear the screen and on line 33 for the division so I've set that to green so I'll save that and if I launch the browser you should see the difference there you go so you can see all the operators have different background colors and also I've made the C here um, given a different background so this is what will clear you can use to clear the values so if I press on the button so you can see nothing is happening at the moment the JavaScript will create the functionality for that so for this lecture we are done the styling of the calculator is ready in the next lecture we'll implement the JavaScript to make the buttons actually work and perform some calculation take care and bye for now hello and welcome to this lecture in this lecture we will be creating the functionality for our calculator using JavaScript at the moment the calculator looks beautiful but none of the keypads work so we'll do that using JavaScript alright just want to go through some of the things we'll be using for this JavaScript session to implement the functionality for the calculator so we'll be using the display property so the display property is used to set or return the elements display type so we use the display property to display something and next we'll be using the on click event the on click event usually is used to execute a JavaScript function when a button is clicked so a lot of the keypads for the calculator are gonna function as buttons so when they are clicked 
this on click event will be activated and then something an event will happen so the on click is used to respond to a click event next we'll be using also the evaluation function the eval function is used to evaluate or execute an argument so we we'll use that to evaluate values as well so for example one plus two you evaluate that it gives you three we'll also be making use of the assignment operator which is the plus or equals two so the assignment operator basically you will use that to add a value to a variable another way to express the assignment operator which is x which is plus equals to you can also express this as this so x plus equals to y is the same thing as x equals to x plus y for example if you have a variable called x equals to 10 then x plus equals to 5 will give you the result of that variable so x to plus equals to operator is the same thing as x plus equals to y or x equals to x plus y i hope it makes sense if it doesn't let me know i will try and explain a bit more so this is our calculator at the moment if i click on any of the keys or the buttons you can see nothing is displayed in the screen here okay this is because we've not implemented any javascript so we're going to start doing that now so we are going to implement the functionality inside our html document so what i'm going to do to each of the buttons i am going to attach an on click event so the on click event because it's a button when it is click will display the value on that button so i'm going to attach an on click event in combination to using the display property on line 18 of this html document i have attached this on click event here and this the value here is the name of the form which is a this name here on the form on line 16 so when the button is click using the display property it would display the value which is this zero here you would display this value zero on the calc this calc here is the form that's what it means it means when the button is click use the display display property to display the value which is this one on the form and the value is you notice next to the value you've got the operator plus or equals to zero so i'm going to save this and then we're going to test it out if that works i'm just going to copy and do the same on the other buttons so I've saved it. If I click on the zero now, it should display something on the screen. Let me refresh. You can see the zero is now being implemented. The other buttons don't work yet because I've not done that. So I'm going to copy and change the values for the other keys. So I have now implemented the JavaScript inside the HTML document. So I have attached the on click event to all the input tags. So the on and next to the on click, I've given the on click this value, the same properties, which is I've used the display property to display the value on the form using the plus or equals to operator. And if you notice, I've set the value of the plus to equals to operator to the value of the keys so this is keypad zero one two and then we've got the keypad plus keypad three four five 
keypad equals two, and then this is the keypad minus, and the same thing. So basically I've done the same for all of it. The process is the same for all of it. So when the button is click, this on click event will trigger this action. It will use the display property to display the value that has been pressed onto the form display screen. On line 32, um, I have used the on click event and given it a value of the calc, which the calc is the name of the form, dot the display property, dot the value equals to the evaluation function. Because this, this normally when you add two values or take away two values and you use the equals to sign, it means you are, you are adding something, taking away, multiplying or dividing. This, this evaluation function is what is used to evaluate or execute what's inside that argument. So inside the argument, we have, inside the argument, we have the form, which is a calc dot the display property dot the value. So these are the arguments that this equals to sign will evaluate, compute, and then display the result on the screen. So that's basically the form done. If I save that, all the buttons on the calculator should now work. So let's go refresh and test. So we'll try a simple addition. So we can try all the keys. So I do three plus two, give you six. I clear that. I do four, take away two. That's two. I clear that. I do six times seven, gives me 42. I clear that. I go 42, divide by four, gives you that. Oh, okay, let's try something else. Let's try 12, divide by two, give you six. All right, so that is our calculator done? Um, just want to highlight something on line 33 of the code. When we're using the on click event for the division, this is the symbol. So the backslash here is what JavaScript uses to perform a division, just to let you know. And it uses the it uses asterisk to that's the asterisk there on line 29. It uses the asterisk for multiplication and the slash for performing division. So thank you so much for your time. I hope you have, I hope you've had fun creating your own calculator, play around with the values and, you know, apply your own touch to the calculator. Take care, all the best and bye for now. Hello, let's take a look at what we will create for this project. We're going to create this analog clock from scratch. So we'll be creating the face of the clock, the numbers on the clock, the clock hand, and also starting the clock. So we're going to be using canvas, HTML canvas and Java script. So look forward to showing you how this is done. Thank you. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to create the project directory and also the HTML file for the project. I have already created the directory, which is this. If I click, you can see the directory is empty. And the way to create a directory is fairly simple. There are several ways, but the way I did it, I just did a right click on my desktop. I clicked on new folder and just gave the folder a name. In this case, I gave it analog clock. So you can create directory the same way on a Mac and on a window. Next thing I want to do is create the HTML file. 
and I will be using the Sublime Text Editor. So this is my editor. I've already got a file open. I just need to save the blank file as an HTML file. So I'm going to go File, Save As, is saving it into my directory and I'm going to call it clock lowercase dot html that means anything in there will be an html file and then in this drop down here I can leave that blank or I can just select that and click save so you can see the title has changed to clock dot html and you can see on the bottom right here is also got HTML. So which means any code inside here will be treated as HTML. To save time, I've already pre-staged the HTML code. I'm just going to add that in and I'll explain it line by line. So this is the code I'm going to use for the HTML. So let me run through that with you. Line one is the doc type. The doc type is a declaration. This is usually the very first thing in your HTML document before the actual HTML tag. The doc type is not actually an HTML tag. It is an instruction to the web browser about what version of HTML the page is written in. Line two is the beginning of the HTML tag. Line 15 is the closing HTML tag. So any content between line two and 15 is treated as HTML. Okay, so line three is the head, beginning of the head section, and line six is the closing head tag. So in between the head tag line four, we've got a link to the CSS style sheet we are going to use. Uh, I've not created a style sheet yet, but when I do, I'm going to call it clock.css. So this is an external link, which means that the CSS will be on a separate file, but we're going to reference it from this uh, file here, this HTML document. And here I've given the title to the actual document. Um, this is called analog clock. So I see opening title, closing title, and this closes the head section. So the, any code or tag you've got in the head section is not, this is not a visible content, uh, apart from the title that shows on the actual title bar. So here we have the body. The body is actually the content that is displayed. So any content within the body tag is what the visitor to the web page or application sees. Line 10, I've defined the canvas here. We've got a canvas with an ID of canvas. So that's the ID attribute. And we've given the canvas a width. So this is gonna be how wide it's going to be. And this is how high in height it's going to be. And that is the closing canvas. So canvas are tags, so you can open and close them just like other HTML tags. Here on line 12, I've got a script tag. And I've got a source, SROC basically stands for source. So basically is referencing where the script is. The source is what you use to reference the script. So what this is saying that this script here is going to be located inside a file called clock.js. I've not created this file yet, but I will later. And that file will contain all our code, JavaScript code, that will make the analog clock work. Okay, and this is a closing body tag, and that's a closing HTML tag. So that's basically it for this HTML document. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to create the canvas object. In our previous video, in our HTML file, we added the HTML canvas element to the page using this tag here. So now we're gonna create a new file, which is gonna be a JavaScript file. 
So I'm going to click on the file option and click new. And I'm going to save that file as a clock. I'm going to call it clock.js. And inside this drop down here, I'll just select this JavaScript option and click save. So we now have a JavaScript file and an HTML file. So let's create a canvas object and we're going to use a variable to do that. So here we created a canvas object from the HTML canvas element. So you can see we're using the document or get element by ID and the ID is canvas, which is this here from the HTML element. All right, so here we have now created a canvas object. The next thing we're going to do, we are going to create a 2D drawing object. Again, we're going to use a variable. So on line two here, we've got a variable called CTX. CTX basically stands for context. So we're setting that to equals to canvas.getContext and inside we're passing it 2D. So this will create a 2D drawing object for the canvas object. Next thing I want to do is calculate the clock radius using the height of the canvas. So to calculate the clock radius using the height of the canvas, we add a variable called radius and set that to equals to the canvas dot height divided by two. By using the canvas height to calculate the clock radius, it makes the clock work for all canvas sizes. So regardless of the size of your canvas, the clock should work. The next line of code I want to add basically is going to remap the position, which is the X and Y axis. It's going to remap them, um, so that which is going to be the actual position of the drawing object. So it's going to remap it to the center of the canvas. So we're using the CTX, which is this variable here, this variable here, dot translate. And we're passing it, we've got the radius and the radius, basically what this will do, it will remap the position zero and zero. So zero will be on the X axis and zero on the Y axis. So it remaps it to position the drawing object at the center of the canvas. The next thing I want to do is I want to reduce the clock radius to about 90%. So to draw the clock, so that the clock, when the clock is drawn, it is drawn inside the canvas. The next thing I wanna do is create a function that will be used to draw the clock. To save time, I have added the function that will be used to draw the face of the clock. So this is a function here. So to create a function, you type in the keyword function, followed by the name you want to call the function. So I've called the function draw clock. When creating functions, it's always good idea to name the function to reflect the work or what the function will do. And inside the curly braces is the actual code that will be responsible for drawing the face of the clock. So here we've got the context.arc. The dot arc method basically is used to create an arc or a curve, which is used to create circles or parts of the circle. And Inside the parentheses for this arc method, we've got different um, arguments or parameters. So this basically is used to draw the actual arc of the circle and position it. And notice here we've got the radius and also we've got the math dot 
pi. Um, basically, the mass dot pi property represents the ratio of the circumference of the circle to the diameter of the circle. So mass dot pi property represents the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter, which is approximately 3.14159. On line 10 here, we've got a context dot fill style. And we're giving it a color of white. Basically, this is the color that will be used to fill the face of the circle that is being drawn by this clock. So the actual face of the clock is going to be white. And we're achieving that using this method called context.fillstar. This fill star method is what gives the clock a white face background. You can specify any, but in this case, I've just used white. You can also use the context.fill style um, property to return the color, the gradient, or a pattern you use in filling the drawing. On line 11, we've got the fill method. Basically, this is used to fill the current path of the drawing. So it fills the current drawing path and the default color is black. When you create a function, for the function to do its job, you have to call it or reference it. So you can see here on line six, I've added a reference to this clock. So it's going to draw the, I'm calling the function here, it's going to draw this clock, draw the face of the clock here inside this place. This You can call a function from anywhere, but I'm calling it from here. So when this code, when this lines of code are read and it comes here, it will then draw the clock using or using this um, code in between the curly braces. Okay. So next thing I want to do, I've actually done it, but I'm just going to tell you why I did. I created a CSS file here. So basically the file, you create the file the same way. You go to file, new, new file, and then save it into your relevant um, directory. So basically it's a basic styling. I'm styling the body. I'm giving the actual body the background color of black. This is black in hex value. And the canvas, I'm positioning the canvas. I want the canvas to be positioned in a certain way. So I want there to be some margin from the left and I'm giving the value of 300 pixels. And I want there to be a margin from the top I'm giving it 50 pixels. Basically, I'm saying from the left, move it to 300 pixels and from the top, move it down 50 pixels. So I'm going to save that. And now we can test the clock. So this is a clock. So you should get something like this. This is the actual face of the clock. So if you can see something like this, then congratulations. We are on the same page. So that's basically it for this lecture. We've got a few more functions to go um, to get the clock working properly. So thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to be drawing the clock face. This will involve modifying the code we had in our previous lecture. So this is where we left off in the previous lecture. We created a function called draw clock. I'm going to actually modify this function. Um, what I'm going to do is also create another function called draw face. And we're going to reference that function from inside this draw clock function. So I'm going to modify this function here. I'll get rid of all this and just the other function I'm going to create is going to be a function called draw face. So I'm just going to reference that function here. I've not created it yet. I'm going to create it very shortly. And for the 
inside the parentheses I'm going to pass in the CTX and the radius okay all right so now let's create this function here called draw face so I have added the block of code for this new function called draw face and that's the function we are referencing from the draw clock function which is a function that we I have modified so I'm just going to run through this block of code with you so that we'll know what's happening here so inside the draw face function we've got two parameters called the context and got the radius and in between the curly braces this is the opening curly braces and this is the closing curly braces contains the code that will draw the face for the clock so we've got a variable called grad this is going to be for the gradient and then we've got the this code here is from line 14 to line 17 this block of code here is going to draw the actual white circle for the face so here we've got on line 14 we've got the begin path the begin path method basically begins a path or can be used to reset the current path so this is where the actual path begins and line 14 here we're using the arc method to actually draw the white the circle and these are the parameters that will enable that to happen this is a math.py i explained what that was in our previous lecture and also explained what the fill style does so it just gives it um, the white face or the background and the i also explained what the context.fill method so the context of fill method basically fills the current drawing path on line 18 here we're using this variable we created here on line 13 called grad um, basically we are creating a radial gradient which is 95 percent and 105 percent of the original clock radius line 19 to line 21 basically we're creating three color stops um, corresponding with the inner the middle and the outer edge of the arc okay so these colors here represents the inner the middle and outer edge of the arc which is from line 19 to line 21. Uh, just to know that this color stop here, the color stop basically is used to create a 3D effect. Next on line 22 here, I am defining the gradient as the stroke style of the drawing object. Line 23. I am defining the line width of the drawing object which is here which will be 10% of the radius line 24 we're using the stroke method to draw the circle and we're using the block of code from line 25 to line 28 to draw the actual clock center so it will draw a center for the clock anywhere you see the begin path method basically means there's a path going on here it, this is the beginning and then it will end with the fill here so this block of code here 25 to 28 is used to draw the actual center for the clock so that is basically it so i'm just going to save this and we go back to our HTML. So double click on the clock.html and hopefully there you go. So this is exactly how I want it to be. So this is the actual center of the clock. So we now have a face for our clock. 
So in the next lecture, we will create the function that will be used for the clock numbers. Thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to create a function that will draw the clock numbers. So this is what our code looks like at the moment. And this is what we've been able to achieve so far. So by the end of this lecture, we should have clock numbers on the clock. So what I'm going to do, I've already pre-staged the code. I'm going to add the block of code and do my best to explain what the code does. So just underneath and it, you can call a function from anywhere. If you notice this draw clock function here um, is inside that function. We're also calling this draw face function. And uh, we're going to create a function called draw numbers. And again, we're going to add that here. In fact, let me do that now. I'm just going to call this draw numbers. And uh, inside the parentheses, I'm going to also reference the seat context and the radius. So this is going to be a function that I'm going to create in a minute, but I'm referencing it inside this clock. So when this clock function draw clock runs, it will call this and then call this function. So I'm just going to tap down to the bottom of this last function here and just add the block of code for our draw numbers function. So I've added a block of code that will draw the numbers on the clock. So this is the code here. This is the block of code. So I'll do my best to run through it with you. So we've got a couple of variables here, a variable called ang and a variable called num. Uh, we've on line 36, basically we are setting the font size of the drawing object to be 15% of the radius. That's what this line 36 does. Line 37 and 38 is used to set the text alignment to the middle and the center of the print position. And for the rest of the code from line 39 to 47, we are calculating the print position for 12 numbers to 85% of the radius. And we're going to have that rotated. And we've got the PY divided by six. So here we've got the mass of PY property here divided by six for each of the numbers of the clock. So these are various um, methods here. We, so we're using the rotate method and we're passing in this variable angle here, which is responsible for the angle. And we're using the translate method here as also. As I explained in previous video, the translate basically is used to remap the position on the X and Y axis of the canvas. And here we are line 43, we rotating using the rotate method again. This time we're using a negative value here. Notice on 41 is a positive and 43 we're using a negative value and then we 44 we're using the fill text. This is what will actually put the text on the clock and we're referencing the number variable and we're converting it to string. Okay. And these are the values. Again here 45 we're referencing the rotate method using the variable we defined on line 34. We're using the translate again here with this values here. And again, we're using the rotate method with a negative for this variable. So that basically should create the numbers for the clock. So I'm just going to save this and click save all. 
and we can go back to our HTML and see what it looks like. Okay, the numbers have not showed up, so there must be a slight error in the code. So I'm just gonna go back into the code and have a look what I may have done wrong. So let me take a look. The function is called draw numbers. Let me see. All right, okay, this is where my error is. Um, the function is called draw numbers and I've just called it draw numbers. So obviously it will not run. So I need to add the S. I'll save that and try and run, refresh the clock again and see. Excellent. So now we have the numbers showing up on the face of the clock. Oh, that's excellent. So if you are on the same page and you've got yours working also, many congratulations. In the next lecture, we're going to create a function that will be used to draw the hand for the clock. So thank you for watching and see you in the next lecture. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to be drawing the time and the hands for the analog clock. So this is what our project looks like at the moment. And this is the code we have so far got. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to add a function that will be used to generate or create the time for the clock. So this will include adding some variables or so we need to use the date um, to get the hour, the minute and the second. So I've added this function here from line 51 to 68. This is the function that will be responsible for drawing the time. So here we've got, we've defined the function here called draw time and inside parentheses, we are referencing this to par parameters, the context and the radius. Here we've got some variables. So we're using the date to get the hour, the minute and the second. So this here, we've got variable called now, which will display the current date and variable hour, which will give us hours. So we're doing the now dot get hours. We're referencing this variable now, but getting the hours here again, we're using the variable this variable called now to get the minutes and get the seconds. So this block here, these are just variables that will get the current time now, the, the hours, the minutes and the second. And the rest of the block of code here, basically we're going to use, we're going to calculate the angle of the hour hand and draw it a length, which is going to be 50% of the radius and a width, which is going to be 7% of the radius. So the same technique is used for the minutes and the seconds. So this block of code here calculates the angle of the hour hand and also draws it a length which is going to be 50% of radius and the width of 7% of radius. So I'm applying the same technique for the minutes and for the seconds. So I have to include this function inside the draw clock method or draw clock function. So I just copy that and go to where the draw clock function is and just include that. So we've got the draw clock function. So I just come down here and add that. So this is the function that will reference the other functions. Okay, so the next function I am going to add on is going to be the function that will draw the actual hands for the so I've now added the function to draw the hand. If you notice in this function here called draw time, 
we already made reference to this function here. So we can see here, we've got the draw hand here, we've got the draw hand here and we'll draw hand here. So we've already referenced this function. So there's no need to add this function to the draw clock function because we are referencing it inside the draw time function. So quickly, I'll just run through what the draw hand is doing here. Inside this draw hand function, we've got this parameters here inside the parentheses. We've got the context, we've got the position, the length and the width. So these are all parameters that are passed into this draw hand function. So again, we've got the begin path, which is the actual start of the path. So this basically is where the drawing begins. And then we've got the line width. This represents the line of the width of the hand. And we're setting that to the width. We've got the line cap and we're setting that to the line cap property basically is used to set or return the style of the end caps for a line. Um, the value round and square make the lines slightly longer. So in this case, we've used the value round. So here we've got the move method uh, basically represents how you want the hand to move. So the default value here, we've got zero, zero here, which represent position on the X and Y coordinates. And here we've got the rotate method. We're passing in the position. Okay. And here on line 78, we've got the line two basically represents the line two. The line two method adds a new point and creates a line to that point from the last specified point in the canvas. Um, the key thing to know that this method does not draw the line. The stoke method is actually used to draw the path on the canvas. So we've got the move to, we basically, um, this method represents how the hand of the clock moves. And uh, we've got the rotate. Again, this is responsible in that inside the parenthesis, we passed it the parameter of position. So it will rotate based on the position. And here we've got the line two. Um, we've already covered what the line two is. And then the stroke, the stroke is actually, this stroke method actually draws the path on the canvas. So the actual drawing of the line will be done using the stroke method. Again, we're using the rotate method to um, do the positioning because we passed in the position here. You notice here we've set it to equals to position. So here we've got negative position, also a negative length. So which means it will go in the opposite direction. So that is basically the functions that will create the time, draw the time, and also the hand for the clock. So I'm just going to save that, go file, save all, and then we can check it out in our, inside our browser and just see, excellent. So you can see we've got our hand, but the clock is not moving. So we need to create a clock start method that will be used to start the clock. So we've got everything in place. We've got the numbers, we've got the hand. We just need the clock to start. In order for us to start the clock, we need to call the draw clock function at intervals. So we need to set the intervals for the draw clock functions to run or to start. So we're going to modify the draw clock function. To start the clock, we need to modify um, where we're calling the clock from and also change set the interval. So here on line six, where we've got the draw clock, 
we are going to change this block of code. So here I've changed the line six. So I'm using calling the set interval method. So this is what will be responsible for starting the clock. And we can see here the interval is 1000 milliseconds, which is equivalent to um, one second. So this basically will allow the clock to start every second the clock will be ticking so that's what this is this is in milliseconds so that is how the set interval method works so the draw clock will be called for each 1000 milliseconds intervals so i saved this change i should we should get the clock working now so let's go back to the clock i'm just going to refresh and you can see the clock ticking, which is uh, referencing the current time on my computer. Excellent. So if you've got your clock working, many, many congratulations. If you've got any issues, um, just take a look at the code again or just um, send me a message. I'll be more than happy to assist. So congratulations and take care. Let's take a look at what we are going to create for this project is going to be a basic loan calculator that you can use to calculate your monthly payment either for your mortgage or any type of loan you have so basically you enter in the amount say for example i want to borrow a loan of one thousand dollars and i want to repay that over 10 months and the interest rate is 10 percent so it tells me the amount this is the monthly payment I will pay over 10 months for me to pay off the loan. So that's basically what we are going to create. That's it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we are going to create a directory for our project. We will also create the HTML structure for the project. I'm going to create the directory on my desktop by just right clicking and going new folder and I'll just give the folder a name. I'm just going to call it loan calculator. So you could also create directory the same way if you are using a Mac. So that's my directory there. I have called it loan calculator. Next thing I want to do is create the HTML structure for the project. I am going to be using Sublime Text Editor to create the structure. So this is the Sublime Text Editor. I am going to add the HTML code. I have already pre-staged it. So I'll just add the code on and I'll explain the code line by line. So the first thing I'm going to do is name my file here. I'm going to call, this is going to be my HTML file. So I'm calling it loancalculator.html and I'm saving it inside my directory, which I've called loan calculator. So I'm going to click save and you can see here it displays the name of the document. And here on the bottom right also, you can see it says HTML. So any code I add in here will be an HTML code. I have added some basic structure to our HTML document. I'm just going to run through them with you. Line one here is the doc type, which basically is a declaration to the web browser, just to let them know that the type of document it should display is HTML document. And here, this is where the actual HTML document starts from. Doc type tells the browser, this is a HTML5 document. So from line three to line 23 is what constitutes the actual HTML document. So we've got the head section inside the head section. We've got the meta car set. Um, this attribute basically refers to the Unicode, the type of characters um, it will accept. UTF-8 is the standard 
character format used in the world. And here on line seven, I've got a link to the style sheet. I'm going to be using an external style sheet, which I will create later. And I'm going to call it loan calculator dot CSF. I've just added a title called loan calculator. So the title is what will be displayed in the browser window when the application runs. Moving on to the body section here, which this is the opening body tag and that's the closing tag. The body tag basically is where the content for the actual application is rendered. So any content you see within the body tag is what is going to be visible to the user. So here I've got an ID. I'm going to wrap the content inside a div and I've given the div an ID attribute of loan cal. And here I've got an H1 tag. This is a heading tag that will display the title of the application. It will just say, say loan calculator. In here, in between, after the H1, I'm going to add some paragraph. The paragraph will serve as input fields for the various parts of the loan calculator. And here I've got a script. This will be my JavaScript. This is where I will add the logic or the function that would do the actual computing or calculation of the loan. And this is a name I'm going to call it when I create the file. file. I have added some paragraph here. I've added three paragraphs here that will be used as input field for us to input the values that we'll use to calculate the loan. So here I've got, this was going to be the loan amount and it's going to be in dollars. And the, I've given the input an ID of amount. The type is going to be a number and the minimum is one, maximum 5 million. And here I've got the on change event. The on change event basically occurs when the value of an element has been changed. So each time the values that has been inputted changes, this on change event here will call this function, which is a compute loan function, and it will real calculate and compute the new value based on the input that has been entered. So we'll be creating a function called compute loan later inside our JavaScript file. Here we've got another field here called interest rate, and it's going to be in percent. So this is where we'll input the interest rate and the type. I've given it an ID value of interest underscore rate. The type is going to be a number. Minimum value is zero. Maximum is going to be a hundred in terms of interest rate. I'm going to start off with an initial value of 10 percent as the interest rate and then I've got here called step the step attribute basically um, is used to specify the legal number of intervals for an input element so this step here is basically specifying the legal number of intervals for the input element and normally you you can use this with the maximum and minimum attribute. You can see here I've got minimum attribute here and maximum attribute. Also again, we are attaching the on change event. So anytime this value changes, it will call this function here called compute loan. And here for the other paragraph, we've got the months to pay. So this will be the value to be entered for the amount of month it will take to repay the loan. So I've given this input an ID of month. The type is going to be a number. Minimum value is one. Maximum value is 300 months. 300 months basically is equivalent to 25 years. So you can change this value if you want to do that. The value, initial value, I've given it to be one. Again, I'm using the step attribute. 
and the value of that step is one again just to re recreate that the step attribute is used to specify the legal number of intervals for an input element all right again here we're calling the unchange event so if the, anytime the value changes it will trigger this function here called compute loan and it will recompute the values entered here we've got a h2 element this is what will display the actual amount to be paid monthly so the amount you will pay monthly will be displayed inside this h2 tag so all the values in green here are no are known as attributes the values in green are attributes attributes basically provides additional information about the html element um, anywhere you've got value here this value attribute basically specifies the value of an input element so whatever value you enter this is what is going to capture the value so i'm just going to save this we've basically finished the structure we can run this inside our html to see what it looks like so i'm just going to open up the directory and double click on this loan calculator dot html and you can see here this is the basic structure so this is exactly how i want the structure to look so in the next lecture we'll start doing the javascript part of it we'll create the logic that will make all these work so that's it for this lecture thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome in this video we are going to create the logic that will make the loan calculator work so let's create a new file that we will use to write our javascript code so this is our html so i'm just going to click on the file option here and click on new file and i'm going to save this file i'll do save as inside the directory called loan calculator i'm going to save this as loan calculator dot js and make sure in the drop down i'm going to select javascript and click save so any code i add here now will be a javascript code okay so the function i'm going to create i'm going to call it compute loan because i've already made references to it here inside my html code so i'll type in the word function to create a function you do function space followed by the name of the function and the function is going to be called compute loan notice i've used camel case which means the first letter is lowercase and the first letter of the next word is uppercase and next i need to place parentheses and then curly braces and i'll separate the curly braces in between the curly braces is where we'll add the logic for the loan first thing i want to do i'm going to add some variables so let me run through the variables with you on line three i've created a variable called amount this would be this will represent the amount of loan that you want to borrow and i've set it to equals to document dot get element by id and i passed in the id of amount if you're wondering where you got this id values from it's from the html side of things so here we've got an id called amount so that's what i'm referring to here and then the dot value basically refers to the value that you would input as the amount line four i've got a variable called interest underscore rate and i've set that to equals to the document dot get element by id and the id is interest underscore rate so whatever value we have as the interest rate is going to grab that so again if i go into my html you can see we've got an id called interest underscore rate that's what it's referring to 
line five, I've got a variable called months. Again, this is equals to the document dot get element by ID. And the ID is months. Again, we have any value that is entered for that value for that month will be attached to this variable. So if we come here again, we've got an ID called months. That's what it's referring to. Here we've got a variable called interest. So this is going to represent the actual interest. So the interest on the loan is going to be the amount, which is this amount variable times the interest underscore rate times zero one. Anytime you have values surrounded by parentheses, those values are computed first. So it will do the interest rate times 0.1 first before the division and the multiplication. Okay. So the 0.1 basically gives it a two decimal places. So it will have two decimals after the figure. Line seven here, I've got a variable called payment. And this variable is going to be equals to the amount. This will represent the monthly payment that the loan borrower have to pay. So it's going to be equals to the amount divided by the months plus the interest. And then here we are attaching the two fixed method. Basically this enables you to have two decimal places or two numbers after the decimal place. That's what that is for. Next, we're going, we're going to add a line of code that will be rep, rep, responsible for putting commas on numbers for three digits. So it will look through the value and then place a comma after every three digits. So I'm going to try and explain this line eight as much as I can here. Um, the payment basically here is going to equals to the payment um, dot to string basically is converting the value to string and then we is replacing it. This is where it's going to convert it into a money format. It's going to convert the form format into money and it's doing that using this replace method and inside the replace method here we've got these values. Uh, I'll try and explain these as much as I can. This slash B here um, basically um, is used to look within a word boundary. And what that means is that it can't be part of another type of word. So it's kind of a pattern it has to look for. And then this here, this question mark, um, basically the question mark and the equals to tells it to find whatever group is looking for. For example, it will look for, it's using this D slash three here to look for three digits. So it will look for any three digits in a row and then place a comma there. The plus, this plus basically uh, marks the three digits wrapped in parentheses um, to make sure that is treated as a block of three. So it basically helps to repeat the pattern. So it knows where to place the comma after every three digits. I've added another block, another line of code, line nine here. Line nine basically is going to be responsible for displaying the output. So it's going to say document, we're using the document or get element by ID method. And we are grabbing the ID, which is this here, this ID here, this H2 tag. So it's going to grab that. This is where it will inject the result of the computed loan repayment. So it will grab that and it will replace that div, the content of it with this dot inner HTML. And the value of this inner.html is this here. So it will now output inside this div here. It will output the word monthly payment. It will then give the value of the monthly payment, which is going to be in dollars plus the payment. Okay. So that's what it's going to do. So I'm just going to save that, do a file and save all. And I'll go into my directory, which is this, 
and just double click on the loan calculator.html to run the application. So let's quickly test it. Let's say I want to borrow 10,000. You can either input the value or you can use this little angles here to move it forward. So I'm going to put in 10,000. And let's say uh, the interest rate on that is 10%. And uh, let's say I want to borrow that over 12 months. This is what I'm going to repay every month, 916.67. So these values are changeable. So feel free to play around with the values to test the app. So that's basically it. And we've got the main functionality of the app working. In the next lecture, I'm just going to add some CSS to make it look a bit nicer. So that's it for this lecture. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to add some CSS for our app. To begin, let's create a new file. So I'm going to click on File, New, and I'm going to save it as a CSS file. So I'll call it loan calculator.css. I'm just going to use lowercase and in the drop down here, make sure you look for the CSS format and click save. So this file here is now CSS. You can see here. So any code I add here will be CSS because this is not really a CSS course. I'm not going to spend too much time on the CSS part of things. I've already staged the code. I'm just going to add that in. So this is the CSS. I'm just going to quickly run through. Um, notice that when we created the HTML, these hash are all IDs. Okay. So we gave IDs, anything you got here, ID, these are all attributes. So inside my CSS, I am targeting all these IDs values here. Okay. So for the loan car here, which is, if we go into, which is this div here, this, the actual div itself, the entire div is called loan car. So I'm giving it a width. I'm wrapping it round a div. This is a width in pixels, the height, the background color, the color of this text, the margin from the left. Basically I'm creating some space from the left margin from the top and moving some spaces from the top, moving it down. Padding refers to the space inside the div. So these are all the values on the right and the actual properties are on the left. This is the variable, the ID, sorry, the ID for the months. I'm giving it a width of that height of that. And again, this is the ID for amount. So these are just basic CSS. All right. Margin left width, and this is the heading tag. I'm giving the heading tag a font size of 40 pixels. So I'm going to save that and click save all. So this is what the application looks like. If I refresh it, we should see this is the new look. All right. So I'm just going to, let's just do a quick one here. So I do a $500 loan and I'm paying this over 10 months. It tells me this is what I need to pay every month. So we've got the application working as designed. So this can come in quite useful, even in your day to day, if you've got a mortgage, um, payment you want to calculate or you're planning to take out loans, this calculator can be. So that's it for this project. Thank you for watching and bye for now. Hello, let's take a look at what we will be creating for this project. This is what we're going to be creating. It's going to be a quote of the day. So it's basically a button. You click on this button and it will randomly generate quotes for you. So if I click on this button now, you can see here, this is the actual quote and this is the author of the quote. 
All right, so to click a new, you can see also the button color changes. So whenever you want a new, you can hover over it. So if you hover, put your mouse in, it changes color, your mouse out, gives you a different color. So if I click on the new quote button again, I get a different quote each time. So we're going to be using JavaScript, um, basic HTML, and also basic CSS for the project. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to create the project directory and also the HTML for the project. I am using a Windows 7 machine. So to create a directory, I'm going to do that on the desktop just by right clicking on any blank space and go new and click on folder. You can do the same if you are using a Mac and just give your directory any name. I'm going to call mine quotes of the day. Feel free to call yours whatever name you like. So that's my directory created. I've called it quote of the day. Next thing I want to do is create the HTML document I want to use. I'm going to be using Sublime Text as my editor. So I've opened up a new file and I'm going to save this file as an HTML document. I'm going to click Save As and I'll be saving it inside the project directory here. And I'm just going to call this quotes. Quotes.html. You can see it's also got HTML listed here. So I'm going to click Save. So this file now is going to be an HTML file. I have already pre-staged the code. So I'm just going to copy that in and then explain line by line. Um, it'd be a lot easier and more efficient for me to explain it this way. So this is the HTML for the project. So I'm going to explain the code line by line. Line one here is what is referred to as the doc type. So it's the very first thing you have to indicate in an HTML document. Um, the doc type is not part of the actual HTML document, but it is a declaration basically telling the web browsers that the content of this file is going to be HTML5. Line 2 is where the HTML begins and it ends on line 25. So any content between line 2 and line 25 is regarded as the HTML element. So we've got the head section here. You can see this head tag here. That's the opening head tag and that's the closing head tag. And inside the head tag basically is where you have things like style sheet, you have um, meta tags and so on. So they're just for informational and reference purposes. So here on line four, I've got a reference, which is a link to an external style sheet I will be using for this project. I have not created a file yet, but when I do, I'm going to call it quotes.css. And this is the reference. This is where it's going to be. It's going to be in the same directory as this HTML file. So this is just a link. You can see rel here. This rel basically is an attribute and tells this anything in green here. They're all attribute. You can see here it tells you also what type it is. It's going to be a text and it's going to be a CSS file. Line five is where the heading tag ends. The body begins on line six and ends on line 23. Any content inside the body tag is what is going to be visible to the user. So inside the body tag, I've got a div. So a div basically is a division. You can divide a section of the page. Inside the div is where I want the quote to be rendered. So, okay, so here I've given it a heading. Line nine is a heading. So it's going to be a heading tag and it's going to be quote of the day. That's the closing tag, that's the opening tag. Line 10 is just going to be a paragraph. 
that will display some text telling the user to press the button below to receive a random quote. Line 12, I'm defining the button. See, that's the opening, that's the closing tag. And when you define a button, you have to attach an event handler to it. Basically a button, what you do with a button, you click on it. So this on click event will handle the event of the click. When we click on the button, this on click method here will reference this, will call this method. I've set the on click to equals to the, this method is going to be a JavaScript method or function that I will be defining later inside my JavaScript file. So when you click on the button, it will call this function and the code inside that function will respond to the click. And this is just a text that will be displayed on the button that will say new, click on new quote or new quote. And here I've got another div inside the main div. This div here, this mini div on line 13 to 17 is where we are going to render the quote. So we've got a paragraph here with an ID called quote output. What that means is that we're going to output the result. So when the user clicks on the button, it will generate a random quote and display the quote inside this paragraph here. On line 16, we've also got the auth and ID called output. This again is a paragraph and the name of the author is going to be displayed in a separate line inside this paragraph. These are comments. This is how you write comments in HTML. So anything that's got a comment on will be ignored when the code actually executes. So this is the closing div for this div. And on line 18, we've got a script. On line 21, I've got a script tag. And you notice you got the SROC attribute. Basically, this is the source. So I am referencing an external JavaScript file. So the actual quotes that will be generated are going to be located inside this JavaScript file. I've not created it yet. When I do, I'm going to call it quotes.js and it's going to be in the same directory as my HTML and CSS file. So hence I've just done quotes.js because it's going to be in the same directory. So this is basically the HTML for the application. We've got a reference to our external, our external JavaScript, which we'll create later and also a reference to our external CSS. So that is it for this lecture. I'm just going to click on the file option and click save all. We can quickly run this so we can see what the structure looks like. So to run it, open up your directory, which is this one in my case. And I'm just going to click on this HTML file and it should give us the current structure of what it looks like. So this is what it looks like at the moment. We haven't got any CSS, but this is the button. So the idea is to click on the button and it will generate a random quote. So, yep, if you've got your page looking like this, well done. That means we are on the same page. So that's it for this lecture. Thank you for watching. Bye. Hello and welcome. In this video, I will be adding the CSS for the project. Inside our HTML, I've already made a reference to the CSS and I called it quotes.css. So let's go ahead and create that file. So I'll click on the file option, click on new, and I'll save this new file. I'll save it as, I'm going to save it into the same directory as our HTML file. So I'll call this quotes in lowercase quotes.css. So the name must match what I have specified in my HTML. So I'm going to click on this drop down and just select the CSS option here and click save. So I've called it quotes.css. So if we go into the HTML, you can see it matches what I've called it. So again, I have pre-staged 
the CSS just to save time. It is really basic CSS. So I'm going to add it and then explain the code. So I have added the HTML. So let me run through with you. So on the left, when you're styling, you always have to first indicate the element you're styling. In this case, I'm styling the div here. And you can see we've got divs here inside our HTML. So what I'm saying is that I want any text inside the div. I want the text to be aligned to the center. And here we've got the H1. If we go into our HTML here, we've got an H1, which is the actual title of the app. So here the, I'm setting the actual size of the text, which is known as font. I'm setting that to 80 pixels. And the font family I'm using is impact. Um, you can also specify several font families when you are specifying a font so that if one is not available, it will default to another. And here I'm styling the button, which is this here button here. And the button, I'm giving the width of the button to be 250 pixels, the height to be 80 pixels. I want the background color to be blue, and I want the text inside that to be white. So please feel free to play around with these values to try and customize them to your own taste. All right, so with every CSS styling, you must have the opening curly braces, and the closing curly braces. And don't forget to put the this um, comma, the semicolon at the end of each of the CSS styling, okay? So once you've given it the property of value, you must end that with a semicolon. So next I am styling the paragraph. So I want the font, the size of the text inside the paragraph to be 35 pixels. Okay, so you can see again, I've ended my the value of the property with a semicolon. Very important. If you miss out the semicolon in the CSS will not work. Here the button hover basically hover means when I pull my mouse over the button, I want the to change color and the color I've given it is green. The default color of the button is blue. But when you put your mouse over it, I want it to change to green. So again, you can give yours a different color. So I'm just going to save this. I'll click save all, and then I'll go into the application and see what it looks like. So I'm going to open up my directory, which is this and take a look. So I've now got my CSS. So let's run the HTML and see what it looks like. Excellent. So this is what the application looks like at the moment. Obviously nothing you can see. This is the hover I was talking about. If I pull my mouse over it, it changes color. Nothing will happen at the moment because I have not incorporated the JavaScript functionality to give us the random code generation. So we'll do that in the next lecture. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome in this video. I will be adding the JavaScript functionality that will make the application work. So let's create our JavaScript file. We've already made a reference to it inside our script from the HTML file and I call it quotes.js. So I'm going to click on the file option in Sublime Text and go new. And I'm going to save this new file as a JavaScript file. So I'm going to call it quotes.js and just select the drop down here and make sure I select the JavaScript file. All right, so I'll save that. So I now have a JavaScript file. So anything you can see here on the bottom right hand corner, it says JavaScript as well. The first thing I want to do is create an array. An array, I'm going to use the array to hold the values of the quotes. So to define array, I'm going to first of all create a variable. I'll call var for variable, and I'm going to call it array 
of quotes. Notice the use of camel case. Camel case basically means the first letter of the first word is lowercase, and then the first letter of other subsequent words are in uppercase. So you can see the O here is upper and the Q in quotes is upper. All right, so I'm going to set that to equals to an array. And this is how you define an array in square brackets. So in between this array here is where I'm going to place the quotes. So you can select your own favorite quotes. You don't have to use mine. So these are just some of my favorite quotes. So I'm going to just paste that in there inside this array. So these are the quotes that will be randomly um, generated when you click on the button. So they have enclosed them inside an array. You can see that's the opening array, which is a square bracket. And this is a closing array. So I'll just go through just one of the quotes. I'll go through the first one here. So you can see here, I've got the author. Uh, because they are text, we need to enclose text in quotes. So I've got the author here. And after that, I've got a colon. And then we have the name of the actual author and then a comma. Notice I've enclosed everything inside opening curly braces and closing curly braces. And there is a comma, which is important. Whenever you put a comma, that means you've got more to come. So here, this is the first quote here and this is the second quote so each in between each curly braces you have the author and then you have the name of the author and then you have the actual quote itself notice it's very important to notice the quotes that have enclosed each of the parts so the author you've got quotes and then a colon and then you've got the actual author and you've got quotes around it and then the comma It's very important because if you miss out the comma it will not work properly so make sure you place a comma after each of the author's name and then the comma also at the end of the closing curly braces the only place where you don't need to place a comma is the final curly braces um, so the last quote, you don't need to put a comma on the last curly braces. All the others, you put a comma, but the last. Very important, but you must put a comma after the name of the author. All right, so we have got, I've, I've only used just a sample here. You can make this as long as you want, add as many quotes as you want as long as you have it enclosed inside the array, that should be fine. And also make sure that each of the author ha name has a comma. After the name, put a comma. After the curly braces, put a comma. The only place you don't need a comma is the last, is the last um, author. So this is the last one here. So I don't need a curly, I don't need a, However, if I decided I wanted to add more quotes underneath, I would need to place a comma there and add more quotes. So that is the array. The next thing I want to do is create a function that will randomly select each of the quotes using the length of the array. And we're going to be using the maths.random method. An array length basically refers to the values inside the array and it begins with a zero index. So for example, this one here will be refers to as zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So just underneath the closing array here, I've added a function and I've called it random selector and I've passed it this parameter of array length. Array length basically um, ref de determines or makes reference to the values inside the array. So the very first value is going to be zero. This will be zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. That's what 
the array length is referring to and it's going to return a value it's going to return mass.floor uh, mass.floor basically is going to be used to round a number downwards to its nearest integer all right so the mass.floor will round the number up to the nearest integer mass.random will randomly generate random numbers based on the array length so the next thing I want to do is create a function called generate quote. So if we look inside the HTML here, we already made reference to this function called generate quote. This is going to be this function here is already attached to the button, which the onclick method. So when you click on the button, it will call this function. So that's the function I'm going to create now. So I'm just going to add it underneath the random selector function all right so I've added a function called generate quote so this is a function that will be called upon when you click on the button inside the HTML so the name is generate quote and in between the curly braces is the code that will execute so here I've got a variable called random number and I've set that to equals to the random selector which is this function here and in inside the parentheses I'm passing it the array of quotes the array of quotes is this variable here I have created so I'm passing that value as a parameter there and I've attached the dot length dot length basically it will determine how many quotes there are in the array so the very first quote will be zero and the last will be so you so start from zero and one and so on okay so the length basically refers to the length of the quotes that is how many quotes you have in the array that's what that means and then we're using the document or get element by id method so this basically which is a quote output this here is inside our html which is this quote output here that's what it's referring to so we're getting that id called quote output and we are replacing it the content with this inner html and is you see here these quotes here basically we are replacing it with the quotes that will be generated so, so they will create, will create a space plus the array of quotes which is this here plus the random number okay so each of the quotes will be randomly assigned a number based on the length of the quotes in the array so the random number will be so it will for example it can randomly select this author here or this quote and it will then attach the quote plus whatever the quote says and then here line 62 again we're using the document or element by id here we are going to this is where we're going to output the author okay so if we go into the html we've got this id here so basically it will take over this paragraph and inject the author here that's what that is so it's going to just replace whatever content you have inside this paragraph or this id and replace it with the actual quote and the and the name of the author so it will grab the quote from the random number assigned to the quote and also attach the name of the author to the quote so that's basically what this um, function will do so this is the function that would do a lot of the heavy lifting for the application so i'm just going to click on the save option and then we can test the application so i'm going to click on the directory here and double click on the quotes HTML when you're running your project you always have to run the HTML not the CSS or the JavaScript they're already linked to the HTML so double click on the HTML and you should get the application launched so this is the application now so if everything works out fine if there are no errors in my JavaScript I should be able to click on the button and you can see the quotes generated you can see all right so everything is working as designed 
okay so as i click i get a new quote each time so that is it for this application thank you for watching if you have any problems please do let me know thanks and all the best hello let's take a look at what we are going to create we are going to create a bmi calculator bmi basically stands for body mass index is basically a measure of your body fat based on your weight in relation to your height um, this basically applies to most adult men and women aged 20 and above so basically you put your height in centimeter say for example if you are 178 centimeter and you also put your weight say for example you're 85 kg and then you calculate it tells you your bmi or your body mass index and if you see here it gives you a guide so for example this value here now means this person is overweight so anything greater than 24.9 is regarded as overweight so that's it i look forward to showing you how to create this bmi calculator thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome in this video we are going to create the project directory and the html so i'm going to create the directory on my desktop i'm just going to right click and go new folder and i'm just going to call this bmi calculator so you can call yours whatever name you like and you can create folder the same way on a mac and also on a window based computer i will be using the sublime text editor as my editor for this project so i've got a new file here inside my editor i'm just going to save this file as an html document so i'm going to go file and i'm going to do a save as and i'm saving it into the directory i just created and i'm going to call it bmi dot html and i'll click on the drop down and just select html and click save so any code i have in here now will become an html file so you can see on the bottom right of the text editor is called html there so the way i'm going to approach this is i'm going to add the code in i've already pre-staged the code so i'll add the code and i'll explain what the code does line by line i have added the html code that we'll be using for this project so i'm going to run through the code with you line by line line one here is the doc type and the doc type is not actually part of the html document it's basically a declaration to web browsers to tell them that the content of the document is an html5 document from line 2 to line 35 is the actual html document so any content within line 2 to 35 is the html content so we have the head section which is on line 3 to line 7 so the information within the head section is not actually visible to the visitors of the application the only thing that you can see in the title bar is the title of the application which will appear on the title bar or when the application is launched on line five i've got a link to the external style sheet i will be using for this project i'm going to be using an external css file i've called it bmi.css however i have not created it yet but when i do i will call it bmi.css 
Okay, and you can see the rel artificial. This is an attribute. It's called rel. Basically, you use that when you are linking to an external style sheet. And this is another attribute that tells you the type of document. It's a text and it's also CSS. The href attribute basically is a reference to where the file is going to be located because it's going to be located inside the same directory as the HTML file. All we need to do is just include the name in quotes. And this is where the head section ends on line seven. The body section begins on line nine and ends on line 34. So any content inside the body tag is what is actually visible to the visitor. Inside the body tag on line 11, I've got a div element and I've given it an ID attribute of container. So this is the opening div and this is the closing div here. So I'm basically wrapping all the content inside this div called container. Inside the div, I've got an H1 heading tag. This basically is going to form the title for the application. And I have got two, three inputs here. This is going to be the form where you're going to input the actual value of your height in centimeter. And you can see here it says height in centimeter. This was just going to be a label for the input box. So where they need to enter the height in centimeter. This break here basically means it will give a break between this input and this other input here. So I've got another input tag and I've got weight in kilogram. This is basically going to be the text next to the input. And uh, again, I've given the input type um, text. It's the input type is a text and I've given it an ID attribute of centimeter. Yeah. Same thing with the weight here. This input type is going to be a text input. And again, I've given it an ID value of kilogram kg and BR basically means break. So it will leave a, it will jump onto the break kind of, kind of like works like a paragraph. It just creates a break. I've got another input type here. This is going to act as the submit button and I've given it an idea of submit. The value is going to be calculate. That means the button will actually read calculate. So when you press on the calculate button, it will um, do the actual calculation of the BMI. Here I've got an ID and I've given it um, a value of result. The, again, this is another div. This div will display the result of the calculated BMI. So this is where the output will be rendered. I've got another div here called weight guide. This basically is just some text guide that will guide users as to whether they are underweight, overweight um, in relation to their BMI. So it will just say BMI weight guide if you're on the weight, this is a value, anything 18.6. If you're normal, normal range or normal weight, it'll be 18.6 and 24.9. So anything greater than 24.9 is going to be regarded as overweight. All right. And this is where the div ends. And just before the closing body tag, I've got a script tag with a source. Source basically means where am I getting the script from? This is going to be the external JavaScript. This is the JavaScript file that will contain the JavaScript that will be responsible for computing or calculating the BMI. And I'm going to call the JavaScript file BMI.js. I've not created it yet, but when I do, I'm going to call it BMI.js. And that's the closing script tag my closing body tag and my closing HTML. I'm just going to click on save to save all. And I'll quickly open up the, the file so we can see what it looks like. So I'm going to open up the directory and just double click on this so we can see. All right. So this is what the calculator looks like at the moment, the BMI calculator. So we're going to add some CSS later. 
to make it look more presentable. So that's it for this lecture. We've created the directory for the project. We've also created the HTML structure. In the next lecture, I'm going to add some CSS before we go on in the lecture after that to create the JavaScript functionality. Many thanks for watching and bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to add some CSS to our project. So I've already made a reference to the CSS inside our HTML here using the link here. So now I'm going to create the actual CSS file. So I click on the file option, I go to new, and I'm just going to save this. I'm going to save as, and I'm saved inside the same directory as the HTML file. So I'm just going to call this BMI in lowercase, bmi.css. I'm just going to click on the drop down and select the CSS option. Click save. So this file now is a CSS file. You can see on the bottom right hand corner, it's called a CSS. Again, I am going to add the CSS code and explain it line by line. So this is the CSS here. So I'm going to start with the first ID here. This is the con ID called container. So if we look in the HTML, this is the ID I'm referring to. So here I have given it a width of 375 pixels, a height of 525 pixels, margin from the left. So basically this is the left. So I'm saying from the left, I want it to move this 350 pixels margin from the top. So this is the top. So I'm saying from the top, I want it to go down three. I want to go down 65 pixels. I'm giving it a background color of yellow and padding to the left is 30 pixels. Padding refers to the space inside the div element. So I'm saying the space inside, I want it from the left to create some space, 30 pixels. So that's what this, so these are the CSS for the ID div container. And then we've got this ID called CM, which is here. This is one of the input field where you input the value in height. So I've given it a width of 150 pixels, a height of 25 pixels, and again, margin from the top, I've given it a value of 30 pixels. This is the other input field here. If I go into my HTML, I've got an input field called KG. So again, I'm applying the same styling as I did with this CM input. Again here, this is a weight guide, which is this div here I'm referring to, this block of code here. So basically this is the styling I'm giving it. I'm giving it a margin from the left, which this is the left here, to move 75 pixels, and margin from the top, 50 pixels. Next, I've got the result ID, which is this div here on line 19. This is basically where the output will be rendered, the result of the BMI when it's being calculated. And we have the submit button. This is the button that will be clicked on to do the calculation. So this is the value here. It's got an ID of submit. Okay, and the value that will, that means the text inside the button inside this input will say calculate. So basically this is the CSS I've given it. This is the width, the height, margin, left, top. Border radius basically gives it a rounded edge. It makes it round, gives it kind of like a button edge, making the corners round. Border star basically means we don't want any styling on the borders. So if there's any shadows or any, anything like that, it will remove the shadow. 
background color I've given it a background color of blue but feel free to apply your own custom styling so that it looks um, to your taste um, color here this refers to the color of the text inside the submit um, input it's going to be white and um, font size basically refers to the text size I've given it 25 pixels body here basically what I'm saying I'm giving the entire body of the document I'm giving it a background color of black this is black in hexadecimal values uh, finally I've got the h1 element h1 basically this is the title here which is this here that will say BMI calculator I've given it padding because it's located inside the div so I'm giving it padding. Padding refers to the space inside an element, while margin refers to the space outside the element. So from inside the div, I'm telling it to move left 15 pixels and to drop down from the top 25 pixels. So that's basically it for the CSS. I'm just going to save all that and open up the file again. So this is the project here. I've got my CSS now and my HTML. So I'm just going to run it, run the HTML and see what it looks like. So yes, this is what it looks like at the moment. So everything is in place. The only thing we need now is to create a function for the calculate button. So when we click on that, it will output the BMI here. So that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll be creating the JavaScript functionality. Thank you. Bye. Hello and welcome to this video. In this video, we will be adding the JavaScript functionality to make the BMI calculator work. JavaScript relies on HTML and sometimes CSS to be in place before it can work. So we've already got CSS and we've also got HTML already in place. So let's go ahead and add our JavaScript. So this is our code so far. This is our CSS and this is the HTML. So let's add our JavaScript. We've already made a reference to our JavaScript inside our HTML file courtesy of the script tag here on line 32. So to create a new file, I click on file, I'll go new, and I'm going to save this as a JavaScript file. So I'll do file save as, and it's going to save into the same directory as our CSS and HTML. I'm going to call this bmi.js and in the drop down, I'm just going to select JavaScript, which is this one here, and I'll click save. So the code I'm going to be adding into this file is going to be JavaScript. You can see on the bottom right here, it says JavaScript. So I've already pre-staged the code. I'm going to add it on and I'll explain the code line by line. So here I have added the JavaScript code that will make the BMI calculator work. So let me run through the code with you. On line two here, uh, I've got a comment. So anything that is a comment is ignored when the code executes. So this is a JavaScript comment. So it's a, this is what is known as a single line comment. So when the code runs, it will just skip this comment and ignore it. Comments are useful because they help you explain your code to yourself and also to others. So here on line two is what is known as the formula for calculating the BMI. Okay, so here the W is the weight. So basically the BMI formula is kilogram divided by height over 100 times height divided by 100 okay so this is basically how you calculate the bmi you do this bit first which is in parentheses the height divided by 100 times the height divided by 100 and then you divide that value by the value in kilogram that will give you the bmi 
So this kg basically is the weight. So this is the weight. Um, you're dividing the weight by the height. So line four here, we're using the document dot get element by ID method. And inside the parentheses, we are passing in submit. Submit basically is the button here, which is inside our HTML document. If I scroll down here, you can see this ID submit. That's what we're referring to inside this here. So we passing in the submit and we have also got an event listener. So here we've got the add event listener, the document dot add event listener. Basically, this is a method that attaches an event handler to the document. And you can see we are attaching a click event to the BMI calculator. Okay. So here now, what we're saying here, the event we are attaching to this is the click event. And uh, when the button is clicked or the submit button is clicked on, it will call this BMI calculator. All right. This is a function which we are, which I have defined here on line five. So I've defined a function called BMI calculator. And here we've got some variables here, variable centimeter, and we are using setting that to equals to pass int. The pass int basically is a function that passes a string and returns an integer. Okay, that's what we're doing here. So we're passing a string, but returning an integer. Integer is a number. And we're using the document or get element by ID and the ID we're getting is the CM. Again, if we go into our HTML, we can see we, the C, the CM here refers to the input. So this input here, and this is the value. So any input that is entered into that text box is what is going to be converted into an integer value because the actual text box is a text. So we're going to convert it using this pass int. Here we've got a variable called kg. We're using the pass float. The pass float function passes a string and returns a floating point number. This function determines if the first character in the specified string is a number. If it is, it passes the string until it reaches the end of the number and then returns the number as a number and not a string. That's what the float does. Line nine here I've defined a variable called BMI and a variable called new CM. I'm setting the value of the new, this variable here called new CM to pass float and I'm passing in the value in centimeters divided by a hundred. Here, the this BMI here, variable BMI, I'm setting that to equals to the kilogram, which is this, ver this variable here, divided by this value, which is this variable here, times the variable here as well. Here on line 13, Again, the value of this BMI variable is going to change. I'm going to set the value to equal to the BMI dot to fixed. Basically, the to fixed method is used to convert number into a string, keeping a specified number of decimals. In this case, I've passed it one, so it will have one decimal place. Um, console.log, you don't necessarily need that. This basically is for troubleshooting purposes. So when you run your application, you can see the value also of the BMI inside the console. So this is not, is not mandatory. You could actually comment that out or don't use it if you don't want to. 
or I tend to like it so I can see what's happening in the console as well. Line 16, we've got the document dot get element by ID and the ID is the result. So if you go into the HTML here, this is what it's referring to. Okay, so it's getting the element by its result and it's going to replace this div with the calculated value of the BMI using the inner.html. It will set the value of the BMI based on the calculated input. So that is basically it. So I'm just going to save this and then we can um, test to make sure everything works. So I'm going to open up the directory here and click on this BMI HTML file, this one. So each time you have to refer, it is the HTML file that you run. And don't forget that from the HTML file, I have linked both the CSS and the JavaScript. So I'm just going to double click on that and we can see. So I'm just going to test it. So height in centimeters, so I say 177 kilogram, I say maybe 85. I click calculate and you can see the value there. Okay, so we've got our BMI calculator working as designed. So that's it for this project. If you have any issues whatsoever, please do not hesitate to contact me. I'll be more than happy to help you. Take care and all the best. Bye. Hello and welcome to this video. Let's take a look at what we will be creating for the project. So we will be creating a height converter. Basically, it will convert feet and inches into centimeters. So let's let me give you an illustration. Say, for example, if someone's six foot and zero inches, put zero there and click on convert to centimeter, it will give give them a centimeter value. So someone who's six foot is equivalent to 183 centimeters. Say if the person was six, four, for example, six feet and four inches, you convert to centimeter, it will give you 193 centimeters. So that's basically what we are going to create for the project. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to create the directory for the project and also the HTML. I'm going to create a directory on my desktop by right clicking on the desktop and going to new folder and I'll call it height converter. So you can call yours anything you like. I just want to change that to lowercase. I'll call it height converter. So we've got the project directory sorted. Next thing I want to do is create the HTML file. So I'm using Sublime Text as my editor. So I'm just going to save this file as an HTML file inside the directory we just created. So I'll go to file and I'll do save as and it opens up inside the directory. I'm just going to give it a name. I'm going to call it H converter. The H standing for height. So I'll call it height converter.html. So I've abbreviated the height just with just the first letter and I'll click on save. So you can see on the bottom right it's called HTML. So you can see the name here also is called hconverter.html. So any HTML content I add here will be treated as HTML. So the HTML tags I've already pre-staged. I'm just going to add them on and explain line by line. So I have added the HTML code. I'm just going to run through it line by line. Line one here is what is called the doc type. So it's the very first tag you 
place in an HTML file. Basically, it's not actually part of the HTML document, but it's a declaration to notify web browsers that the content of the document is in HTML5. So the actual HTML content is from line two to line 28. So the beginning HTML is line two, and we've got the head tag, which is on line three to seven. Inside the head tag, line four, we've got the title of the document, which is called height converter. Line five, I've got a link to an external style sheet I will be using for the converter tool. And I have called the style sheet. I've called it hconverter.css. I've not created it yet. When I do, it will be called hconverter.css. So these are just the attribute related to the link. So the relative basically means it's a style sheet. Um, the type text slash CSS href basically means the location to pick up the style sheet from. Since we are having all our files in the same directory, all I need to do is just indicate the name of the file. So this will be the name of the file when I create it later. And here is the closing tag for the head section. The body tag begins on line nine and ends on line 27. The actual visible content for the application or the project is actually within the body tags. Line 11, I have created a div here and given it an ID attribute of container. So basically I am wrapping the content inside a div. A div basically is a section within a web page. So if you're sectioning off a certain area, it's known as a div. So this is the ID for the div. And I, inside the div, I've got an H1 element. So this H1 element basically will form the title for the div container, for the actual content inside the div. So I'm gonna give it a title called height converter. And here I've got this is kind of like a place label. This is a text that we just say fit. And then next to it will be this input here. So I've got an input tag where you actually will input the value in feet. And the type is a text. I've given it an ID value of feet. And got a break tag here, which means it will give a, give a space. Um, before the next. So this break basically acts like a paragraph. Here on line 15, I've got another label called inches. And after that, I've got an input type. This is where you input the value in inches. And again, it's going, the type of input is gonna be a text. The ID is gonna be inches. Um, notice I've used type here, text. I could have used number, but you know, it doesn't really matter, I've used text. So the value of the ID is inches. Again, I've got a break tag here. After the break tag, I've got another input and the type is gonna be a submit button, okay? And inside there, I've given it an ID of submit. The value of the text is gonna say convert to centimeter. And I've got double break here, just to create some space. And here on line 19, I've got a div ID with the value of result. This is where the output of the calculation, once the conversion has been made from feet and inches into centimeter, it will be displayed inside this div here. And then 22, this is the closing div. Line 25 is a reference to the external JavaScript I will be using. SROC basically stands for source, which means where am I getting the file from? Because the file is gonna be located in the same directory as the HTML and CSS, all I need to do is give it the name. So I'm gonna call it hconverter.js 
and I have not created it yet, but when I do create the JavaScript file, I'm going to call it hconverter.js. And this is the closing script. And that's the closing body tag on line 27. Line 28 is the closing HTML tag. So I'm just going to save this document. I'll click save all. And we can quickly run it and see what it looks like. So I'm going to open up the directory here and just double click on the hconverter.html file and we can see what happens here. So this is basically the h1 title tag. That's the feet, that's the inches and that's the submit button. So we're going to use CSS to make it look a bit more presentable in the next lecture. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to add the CSS for our project. Inside the HTML file, we've already got a reference to the external CSS file and I've called it hconverter.css. So I'm going to create that file now by going to file option and clicking on new and I'm going to save that into the same directory as the HTML file. So I'm going to call this hconverter, same name, but change the file extension to CSS and I'll click save. So I now have a CSS file. If you see on the bottom right here, it says CSS. I have already pre-staged the CSS. So I'm going to add that in and then run through the code with you. So I'm just going to right click and paste that in. So this is the CSS. So I'm going to start from the top. So here is the container. This container is what we are styling. It's an ID here. So if I go into my HTML, you'll see I've got an ID called container, which is this div here. That's the div I am applying this styling to. So you can see here, these are the various properties and values I'm giving to the container ID. I'm giving it a width, 375 pixels. I would strongly encourage you to play around with these values, try and add your own values so as to customize it to your own taste. Uh, margin from the left, this is the left. So from the left of the page, I, I want the container, the div, to move 350 pixels. And I also want it to move from the top. I want it to drop down from the top. This is the top. I want it to move down from the top of the page 65 pixels. I've given it a background color of black. This here is black. If you don't want to use hexadecimal color values, you can just put the name of the color if you know the color you want to use. So instead of this, I could have just typed in black. Padding to the left. Padding refers to the space inside the element. So the space inside the div element while margin refers to the space outside the div element. So I'm saying the padding inside from the left, I want it to move 30 pixels and color is white. This is hexa decimal values for the color white. So if you want to type in the name of the color instead, you can do that. Um, color here refers to the text. So any text you have inside this div, will have the color of white. So let's move on to the styling of the fit ID. So if we go into our HTML file here, you can see this input field here has got an ID of fit. That's what I'm referring to here. So again, I'm giving that input field a width of 150 pixels, height 25 pixels, margin from the top 30 pixels, margin from the left 15 pixels. Again, I've applied the same to the inches ID. So if you go into your HTML, this input here called inches, I've given it the same value. Next, let's move on to the result. 
this is where the value of the conversion is going to be outputted. So here we've got a div ID called result. So this is what I'm referring to here. I'm giving the font size 35 pixels, the margin from the left 60 pixels, the color of the text is going to be yellow. So moving on to the submit button. If I click on the HTML file here, we can see we've got an input type called submit. So this is referring to the submit input. So here again, I'm giving it a width of 250 pixels, height 35 pixels, margin to the left 20 pixels, margin from the top 25 pixels, border radius 5 pixels. Border radius basically gives, gives it a kind of like rounded edge. So I've given it 5 pixels. So you can also play around with the values so you can see how, depending on how round you want the edges to be. Border style, I've set it to none. So sometimes you can have borders that are, have a shadow, border shadow and so on. I'm just saying here, I don't want any styling on the border style. So that's why I've set the value to none. I've given the background color of the submit input, I've given it red and the actual color white color basically refers to the text inside the submit input field and here font size i'm referring to the actual size of the text inside the submit button or submit input that's going to be 25 pixels finally i've got the h1 here the h1 basically is this one here this is the title of the actual converter and I've given it a padding to the left 15 pixels padding from the top 25 pixels so padding creates a space inside while margin refers to the space outside so inside the container I'm giving it a space to the left and from the top so I'm just going to save this and then quickly run the file so we can see what it looks like. So let's double click our directory here and run the HTML file. So I'm just going to double click. You can see it's looking a bit more presentable, although nothing's going to work because we've not added the JavaScript functionality. In the next lecture, we're going to be adding the JavaScript functionality that will do the heavy lifting in making this converter tool work. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this video. We are going to be adding the JavaScript functionality that will make the converter tool work. Inside the HTML, I've already got a reference to the external JavaScript. I've called it hconverter.js. I'm not going to go ahead and create the file. So I'll click on file and then new. And I'm going to save this file. I'm going to save it as inside the same directory. And I'm going to call it hconverter.js. And I'll save that. And that will become my JavaScript file. You can see on the bottom right, it says JavaScript. I've already pre-staged the JavaScript code. I'm just going to add that in and run through the code line by line. So this is my JavaScript. So on line one, I've got the document.getElementById method and I'm passing into that parameter the submit input. So if we go into the HTML here, we've got an ID called submit. That is the ID I'm passing into this. And then I am attaching the add event listener to that. Okay. So this is basic, this add event listener basically is used to attach an event handler to the document. So I've now attached an event handler to the document and I've also attached a click 
event. You see, this is the click event. So when someone clicks on the submit button, it will trigger this function here called height converter. So this function called height converter is the function I've defined here on line three. So anything between the opening curly braces and the ending curly braces is the function that will execute when someone clicks on the submit button. So the click is the event. The add event listener is the event handler that will listen out for a click event. So the moment it listens out and it hears a click, it will call this function here which is a function I'm defining here. So line three, I started the definition of the function. You define a function by typing the word function, followed by the name you want to call the function. And then you attach parentheses, opening and closing parentheses. You also have to attach opening and curly braces. Inside the curly braces is where you add the logic for the code or for the function. So anything you want the function to do has to be between the curly braces. And you can also pass in arguments inside parentheses if you want to. But for now, our parentheses is empty. Line four, I have defined a variable called feet. And I've set that to equals to pass int. Pass int basically is a function that passes a string and returns an integer. Okay, that's what the pass int. And inside the parentheses for this pass int, I've got the document or get element by ID method, and I'm passing in the feet ID, which you can get here from this HTML input. So whatever input is entered there is what I'm referring to here. And you notice I'm attaching the value. So whatever input is entered, the value of that, we're going to multiply that by 12. One inch is equivalent to, if you want to find the value of an inch, you multiply the value in feet times 12. So whatever value you enter in as the feet, you have to multiply that by 12 to give you the value of an inch. So for example, if I entered a value of six as my feet, I will need to multiply that by 12 to convert that into inches. And then here we've got a variable called inches. Again, I'm using the pass int function and I'm using the document or get element by ID passing in the inches ID, which you can get from here inside this input. So I'm passing in that. Again, I am grabbing whatever value is entered into that input. Here on line seven, I have got a variable called centimeters, and I'm setting that to equals to the value of the feet variable plus the inches multiply by 2.54. One inch is equivalent to 2.54 centimeters. Okay, so what you the reason I put parentheses here is that we have to do this calculation first. Without the parentheses, it will do the multiplication first because it's higher up in order than the plus. So right by wrapping this in parentheses, it means it will do this first, so it will add whatever value I've got for my feet. It will then add that to the inches and then multiply that by 2.54. Line eight, I've got a variable called N and I'm setting that to the value of the centimeter variable and using the, I'm attaching that to this to fix method. This to fix is a method that converts a number into a string. Um, and you can also keep a specified number of decimals. In this case, I've just passed in the value of zero. So it's going to keep zero decimal places. So if you wanted to have two decimal places, you have to pass in that value of two 
inside that parenthesis. So we are converting feet into inches by multiplying by 12 here and then we are converting the this value here we're converting to get the value in centimeter we're adding the value in feet plus inches this variable feet plus inches and we're multiplying that by 2.54 because an inch is equivalent of 2.54 centimeters here is the two fixed method which converts a number into a string and I've passed in the value of zero decimal places. Line 12, this is where we're going to output the results. So we're grabbing the document or get element by ID and the ID we're grabbing is the results ID, which is this ID here. So we're grabbing that and we are replacing the content with the inner HTML and we're setting that to the value of n, which is this value here. So whatever this variable will output is going to display that inside this result div. So that's it. I'm going to save that and then we can test to see everything work. So I'm going to open up the directory and double click on the HTML file. Okay, so this is our height converter. I'm just going to type in a random height. So I'll say five feet say five feet 10 inches convert that into centimeter give you 178 centimeter let's try a couple more to six ten six five six feet and five inches gives you 196 centimeter we'll do one more let's say five three convert give you 160 centimeter so we've got our height converter working properly so that's it for this lecture if you have any issues please do let me know this concludes this project thanks for watching and bye for now hello and welcome for this project we are going to create a countdown timer this can be very useful if you want to go on holiday and want to know how long it is to your holiday or to an important event you could create a countdown timer that you can count down the days and hours to the event let's have a look at the overview for this project so the goal of the project is to create a countdown timer the tools development tools we'll use are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. JavaScript needs HTML and CSS to be in place before it can do its thing. We'll require a text editor and a web browser. Text editor is what we'll use to write the code. Web browser is what we'll use to view the code. Also, we'll um, have a look at the actual application we are going to create. Then we'll create the project directory we'll create the structure for the application, we we'll create the styling and finally the functionality for the project. Hello, let's have a look at what we will create for this project. So this is what we will create, a simple countdown clock that you can use to count down to any event. It could be a birthday, it could be an exciting holiday or any relevant event that you want to count down to. So this is what we will create from scratch. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to create the project directory and the files we will require for the project. I have already created my directory, which is this here. And the way I did that was just to right click on the desktop, go new folder, and then just name the folder, whatever name you like. Okay. So that's how I created my directory on a windows based machine. If you are on a Mac, you could do that on the terminal by using the make directory command, which is MKDR 
and then the name of the directory. And then to create the files inside that directory, you change directory CD to the directory you've created and then use the touch command to create the files. For me, I'm going to open up this directory in my text editor. I'm using Sublime Text. I'm using a trial version. So while, okay, so this is my directory. I've opened it up in my text editor by going file, open folder, and then browsing to that location. So now I'm here, I need to create three files that we'll need need to create the index.html, the JavaScript file, and the CSS file. So I'm going to create them inside this directory. So to create the files I need, I just right click on this directory here and go new file. And the first one will be my index. So what I'll do, I'll just save it. I'll just save as, and I'll call it Notice it's defaulted to the directory, so it knows where I want to save it. I just name it index.html. So this would be my index.html file. I need to do that in lowercase. Okay, and then I'll save that. The next file I want to create is my styled. So I'll go new, and I'll save that as my style sheet. I'm going to call it my style dot CSS. Okay, finally, I'm going to create my JavaScript file. And I'll call it. So I'll save this as my JavaScript. And I'm going to call this my, my script. Dot JS is the extension that matters, so it doesn't matter what you call it as long as it's got or they've got the right extension. They need the they need to be at a dot HTML dot JS and a dot CSS. As long as you've got the relevant extensions, that should be fine. So they're all saved, and that's it for this lecture. We have created the directory, and we have created the files we will need for our project. Bye for now. Hello. In this lecture, we are going to create the structure for our app, the countdown timer, using HTML. This is our HTML file. Um, just to save time, I've already pre-written and added the code. So I'm just going to run through the code with you. Some of the tags you may be familiar with already, so I do apologize if it's um, if I'm repeating myself. Line one is basically refers to the document type. So this is a declaration so that the web browsers and the search engines will know that the document that this page contains is a HTML5 document. So the actual HTML5 document begins from line two all the way to line 33. So anything between line two and line 33 is referred to as a HTML document. So also, if you notice, there's some indentation here so that you can differentiate between the parent and the child. The HTML tag is the, is the main parent element. And you can see the head is a child of the HTML and the body is a child of the HTML. You can tell that the tags inside the head are child elements of the head and the tags inside the body are child elements of the body tag. So let's start with the head. The head, the content of the head tag basically is for informational purposes. You don't really see them when the page is loaded. The web browsers and the search engines use, use information for the information contained in the head section. They use that for informational purposes. Okay, so on line four here, we've got a meta tag. And inside that tag, there is an attribute called car set. 
that has the value of UTF-8. Basically, this refers to the encoding type, the type of encoding or characters used for the page. Line 5 is the title for the page. Line 7 is another meta tag. Meta, by the way, means more information. Meta tag are used to provide extra information. So line 7 refers to a meta tag with an attribute called name and value description. And basically, this again is to provide information to the search engines. It's got another variable, another attribute called content with a value of holiday countdown calculator. Again, this is for informational purposes. Say if someone types into Google and types in holiday countdown calculator, Google will, this is where Google will go and look for the head section of any web browser or any web page that has that value and try and render them to display. So that's what those information are there for. Line seven, I've got another meta tag called name equals viewport. Uh, it's, it's got, uh, sorry, an attribute of name inside that meta tag. Value is viewport and also another, va another attribute called content with a value equals width equals device minus width comma initial scale. What line seven is saying is that any device regardless of the screen size. Viewport is referring to the view screen size. Regardless of the screen size can view this page and also it can zoom in. You notice I've got an initial scale here that refers to the zooming in and zooming out. Line eight refers to the style sheet, external style sheet we will reference, which is this style sheet here. Line, yep, yeah, that's the end of the head section. It ends on line nine. So let's move over to the body. As you can see, the tags are always, make sure your tags are closed properly. You can see the closing tags with the forward slash before the tag. So very important. Okay, that's the, let's go to the body. So this is the body, body tag, which starts on line 10 and ends on line 32. It's this, any content in the body tag is what you actually see when you visit a page. So the con visible content is between the body tag. I've got an H1 there on line 11. This is a title tag. It will display a title called named countdown. I've defined a div. A div basically is a division in the page. Just divide the section of a page. Line 12, I've created a div. I've given it an ID of clock div. We'll use this ID later. Um, to, we'll reference it in our JavaScript and also in our CSS. Line 14, I've created a span element. So the span, span basically used to, you add things together. So we've got a span element here. I've given it a, a class of days. The difference between a class and an ID attribute is that a class can be reused several times while an ID is unique. So I'm going to use this. I've used this class several times. I've used it on line 14. Um, used it again on, I've created several classes for that. Notice I've used this class here, the class, the class used on line 15. I've also used it here on line 19 and also on line 23 and line 27. So the difference between a class and an ID class is re re reusable several times within a page. So I've also created some other class here called hours, days, and so on. So this content basically comprises of divs and span. The span element is used to join content together. So the span, basically the span tag is a way to group inline elements in a document together. Uh, it kind of like provides a hook. It hooks a part of the text or other parts of the document together. It's kind of like the cello tape that glues them together. So that's it for the HTML structure. 
um, in our next lecture we'll be implementing our javascript and then we'll implement our css thanks for watching bye for now so this is what our page looks like at the moment with the html so this is what the html has created once we've implemented the css it will look much more better and then the javascript will provide the actual functionality for the clock hello and welcome in this lecture we are going to create the styling for our project using css to save time i've already added the css code to our style sheet so let me just run through them with you um, every in order to style an element you need to define the selector which is the item you're trying to style then you separate then you have the the curly braces that's the opening and that's the closing in between the curly braces is where you define the styling you want to use for that element on line two here the body is the selector which is the element i want to style and these are the values the properties are on the left and the values are on the you separate the property from the value with a colon and then once you've defined the value you need to end it with a semi or semicolon. if you don't do that it will not apply the styling to the element so line three there i've got a text align property and i've set the value to center what that means it will center any text for the body of that element line four is the background which is the background color i've set it to white uh, FFF is also the same thing as white in hexa value, hexadecimal values. Line five, I've defined a font family. Font family is actually the font type. I've defined sans serif as the first choice. And if that's not available, it will default to Arial. These are, this one, one or the other should be available on most computers. Line six is the font weight font weight property basically is used to set how thick or thin you want the characters in the text to be displayed okay so there are several ways you can do this you can set it to bold other values can include normal or you can actually set a number if you are setting a number value you can do that to define the thickness of the characters if you specify a hundred like i've done here on line 20 um, it defines the thickness of the characters so the thickness from 400 for example is the same as normal if i was to set this value from bold to normal it's the same thing as saying instead of bold i could set that to instead of normal i could set that to 400 so bold is equivalent to 700 notice here in line 20 i've used just 100 so to make the text bold is equivalent to 700 then anything above that it increases the thickness of the characters line 9 i am styling the h1 selector which is our title for the web page and giving it a color i'm using a hexadecimal value for the color uh, font weight again i'm using bold which is equivalent to 700 font size which is the actual size of the font or text i've set that to 50 pixels i have set the margin on line 13 to one three five zero and twenty pixels margin basically refers to the space outside the element and there's usually four values you've got the top the right 
the bottom and the left so you apply it in that order top right bottom left the fact that i've only specified three values for on line 13 those three values will apply the first value goes to the top top the second goes to the right and the third goes to the bottom all right so the first value goes to the top the second sorry will go to the right and the left margin all right and then the last value will go to the bottom whereby i've specified only three values the first goes to the top the second value goes to the right and the left and the last goes to the bottom so that's how you specify the margin padding is the same way you apply it in the same way but padding refers to the space inside the element don't forget to end your values with a semicolon and don't forget to separate the properties from the values with a colon if not it will not apply properly line 16 to 23 i have got an id that i'm styling the id here i've got the id as clock div and i've applied the following properties and values um, some of them i've already gone through so i'm not going to run through them again line 19 display means i want the elements displayed as a block in line so it will show the hours the days minutes all in a block in line font weight i've already covered text align i've covered font size i've already covered line 25 is interesting i have got the same div but notice i've got a greater than sign after it the greater than sign on line 25 means it's applying to the immediate children of that div all right so which means apply this styling here to the immediate children of this clock div called div so if we go to our html this is the clock div we've got a clock div here okay and this clock div has got other divs and it's also got span elements that's what it's referring to whereby you have um, say for example a three tier level of div the styling the this styling will only affect the second level of div and not the third however if you if i was to use a space between the selectors instead of the greater than sign then it will affect both the second and the third level divs so the space usually means if you, if you just create a space rather than the greater than sign it will apply to all the levels of that element um, please note that the greater than selector is not supported in lower versions of internet explorer okay but it should work in other higher versions of it again here line 32 i've used the div here and greater than sign what that means it will apply this styling to the child element of the div that is called span okay that's what that means it will apply to that to the child element border radius refers to the rounded corners it makes the elements gives it a rounded edge um, background i've already discussed display line we've already mentioned padding refers to the space inside the element and it pretty much works the same way as the margin so it has the four corners that i mentioned previously and um, font size i've already discussed so i'll just save this and then we can see what our page looks like excellent so this is what the styling looks like not too bad um, notice none of the, the days hours none of these is showing yet we will implement that using javascript so that's it for this lecture. Thank you for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to create the functionality for our project using JavaScript. 
we are going to create a few functions. Um, I've created the first one here. I've called it get time remaining. When defining functions, you type in the word function followed by a space and then the name you call the function. Always name your functions to reflect what you want them to do. Every function will have a parenthesis and it can be empty or you can pass in values also known as arguments or parameters. Notice I've passed it a parameter or argument called end time. The end time is a property that returns the time that ends in seconds. It returns the ending time in seconds. Line two, I have created a variable. Line two, I've got a variable called, I've named it just with the letter T and I've set it to equals to the date dot pass and then passed it an argument of end time, which we spoke about from line one end the end time property. The end time property basically returns the time ending in seconds. And I've set that to minus the date dot pass. And then in there, you will pass it in the new date function or method. The date dot pass method is used to pass a date or string and returns the number of milliseconds. Okay. So usually is between the date string and the midnight of January 1, 1970. On line two, um, we've got the new date here, a new date object here. So what that does, we created in, it creates an instance of the date and uh, which represents a single moment in time. The date objects are usually based on the time value. All right. That is usually the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970. Line three, um, created a variable called seconds, which I've set to equals to the math.floor method. The math.floor function is a JavaScript function that is used to return the largest integer less than or equal to a given number. So on line three there, I've in the maths.floor function, I've passed it inside this parameter, I've passed it the variable from line two, divided that by a thousand, and then taken 60% of that. That will give us the seconds, the time in seconds. Line four, I've done a similar thing to achieve the time in minutes. Line five, done the same thing to achieve the time in hours. That's 24 hours. Give me a 24 hours clock. All right. Notice that line four, I've divided the thousand, I've divided that by 60 then and the percentage. However, line five done the same a thousand times 60 times 60 again, then the percentage is 24. Okay. That will give us the hours. Then to get the days, which is on line six, did similar thing that you divide it. You have a thousand times 60 times 60 times 24. All right, that will give us the days. You divide the variable by the variable T, you divide that by these values. When you have um, values surrounded in parentheses, that means the, you do the, you achieve this first. What that means, the multiplication will take place first before the division. All right, and same similar thing with that. You do the multiplication before the division. Anything in parentheses is takes a precedent order. Line seven, I've also specified a return. Not you can 
define returns with functions. Functions don't have to return anything, but if you want them to return something, you can always use a return. So I specify that here on line seven um, to return these values, okay? To return the total time, which is this total variable, um, then gives me days, hours, minutes, and seconds. So these are the values I've asked the function to return based on the values I have specified. I have added another function um, from line 15 to 37. This function I've called initialize clock. So this is a function that will initialize the clock. I passed it two arguments or two parameters. First is the ID. The second is the end time. Um, I've already mentioned the end time property, but the ID it will take it would also have look for the ID value. So the two two parameters here, ID and end time. Line 16 to 20, I've defined a few variables there. Um, the variable names are self-explanatory. I've set it to them to equals to document or get element by ID. Notice I passed it the ID here. And basically the document dot query selector method is used to return the first element that matches a specified CSS selector or selectors in the document. All right. So the query method only returns the first element that matches the specified selector. So here, these are the selectors. So we've got this variable here equals to clock dot query selector and passed it the days variables. Notice we created, if we go up here, we created these variables there. So we've got the returns, days, hours, and so on. So that's what it's referring to. Um, the hours here, the query selector will return that and that will return these. So these days, hours, minutes, these are if we go in our HTML, which you see there here, we've got this ID. We've got, let's scroll up. We've got class hours, we've got minutes, and we've got seconds. So if I go back to our, you see, notice the dot here represents a class. Anyway, you, if you've got an ID, it will be a hashtag. So the dot represents a class. So this query dot selector method takes in the day class, hour class, minutes class, and seconds class. These classes were all defined in the HTML. All right, that's what that means. Created another function here on line 22 called update clock. This will be used to update the clock. And given a variable of, it would take the variable we defined earlier, get time remaining, past it that end time. All right, and then these are various other properties. So the days dot span dot inner element set that to the T variable dot days. And notice here I've used a slice method. The slice method basically is used to extract parts of a string and it returns the extracted parts in a new string. So the first character usually has a position of zero. The second has a position of one and so on. However, you can also use negative numbers to select from the end. If you're using negative number, it will make the selection from the end of the string. String is also known as text. Um, we've got an if statement here saying if this value is less than or equals to this, then clear the time interval. And we've got, then we, here we've got the update clock. We've got the variable time interval equals to set interval. So we're setting, we're updating the clock every um, milliseconds. That's what that means. All right, just to update the clock. Okay, line 38 and 39, I've added a variable here called deadline. I've set it equals to a new date object. And we passed it, used the date.pass method and we've got some values here in this new date uh, method object. So we've got, we add in a plot seven, so seven days of the week, 
and then times 24 hours of the day times the 60 seconds uh, 60, 60 seconds give you one minute and then 60 um, seconds again they will multiply it by the interval which is this interval here okay and here we've we call this function here the initialize function this clock here we've we're calling this function here and we've passed it two variables we've passed it the clock div which is the actual clock div and also we've passed it this variable called deadline all right so we're calling this function we defined in line 15 we're calling it here to initialize the clock to get the clock started all right so if there are any parts of this um, functions you don't understand please do let me know this here the hours of span dot inner means it will replace what's in the div this div here this we've got a span element here if we go to our html they are all defined here the span so that's what it's referring to it will replace the content with these values all right zero plus this t here refers to the variables dot the hours minutes refers to these values we've already defined i've already mentioned what the slice method does all right so that's it i'll just save the code and if we open our all right this is the clock if i refresh it it should that function should kick in and initialize the clock all right there you go so we've set the clock and it's ticking away um, i'll show you how to change if you wanted to change the days i'll currently set it to the timeout for that day if we go this is where we actually set the timer i've set it at the moment to seven days so if you wanted to change for example set it the timer for an event that's happening in 30 days time you this is where you change it you change this number to 30 these you can leave as standard because this will represent the hour this will represent the minutes this will represent the second and this will be the time interval all right so the only thing you really need to change if you want to change the days this is where you would change it all right just to let you know so that's it our countdown clock is ticking away i've currently set it at the moment for an event that will expire in six days time so it's counting down to the event at the moment thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome for this project we are going to create a to-do list app where you can store data locally in your browser let's have a quick overview of what we are going to cover so the objective and requirements we, the goal here is to create a to-do list app that we can store the data locally in our web browser the development tools we'll need are html css and javascript the required tool will need a text editor and we need a web browser to view the result of our code also we'll cover introduction to the app we'll be creating a project directory we'll be creating the actual structure for the app using html we'll be applying styling using css and finally the functionality will be applied using javascript hello and welcome let's have a look at the to-do list we will be building for this project so this is the to-do list we will be creating and you should be able to add and remove list as required so for example i pop in a message i just say give discounts I click add it pops up there if I refresh my browser the message will still be there because it is saved locally inside the web browser if I don't need it anymore I can just go delete refresh my browser and the message will be gone so this is what we will be creating 
for this project. It's something that you can use by yourself or you can share with others. It's a very useful tool. So that's it for this introduction to our to-do list app. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to create the project directory and the files we will use for the project. So you can either create a directory. If you're on a Windows, just right click on your desktop and go new folder and just call your directory, whatever. I just call mine to do list. If you are on a Mac, you could use the command command line and do mkdir to create a directory. You could do the same on a Windows. If you on, if you use the command line, you could do mkdir space and then the name of the directory. For Macs, you can do the same with the terminal. So now I've created the main project directory and inside this directory, we're going to have three files the index.html file, the CSS file, and the JavaScript file. So I am using Sublime Text for my text editor. So I'm going to open up this directory in Sublime Text and then create the files I need within Sublime Text. So I have opened the directory I created with Sublime Text. All you need to do if you are using Sublime Text, you just go File, open folder and then browse to the location and pick it up from there. Okay, you can do the same with brackets. If you're using brackets, you can also open up your project directory inside brackets. So now that we've got it listed, I can just create the files I need. So I just right click and go new file. And this will be my index. I just label it index so that I know what it is. And then when I save it, I'll be saving it as an index.html file inside the root of that directory. So I just do index.html. So I've saved that as an index.html file. The next uh, will be my style sheet. I'll go style and do file save all and I do I'll call it my style dot CSS okay finally we'll do a JavaScript file I just call it script so that I know what it is and do save all and I call it my script dot js. All right, so we've got all my files created inside the directory. So if I open up the directory on my desktop, you should see the three files. So that's my directory, that's the index, that's the script, and that's the style. They're empty at the moment, but we will be populating them or writing code for each of the files as the, as the project progresses. So that's it for this lecture. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to be creating the structure for our app using HTML. So I have got my text editor open. I am inside the index.html file, which is what I've highlighted. So this is where we'll create the structure for the app. The way this is going to work, um, what I'm going to do rather than you watch me type the code, I will pre-write the code and then explain what I have done. Line one here, I have got a line of code here, which is known as the declaration. This basically is the first thing you do in an HTML document. And what this does, it notifies the web browser that the page they are about to view is an HTML5 document. Line two and line four, 
they are HTML tags. So that's where the actual HTML begins. So the content between these two tags here is what will be the HTML content. So in between this HTML tags, we will nest other tags that will together build up the HTML content. Line two here just is the beginning of the HTML tag followed by the lang. This is an attribute and the value is en, which means English. So with attributes, you need to enclose their values in quotes. And every tag, most tags should have an opening and a closing. The closing tag, you can tell by the forward slash before the tag is closed. I have added some more code which is the head tag from line three here to line seven. Um, you can see they are paired because you've got the dotted line under the closing and under the big opening tag. So this is the head tag. Most of the tags or information within the head tag is not visible within the browser. That means visitors can't see them. Um, they're only there for information purposes and also to help with search engines. All right, so inside the head tag, we've got a few meta tags um, with attributes attached. So with the first line on line four there, we've got the meta tag and we've got a meta car set. The car set is the attribute and the value is UTF-8. It's basically the type of encoding that is used in most web browsers. So it's um, most characters are supported by the UTF-8. It's an encoding type. Line five here, we've got a meta with an attribute of name. Um, the name basically it's the attribute and the value is viewport. Viewport basically refers to the screen size of any device. So what it's saying here is that this, this website or this app is adaptable to any screen size. So regardless of what device you're using to view, you'll be able to fit it to the screen size. That's basically what line five is saying. Okay, and uh, you can see the content here. Say the content equals to the width equals to device minus width. So basically it's what they're saying here is that regardless, the content can be viewed regardless of the device um, width. Okay, so whether the screen is small or large, you can scale it. And the initial scale here is 1.0. It says here, user scalable, yes. That means the user can scale or resize the screen to fit the app. Okay, line six here is, is this is, if you have any reference to your style sheet, this is where you need to include it. So this style sheet here, that's the reference I've put here to the style sheet. So I have added the final chunk of code for the body tag. So from line eight to line 15. So the body tag starts from line eight and in between the body tag, I have also nested some other tag. I've missed out the closing body tag. Okay, so that's the closing body tag. I just save that, okay. So in between the body tag, I have got other nested tags. So we've got the div. The div basically is used to divide a section of a page. And I've given it an ID attribute equals to wrapper. The ID is useful because I will use that to target that div during our CSS styling. Line 10 here basically is an H1 heading tag with a title to do list. 11 is the input. This is where we will actually type the task we want to do. And I've given it an ID with a value of task. Again, we'll use this ID for styling purposes later. I've also attached a button next to the input and the button I have given the button an ID is equals to add. So this is where the button will click to add the task once we've done the input. Okay, and I've given the ID an attribute as well. We'll use that to style as well. And here, this is how you write a comment in HTML. If you don't want it, anything with a comment, 
the web browser will ignore. So you do a left angle bracket, quest, exclamation, dash, dash, and then double dash, and then right angle bracket. So you can see it's almost grayed out. So anything with that, the web browser will not run that piece of code. All right, Num line 13, I've created another div here with div ID to do's. This div here um, is where the to do's will be listed. Once we've set it up properly, they'll be listed inside this div. All right. Line 11, we've got a script tag. So this is where we will, this JavaScript file we created here, we are making reference to it inside our HTML document. So any script we'll write, which will be in the script file, will be referenced from here. All right. So that's it for our HTML document. If I just save that, I think I have already. And let's run it so we can see what it looks like. So this is the project folder. I just open it up and double click to run the HTML so we can see what the HTML looks like. Let's just minimize that a bit. All right, so this is what our page looks like at the moment. This is where we'll add the task and we'll input the task and this is where we'll add it. So that's it for the structure. In our next lecture, we'll be building or styling this content to make it look a bit prettier using CSS. That's it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to be styling our HTML that we created for our app. So I'm inside my text editor and this is the CSS file. So this is where we're going to define the styling for our app. So we're going to use the IDs where we've got IDs to use. If not, we'll use the actual element to style the HTML. I have added some basic styling here for the body of the actual HTML. So this style would be applied to the body. When you're styling, you need to have a selector. In this case, the body is a selector. And then in between the curly braces, this one and this one here, you specify the properties and the value you want to apply to the selector. So in this case, I have got several properties here. The text align is a property and I want the text to be centered. I've um, got another property here called background color and I've given it a hex value background color. You don't have to use hex value. For example, if you know the actual color name, you could specify that in place of the hex value. Here again, the color, I specify white. This color here refers to the color of the text you use for the body, not the actual, not the actual um, background, okay? If you want a background color, you need to specify background color. Font family refers to the font, the type of font that you can use. It's always good to specify more than one. So I'll just add area, just in case the first font is not available on the machine that is viewing this page. So it can default to the other one. So what I'm saying here, this is my first choice. If that font is now available, default to that. So most computers should have either both or either. I have added a chunk more of styling from line eight here to line 18. Notice here I've used the ID attribute. This ID here is derived from this ID inside here. We've got an ID here called add. That's the ID I am referring to here. All right, so that's the target. And these are the properties and these are the values. So you separate the property from the value with a colon. Okay, so again, this is the ID I'm styling. The background color, I've given it red. Border set to zero. I don't want a border. Color is white, which is a color of, the, it's referring to color of the text. Padding, okay, padding is a space inside the element while margin is a space outside it. So these are the values that specify for the padding. The cursor, the cursor property basically specifies the type of cursor 
to be displayed when pointing on an element. That's what that is. So I've just said pointer. Margin, again, refers to this space outside. So what I'm saying here from the top, I want, I want you, I want there to be a space 35 pixels from the top. That's what that means. I have added some more styling from line 19 to 25. And this time I am styling a class. So if you've got a dot followed by a name, that is a class. So I'm styling a class. This class will be added automatically with our JavaScript, but I'm just preparing the styling for that beforehand. So again, the class here is the selector. We've got the property margin. I'm saying from the top, I want it to drop 13 pixels. Background color, I've set that to X color, X value. Float, I mean, float basically, if you've got, it means I want the element to move to the right. Okay. And uh, where you have elements moving to the right, you need to also specify a clear. So when you use float, you need to use clear. Clear basically is used to clear any obstruction on either side. And then the background color. So we've got padding. Padding refers to the space inside. So I'm saying the space inside from the right. I want it to move 20 pixels. Border radius is what gives it a rounded corner. So if you've got a square, the border radius kind of like makes it round a bit. So that's what the border radius property does. All right, I've added a couple more properties to this class here. Uh, giving it a width of 60 pixels and a height of 20 pixels. Um, border style, I've set it to none so that there are no shadows or nothing on the borders. I've added some more styling to this ID called wrapper, which if we go into our HTML here, we'll see that we've got an ID here called wrapper, which is the main div. That's the one I'm targeting here. And these are the styling I've applied to that ID. Again, the width, I've set a width of 450 pixels, a background color, I've given it a hex value. The margin, I've set it margin from the top. I've said I want it to drop 120 pixels. Margin from the left, I want it to move to 295 pixels. Padding from the bottom. Remember, padding is a space inside the element, while margin is a space outside the element. So padding from the bottom, 30 pixels. Padding left, 50 pixels. Padding top, 30 right 65 border radius 25 pixels by all means play around with these values you don't necessarily have to stick to my values just play around and experiment and see what works for you i have added a chunk more of styling from line 43 to 57 so fourth i'll explain 43 to 48 first the, that is the UL, which is the on ordered list, which I will insert using the using JavaScript. Basically, these are the styling. Um, the list style, I, want, I don't want it to have any styling on the list. And I've set the text align to left. Line height is the space between each text. Okay, and then on line 49, the ID called task. So that's where we'll actually input the, the task we want to carry out. So the task ID here on line 49, giving it a width of 320 pixels, a height of 30 pixels, the margin from the left, I've told it to move 17 pixels. And line 54 is the H1 tag, which I've given a margin from the top. I've said I want it to move 30 pixels from the top. That's what that means. Okay. So that's all our styling done. I'll just save that. And we can try and view our app and see what it looks like. All right. So this is what the app looks like before the styling. So I'll just refresh. And this is what it looks like now after the styling. So it looks much nicer more presentable with the styling. So that's it for the styling for this 
project in the next lecture we'll be doing the actual javascript writing javascript code that will make all this work thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome in this lecture we are going to be creating the functionality for our to-do app using javascript all right so we are in our javascript file so we are going to be creating several functions inside this javascript file that will perform various tasks the first fun function i am going to create here is going to fetch from the database the to do's that have already been defined all right so we're going to start there create a function whose, whose main task is to go to the database and retrieve the to-do lists that are in the database and we're going to implement this using local storage because we're going to be storing the data inside our web browser okay here is the function i have defined this function is going to be used by all the other functions that will be created later um, so what this function is going to do as you can see there's no parameters passed in if not passed in any parameters the main purpose of this function is to fetch the content of the to do list uh, which would be a key in the local storage so it will be using the get item method which is this method to retrieve the to do list the to do items that inside this local storage so if this is the first time the function is called the specific local storage entry will probably be empty okay and the local storage dot get item call will return null that means it will return empty so line four here i've introduced an if statement so basically what the if statement is is saying that if the return value is not null that is if it is not empty then it must be the string stringified data we, which has been stored all right so the json here the json.pass is used to convert the json string back into javascript data that the browser can display the return here on line 7 is used to when you create a function you can also specify a return value so if there's any data in the database this return value here will return the data that's in the local storage so the function here you define the function by type in the name function followed by the name you want to give the function i've given it a name of get underscore to do's and line two and three are basically variables i've created line two the variables to do's set it to equals to a new array an array can combine multiple variables as one line three again created another variable called to do's underscore str which stands for string and i've set it to equals to local storage dot get item method and passed it the to do which is this variable here uh, okay i've explained line four so if the to do's this variable here is strictly this exclamation and double equals means strictly if it is strictly not empty then return then you get this and convert it using this to javascript okay and pass it this variable here and return whatever you find in the data database that's what that's saying so i've created another function um, from line 10 to 20 this function is called add all right so what the function will do the function is it will be called when the user or visitor clicks on the button okay so when the button is clicked on it will get it will trigger this 
method here document or get element by id and it will, it is passed in task the task which is the value here it was defined in the html which is this task here that's the id is talking about it will get that and then add the value that has been inputted so it will use that and retrieve the value that the user has typed in all right so then we what what it then does it calls the get on line 13 there it's called i've got a variable called to do's which is equals to get to do's so it calls the get to do's we retrieve the already existing to do items from the database all right and then when and then it is appended to the array using the push method so this push method is used to append to a list that is you add to a list using the push method so it's saying for these variables attach this method and any task that has been listed you add if there's any more task you need to add append it to the existing list so the push is used to add or append so once the new list is appended it is saved to local storage using the local storage dot set items the dot set item is what is used to store it inside the local storage so to store that what we need to do first we use the stringify we have to stringify the array okay so the using the json dot stringify method and what, what that does when we store it enables us to store the returned string using the local storage dot set item method i have in i've called a function here show but we've not implemented written that function yet but this is where we will also call the function from so later on we'll write a function called show all right notice notice we've got a return value here called force um, so what that does it avoids any further actions generated by the click event so even though the users click it will avoid any further action that's what that means what i'm going to do is split this lecture in two uh, for the javascript because it's gone on a bit long so i'm going to stop this lecture here and we'll continue in part two thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to the part two of creating the app functionality using JavaScript. I have added two functions here. The first function is called clear default from line 22 to 25. What this function will do, it will clear and for example, once you've typed in a task and it will check to make sure that the task is still not hanging around in the input box so that's what this value is it means that if any values in there it says if this if there's a value a dot default value is strictly equals to a dot the value then clear the value and set the value which is a dot value equals to make it blank that's what it means so it's basically is to clear any input that is left hanging around after you've added the task so that's what that function is there for okay and the second function which is called the remove function from line 27 to 36 all right so what the remove function will do it is called when the user clicks on any of the task to remove them so if they click on the remove button on the task they no longer need it will remove that the remove button will trigger the function and the item will be removed all right so this function contains um, two variables got variable id um, which is set equals to this dot get attribute this refers to the current dom element which is being removed as of the time the user clicks on the remove button okay so we ret the retrieve the value of its id attribute using the get attribute method okay this is the index of the specific to do item among the to do items in the database 
okay so after retrieving the current list of to do items we'll use the splice method to remove a specific element from the javascript array and then we store the new task back in the database so you use push to append and you use splice to remove okay so once the item has been removed we use the splice method to remove that id and then store what's left in local storage okay that's basically what this function done i notice again we've called this show function here we've not defined it here again this show function what will do it will it will show what's in the database and we've set a return value so that nothing else is triggered after the show function has been called the final function we are going to create um, is this one here called the show we have been calling we've called this function several times within other functions but here we where we actually define the function the show function will display the current to-do list stored in the database okay so if you notice the first thing it does on line 39 with the variable here is it calls the get to do's okay so it calls the get to do's to get the list of array of the to do items regardless if they're empty or not on line 41 we got a variable called html and set it equals to the value of a tag which is an on ordered list so here we are manually creating snippet of some html tag from this variable using using the variable to set the value okay so the ui element is an unordered list we've also set it up with unordered list they need to have an li item which is a list item so this will be a list item for each of the to do entry in addition to the content of the to do's array um, i've also added a button to each of the list items okay so you can see here added a button this button will be i've added as a class so it will be added to each of the list items so as you add a task it will automatically insert a button that users can use to remove the task if they no longer require the task so each of the button belongs to a class called remove and each button has an id containing the index of the to-do item in the list retrieved from the database okay so the buttons will I'll enable the user to remove the item they no longer require from the list on line 47 the document dot get element by id and inside the value we passed it the to do's what that will do it will insert the newly generated html snippet in the original load in the original document loaded from the server all right so it will not insert it inside html it actually replaces the content of the element with the id to do's that's what that means okay this means in subsequent calls it will just show the new list regardless of what was there earlier that's basically what it does the inner.html enables it to do that in the next couple of lines from line 49 all the way to 51 so the get element by class name this method is used to fetch all the buttons that are in the remove class so these are the buttons we have we added previously um, added to each of the to do item above so to each button we assign a event listener that will listen out for any click on the button when that happens it will be triggered okay once the user clicks it will be triggered and the connect when the user clicks on the button it triggers off the function and once the click is done 
the event listener triggers up the function, the item is then removed. As you can see here, we've passed it, the, the click is the event and the remove is the function. Okay, so this is the event. When you attach an event listener, there must be parameters passed. One would be the first would be the event you're listening out for. And the second will be the function that will be triggered when that occurs. So when that occurs, this remove function will come into play and the item will be removed via the button. Line 55 here is the document.getElementById and we've passed it the ID add, which is the task. When you add the task, it, it's got an event listener attached to it as well. So what that happens when you add a task, for example, and you click, if you click on the task after you've added it, it will use, it will trigger this function called add and then call this show function here. All right, so once that is done, this show function here will be called and the list of items will be displayed. So uh, that's it for all the JavaScript code. So I'll save that. And if we run our app, we should get it working now. All right, so this is our app completed. Let's do some tests and see. Let's do... Hello student. Okay, there you go. Thanks. Okay, so save that. If I refresh, you can see the data is still persistent. All right, so we can just click to delete if we no longer need that and that will disappear. So now let me, let's see where this data is actually saved so that you, you know where to look if you need to. To check where the data is stored, you click on F12 on your keyboard. So the F12 key should bring up a screen like this. And make sure you've got a tab called resources. If you can't see, just expand it and you should see it listed. Uh, I am using Google Chrome. So once you click on resources, you should get this list items here. So these are the databases. So on that local storage, you expand that and click on file. So you can see here the key because local storage stores data using the key and then a value. So the key here is to do, okay, which is this uh, list and these are the values. You see the, any more list I add on here, we just get appended here. So you can see the value here is this one had. So if I add another, so let me say discount and I click add and I refresh my browser, you see the discount there is popped up there. All right, so it just stores them as an array. You can see the, the square brackets there. So it stores them as an array. So that's basically where your items are stored for the to-do list. So that's it for this project. Thanks for watching. I hope it's gonna be useful to you. This is a practical tool that you can use yourself or share with others. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. For this project, we are going to create an image slider. Let's have an overview of what this project is going to be all about. So we'll begin with the objective and requirements. So the goal here is to create an image slider where we can slide through multiple images. The development tools we'll be using will be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. We'll need a text editor and a web browser to view the slider. Also, we'll have an introduction to the actual slider, what we're going to build. We'll create a project directory. We'll create the structure for the app or image slider. I uh, will be creating the styling for the image slide as well. Finally, we'll be creating the functionality for the slider. Hello, in this lecture, we are going to have a quick look at what we will create for this project. 
So this is the image slider we are going to create. The images will be different, obviously, because you'll have to use your own images. So once you've got your images ready, you can just flick through. Okay. So you learn how to make all the images the same size and how to activate. You've got the, you can go forward or you can go backwards. So we'll learn how to do all this in this project. Okay. So we are, for this slide, I have used seven images. So you can download seven images of your choice that we will use for this project. So that's it for the introduction to what we will create. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello. In this lecture, we are going to create the project directory and the files we'll need for this project. I have already created my project directory, which is this one here. And inside I've got my files. I've got an index.html file, a blank script file, my JavaScript and a blank CSS file. I've also got an images folder where I have downloaded seven images. So please, please download seven images of your choice. And when you create the folder, make sure you've got seven images inside this folder. My images are JPEG. So make sure you save them as dot jpeg okay so this is the folder structure okay or directory structure all right so i've also opened this up in my text editor so this is my text editor i'm using sublime text so that's the main directory there and inside there i've got another sub directory if i expand i've got all my images and then i've got three files index file as I got my script file and then my CSS file. So the way I create I created the files, the single files, I use my text editor. All I had to do was go to the root, which is the main directory folder, right click and just create a new, new file. And then I created the file and named it, I named it dot HTML dot JS and a dot CSS. Okay. So make sure you've got a folder, two folders, one inside the main folder, make sure you call it and name it images and make sure you have seven images in there. You can have more if you wish, but I've used seven for this project. So if you want to be on the same page, you can use seven as well. So that's it for this project. The project directory is created. The files will need created also the images directory created. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to create the structure for our app using HTML. All right, I've got my text editor open. So I'm just going to switch to my blank HTML file here. That's it there called index.html. So the way this lecture is going to work, I'm going to pre-write the code and then I'll add it on and explain what I have done. I have just added some HTML tags. The very first line here, the doc type is not actually part of the HTML document. It's called a doc type. So it's a declaration. The purpose of the doc type is to notify the web browsers or search engines that the document contains HTML5. So that's the main purpose. The actual HTML document starts from line two, which is the opening tag and line five, which is the closing tag. So every other content between this HTML opening and closing tag will comprise of the content of this page. So we're going to sub nest other tags inside this element, this HTML element. So we're going to nest child elements. I have added a child element, which is the head tag here, line three to eight. 
Um, so also notice I've indented properly so you can tell by looking at the code that the head element here is a child of the HTML and these tags here are children of the head tag. So the head tag is mainly for informational purposes. You don't actually see the content of the head tags. They are there to provide information for the web browsers and for search engine purposes. So we've got a title tag on line four, which basically displays the title of the page. Then line five, we've got a meta tag and inside of it is got an attribute called car set with a value of UTF-8. So metacast, the car set, it refers to the encoding type for this document. The standard is UTF-8. Line number six of the code, we've got another meta tag with a attribute of name and a value of viewport. Also another attribute called content with a value of width equals device minus width comma initial dash scale equals one. What line seven is saying is that, sorry, what line six is saying is that this document can be viewed by any device regardless of the screen size. So you can have a small device like a cell phone or a big device like a big computer screen. And also I've set the initial scale to dash one. That means equals one. You can zoom. This scale here enables you to zoom in and out. Line seven is a reference to our external style sheet, which is here, this style sheet here. That's a reference to the style sheet. I have added another child element, which is the body. So the content of the body tag, the body starts from line 10 and ends on line 26. So this is the actual content that will be visible when a visitor goes to this page. Okay, so only the content between the body tag is displayed. The body tag on line 11 there, I have got a heading tag, which is a H1. And I've also used some in line styling. So rather than, I'm gonna do some external styling later, but I've also embedded some inline styling here. So line 11, I've got the H1 tag, which is the heading tag, and I've applied a style to it, giving it a color black, and giving it a margin to the left of 395 pixels, and the font weight refers to the boldness. So I've given it um, a value of bold, and then the actual title, the text that will be displayed is image slider. I've inserted a couple of break tags to create some space on line 12 and 13. Line 14 to line 21 is where we create a div. Uh, we create a main div on line 14 called wrapper and given it, this will be the main div that will wrap the the images. So giving it a style maximum width of a thousand pixels and position to be relative. Okay, and I've created a few image tags, IMG tags, and giving them a class of slice. So they all belong to the same class. So when I'm doing the CSS later, the styling will be applied to this image class. So with the image class slides, uh, I've also, with the IMG, you need to specify the location of the image. So the location of the image, you do that using an attribute. So the source attribute here is used to specify where the image is coming from. So the image is coming from my images folder, and that's the first image, second image, third, fourth, and so on. I've applied a styling to the images to the width to be 100% of the parent container but we'll modify this slightly when we are doing our external style sheet. On line 22 and 23, I've created a class called button one and button two, giving it a position of absolute. And so from the top, 45% of the parent container 
from the left, I've set it to zero. I've also attached a event on click event to it, event handler. And what this will do, and I've actually attached a function. I've created a function here. We'll show, I will display this, show you how this was done in the JavaScript later. So this is what the function will do. It will check for the number of slide and respond accordingly. Um, here in this button here, I've created a span. The reason I put a span here is so that I can style this, this, um, entity. This entity is used to create a less than, and this is used to create, um, equal greater than. Okay. So the ampersand GT will create a greater than sign and the upper sign LT will create a less than sign. So we're going to use the, the greater and less than sign to switch between next and previous on the slide. But I need to wrap them inside the span ID so that I can style them properly because you can't style them alone. It's a bit difficult. That's why I've wrapped them around the span element. And the div ends here on line 24. Line 25 is a reference to our script. The script is JavaScript is always placed just before the closing body tag so that it doesn't, it, it waits for all the elements on the page to load before the script executes. So that's it for our HTML for this project. Thanks for watching and bye for now. I'll just save that. And we can have a quick look and see what it looks like. So this is what the page looks like at the moment. Obviously the functionality is not in place, so we can't slide through the images at the moment, but at least we've um, got the structure in place. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to create the styling for our app using CSS. So this is the styling where we use for our app from the external CSS file. So I'll just run through the styling with you. Line one to five is the first selector. So we are using the button one ID selector. That button one was defined in our HTML. So what I'm saying here is that the padding, padding refers to the space inside the element while margin refers to the space outside. And they both have four corners, which is top, right, bottom, left. So I've said I want the padding to be 10 pixels for all the four corners, top, right, bottom, left. Border radius, I've specified it to be 30 pixels. But border radius makes is what gives us um, a square or rectangle there around round corners. I've set the background color to lime for button number. I've got another button ID here called button NR. Again, padding 10 pixels, similar styling with the first button. And then I've got that is, I've got an image. This is the image tag. I've set the width for all the images. So all the, I want all the images to have the same size and height. So this is where I've set it. I want the width to be 958 pixels and the height 578 pixels. You could play around with the values and change it if you wish just to see the one that suits you best. I've got another, I've got a class here called wrapper. This is a container and I've set the margin. This is the wrapper is what will wrap the images. It will, is what will form the main slider. So I've set the margin from the left to move a hundred pixels. So that's it. If I save the styling, then we can have a look and see what the project looks like. If I just refresh. You can see the styling, the margin from the left I, I used is moved this from the left 100 pixels, shifted it that way. Okay, so we've defined that using 
we define that using this margin here. So what I'm saying that from the left, I want it to shift a hundred pixels, which is what he, because he was previously at the corner. So the margin has now shifted a hundred pixel this way. Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we are going to create the functionality for our image slider using JavaScript. All right, so this is my blank script file. So where, what I'm going to do, I've already pre-written the code. I'm just going to add the code and explain what the code does. So I have added the code that will create the functionality for the slider. So there are three functions here. We've got the first function here, sorry, two functions. We've got a function here called plus divs and we've got a function here called show divs. So I started off on line one by defining a variable called slide index and I've set the value to one. Line two, I have called the function this function here called show divs. Um, the end there means whatever value you pass in. And I've passed it the slide index, which is this, and the slide index, the value is one. So I've passed it one here. All right. Line four, let us create a function called plus div. And inside the parentheses, we'll pass the end. That end represents a value. Uh, could be an integer value could be one, two, whatever. Okay. And that function, this function here called plus div also takes in this parameter. So what this function does, it will, this function plus div calls this function as well. So we've got this function show div is being called from here. So when you want to call a function, you just type in the name and then you pass it the par parameters. So I've passed it the slide index, which is this variable here, one plus or equals to using this operator plus or equals to N. So it will be plus or equals to whatever that N represents. Okay. So N could be a number two, three, four, and so on. Okay. That's what it is. So basically what it's saying that whatever s slide number you pass in. So we started with the slide number one, it will now add slide number two and so on. That's what that N represents. The function on line eight to 17, what that function show divs. Remember the images are in divs. So I said show divs and I've passed it in, passed into the parentheses an N value. So we've got a variable called I. This I will act as a counter and variable on line 10 called variable X and I've set it to equals to document a get element by class name. Okay. And the class name, I've passed it my slides. Remember if I go to the HTML, we've got the class called slides. Okay. So that's what it's referring to. I have attached an if statement on line 11 saying that if the value of n n could represent any number i've got seven image images so the n could represent any of those numbers so if n is greater than this variable x dot length that is greater than the length of variable x then the slide index is equals to one which is this variable here if this n Okay, the n, n can represent again any number. If the variable n, if n is less than one, then this slide index equals to x, which is this variable on line 10, dot length. So it's saying that on line 13, there is a counter. It's saying that for every where i is equal to zero, i is less than x dot length, then i should be increased by one. So every time, if the, if the value of I is set to zero and then I is less than the length of the variable X, 
then increase it by one plus plus means increase so you keep you keep increasing the number of the slides as you flick through until it gets to the last one and then line 14 saying if x okay and i pass the x into an array if x dot i dot style dot display is none that is if there's no display if the display is none then it's saying x dot slide index minus one dot style display equals block that means display the images as a block that's what that's saying so this is the style the script that creates the functionality for our slider so i'll save that and i'll run the code and see what it looks like so our slider should work correctly now so if i click on this i should be able to flick through you can see all the images are of the same size okay so i can quit flicking through i can also move go back one and go back two so these are all the seven images i added to the slider so thanks for watching i hope the project has been useful if you've got any questions please feel free to ask thank you and bye for now hello and welcome to this project for this project we are going to create a quiz app let's have a look at the overview so we'll begin with the objective and requirements the goal is to create a quiz app. The development tools we'll be using are HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The required text editor we'll be using will be Sublime Text. You, you can use Sublime Text or brackets. They are both cross-platform text editor. So they'll work on Windows or Mac or even Linux. Also, we'll cover an introduction to the app. We'll be creating a project directory. We'll be creating the structure for the app using HTML and creating the presentation using CSS and the functionality using JavaScript. Hello, let's have a quick look at what we will create in this project so in this project you will learn to create something like this it's a quiz um, in this case i've created a quiz where we have to um, determine the answers for the baby names of animals for example it says here what is the baby of a moth known as i think that's known as a larva you go next what is the adult of a kid called? A goat. Next, what is the young of a buffalo, buffalo called? I think that is a calf. Next, what is a baby alligator called? It's called a hatchling. Next, what is a baby goose called? I think it's called a gosling i think and then what is the baby hamster called so this is kind of like um, an interactive quiz that we will create the questions and answers are my own but you can always modify this to suit you so for example you don't have to do a quiz based on the baby names of animals you could do yours based on something completely different from mine but obviously the format um, will be the same all right so that's it that's what we'll be creating for this project thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to this lecture in this lecture we are going to create the project directory and the files we will use for this project there are a couple of ways you could create files and directory you could do that using the terminal if you're on a mac or you could do that using the command prompt if you're on a windows you can also do it manually in this example i am going to be creating the directory and files manually 
So I'm on the Windows. So to create a folder, all I need to do is right click on my desktop and go new and click on folder and just call it say quiz. Okay. And that's my directory. If you're on a Mac and you want to use the terminal to do that, just type in MKDIR space and then the name of the directory. And to create folders on a Mac, you use the touch command. If you are on a Windows, you could do MKDIR space directory name. If you want to create a folder, in a file in command line via Windows, you type in type T Y P E space null N U L and then in right angle bracket followed by the name of the file. In this example, we'll be doing things manually. So now that I've created this directory, I'm going to open it up in my text editor and then create the files from there. So I have opened up the project in my text editor. I am using Sublime Text, which you can download for free to try and then, you know, pay later if you are happy with it. So to browse my folder, all I had to do was go file, open folder, and then browse to the location of the folder and pick the folder up. So this is the directory. So to create a file, all I have to do is right click and go new file. I'll just call this index so that I know what it is and do a file save. So I do save all and it gives me a location. The location is a directory. I just say index.html. So that would be the name of the file. I'll do the same, create a couple more. This would be my CSS file. So I'll call it save all. I just call it my style dot CSS. I do the same for the JavaScript file. Right click, new file. I'll call it JS file and save all. I do my script dot js so that's it so we've got my three four three files created and the directory for our project so if i open up the directory on my desktop you should see all three files so this is the directory that's my index my javascript and my css so during the project, we'll be co writing code for each of these files. So that's it for this lecture. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to create the structure for our app using HTML. I am inside my HTML file from my text editor directory. So the very first line of code you need to specify in an HTML document is the doc. The doc type is not part of the HTML document. It's just a declaration to notify the web browsers that are trying to display this page that this content of the page is an HTML document. That's what the declaration is. I have introduced a couple of HTML tag, line two and three. Line two there is where the beginning of the HTML document starts, starts from. That's the opening tag. Line four is the closing tag. You can tell the tags match because you can see the dotted lines under the HTML and that. So to distinguish between the opening and closing, the closing normally has a slash before the tag name. All right, and if you have any attributes, it's usually included in the opening tag. I've introduced an attribute in line two called LANG, which stands for language, and I've set the value to equals to English, which is EN for short. 
So with attributes, you enclose the values in quotes. Attributes are there to provide extra information about the element. So every other HTML tag or element we will write will be embedded or nested inside this HTML. So any content between the opening HTML and closing HTML is regarded as an HTML document. I have introduced the head tag on line three. So that's the opening head tag and that's the closing head tag on line eight. Within the head tag, you have several other tags. The head tags, basically you can't see its content when the page is viewed. It's mainly there for informational purposes to the web browsers. So inside the head tag, I have got a title tag basically which displays the title of the web page. I've also on line five got a reference to my style sheet. And I've got a main style sheet and I've also got a link to, on line seven to Google. Okay, so Google this, this link here has some special fonts which I want to use for the project. So this is a link to that font I want to use. Line seven is a script for jQuery. We'll be using some jQuery code. jQuery is a JavaScript library. So we're gonna be using some of that code in our JavaScript. So in order to have reference to the jQuery library, you need to include it in the head section. That's what I've done in line seven. So this is a reference to the jQuery library. It, it saves me installing the library on my computer. I can just access it via that link here. I have introduced a couple tags um, in line four and five. These are meta tags and they have got attributes in them. The line four meta car set. The car set basically refers to the encoding type. That is the type of characters that will be used that this page supports. So the standard for all web browsers is UTF-8. Or all the characters, anyone using UTF-8 should be able to read most characters. Line five meta, meta tag, I've got a attribute called name and the value is viewport. I've also got another within that line of code called content and the value is width equals to device width comma and then it's got the initial dash scale equals 1.0. What that means basically is that the online 5 is that this page can be viewed by any device regardless of the screen size. So you can view it with a small screen or a large screen. It will automatically resize. And that initial scale, scale means that you can zoom. That's the initial scale to zoom. So it allows you to zoom in and zoom out. All right, that's what that that's for. I have introduced the body tag. The body tag is where the main content of the web page will be displayed. Okay, so anything in the body tag is the content that people actually see when they view the web page. So inside the body tag, I have got some other tag nested. I've got an input tag, okay, and the type is text. So that's where people will actually, you actually have to type something. Okay, and I've given a placeholder of name I've also got another, uh, notice the input tags, I've given them ID attributes, which we will use later to, uh, we use later to, all right, apologies. I've had to change the code. I actually inserted the wrong code, which was input tag. We don't really need input tags here because um, we're doing a quiz, so, so apologies for that. So I've um, had to replace that code. Um, basically, the body tag here, What? This, that's the opening body and this is the closing body tag. Okay, let me just indent that a bit. Okay, so 
I've got a div here on line 15. This will be the main container. Um, it's called quiz container. So this will wrap all the other divs. And you notice the div begins there and ends here, which means it's a wrapper for the other contents. All right. So I've got H1 tag, which is a heading tag. That's just a title on line 16 on line 18 to let me just bring this up a bit so from line 17 to 23 so we've got several div tags here the div tag called class notice of giving them attribute of class we'll be using the class names for styling purposes so giving the all of them an class attribute with the values here specified so line 17 we've got a class div with the name question and we've got a ul which is the unordered list this is where we'll um, have to make a selection of the choices for the quiz the selection will be line 19 the, the div will be actual that will be the message for the quiz line 20 is the result you know that will pop up after the quiz you, you know your answers line 21 is the next button so you click next to show the next question so all these classes we will use later in our css to style these divs okay to make them more pronounced and then i've got a break tag here just to create some space underneath this button and then finally we've got a script tag it's always good to attach a script tag at the very end of your HTML document. Um, this script here ref refers to our JavaScript here, which we will write later. The reason for inserting the script at the bottom and not in the head is that you ha the script will only execute after the rest of the page has been loaded. If you insert it in the head, it will not work because it may prevent the page from loading. So it's always best to insert your script at the bottom of the page, just before the closing body tag. All right, that way the page will load completely before the script is executed. So I'll save this and then we can have a look and see what the document looks like at the... All right, so I'm in the directory. I'll just click to open and then we can see okay so this is what the page looks like at the moment it doesn't look much but when we start writing our javascript code we're gonna use that to make this page a bit more interactive so that's it for this lecture thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to this lecture in this lecture we are going to create the styling for our quiz using CSS. So this is the HTML for the quiz. So we're gonna use some of the, the IDs and classes defined for this HTML document to style the quiz. So let me switch to my CSS. So this is a blank CSS. We don't need that. That was just a label so that I know what file this is so this is where i will be creating the styling for the quiz the way it's going to work so that it, this lecture doesn't take too much time i will pre-write the code add the code and then explain it so you don't have to watch me type all the time i have added some code here um, line one, basically, I'm using the import. Basically, what this is, I am going to use the font, a font called Rocket, a font family called Rocket, and I'm getting that from Google. All right, so that's where I'm saying here, get this font from Google. So you have to import it before you can use it. So that's what I've done in line one. Line two is the selector that I'm going to be styling. So basically I'm saying the H1, which is the heading. These are the styling I am applying to it. 
the font family I'll be using the rocket from Google and I've also got a substitute font called serif so if the rocket is not available it will default to the second option always good to specify more than one font when you are declaring a font family property line 4 is a text align property where I want the text to be centered line 5 is the color I've set and use a hex value there line 6 is basically the size of the font or the text for that H1 selector I have added another chunk of code from line 8 to line 21 line 8 is a UL selector which means unordered list so the styling I'm giving it is that I don't want any style that is no bullets nothing that's what that means list style property I've set that to none so there will be no numbering or no bullets for that on other list items line 11 to 15 is the actual li list which is the this you use the li to list the item all right so the li selector uh, specify the font family of rocket and serif font size of 2m you can use m or you can use pixels the color I've set that to a hex value line 16 to 20 is the input selector where the type is a radio so when you select the questions you need to select which of the radio buttons so I've set that to set the properties on this one the border I've set it to 0 pixels the width 20 pixels the height again I've used M's here so you can use pixels if you like um, but you can if you it depends on which ones you are comfortable with M or pixels you can use with either I have added some more styling here from line 23 to 35 so I'll start with line 23 to 25 first um, so that the I'm using the P selector here the P selector is what was styling and the styling I've applied to is the font family is going to use rocket and serif will be the substitute font line 26 is a comment that's how you specify a comment in CSS so that line of code will be ignored because it is a comment line 27 is a class so this is a class called quiz container so the, the listed are the styling from 28 to 34 giving it a background color using the hex value the border radius property I've set to 8 pixels border radius is what gives it a kind of like a rounded corner the width I've sent I've set to 75% so it will be 75% of the parent container so whatever container the the quiz container is in it will take 75% of the width of that container that's what that means again you could use pixels if you are more comfortable with pixels line 31 is the margin I've set it to auto which means it will automatically center the quiz container okay auto means it will center it on the page that's what it means margin from the top that means from the top I want it to move down 190 pixels the padding margin is the space outside while padding is the space inside the element so I've set them to 190 pixels and 5 pixels respectively the position I've set the position to relative I have added some more properties and their values line 38 I've added a class called next button so the styling I have used for the next button class start with line 39 which is a border radius I've set that to 6 pixels 
width 150 pixels height 40 pixels text align i've set it to center so i want the button to be center background color i've set it use the hex value again you can use the color name if you know the color name but hex values are okay as well um here line 44 is just a comment so that code will be ignored line 45 is a color which refers to the color of the actual text 46 is a font family again i'm using rocket and serif 47 the font weight it refers to how thick or well, how thick the font would be so i've set that to bold position i've set it to relative margin to auto padding from the top 20 pixels okay i can get rid of 44 i was using that for to test a few things so i can get rid of that don't need that now i have added another class which is which is called question that's from line 51 to 61 so i've already gone through some of these properties with previous um, styling on this file so i'm not going to go too deep because i'll just be repeating myself so a lot of this styling we have used before so it's just the same thing height width and so on so i'm not going to run through that because i've done that with the other class i have added another class here called quiz message and these are the styling i've given that class again i'm not going to run through it because it's the same thing like i've done before with the other classes so basic the only difference here here i've not used the hex value i've used the actual color name i have added a couple more classes line 72 to 75 is the choice list class so that's obviously where you make your selection for the quiz answers so again similar thing the only difference here the font family is slightly different i've used courier and serif color i've set it to blue violet again 77 to 86 there's another class called result and the values properties and values i've specified are self-explanatory is a similar to what we've um, gone through before in this in, in this lecture for this file okay so again i ideally weight height everything we've mentioned before but if there's any part of this lecture you're not familiar with or if you're not sure about any of the styling please feel free to let me know i'll be more than happy to explain further so I will just save this document and then we can review our page and see what the document looks like after the styling have been applied. So this is what the page looks like at the moment. But when we are doing our JavaScript series, uh, we're going to use JavaScript to make it more interactive. So that's it for this lecture. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we will be creating the functionality for our app using JavaScript. This is going to be a two part lecture series. So this part one will start and we'll finish off in part two. So this is my JavaScript file. Um, the way this lecture is going to work, I am going to pre-write the code add the code on and then explain it so to start with i'm going to create a variable um, that i will call questions and inside this variable we're going to have we're going to set the variable to equals to an array and inside inside that array we're going to also have objects that will include the questions for the quiz the choices you have to make and then the correct answer so we're going to bundle all this up inside a variable and set that variable to equals to an array and that array will contain objects and also array within that object as well all right i have added some code on a chunk of code 
So line one here, I've created a variable called questions. Okay, and I've set that to equals to an array. So the, that's the beginning array there. If I scroll down and the array ends on line 53 here. So this is the closing array. Okay, and inside that array, you've also got objects. So where you see curly braces, you know that you're looking at uh, an object. Where you see square brackets, know that you are looking at an array. So inside this array and the object, we've got the question. So this is the question that the quiz will ask. And then this, uh, this is the actual question. With an object, you need to have a property and then obviously the value. So the question would be the property and this question here, this reply here will be the value. So I'm asking a question and this is a question. And then on line three here, we've got another object property called choices and the value is equals to an array. So inside that array is where the answers will be. So looping through that array, the correct answer would be three. An array, when you are accessing the elements in an array, an array is an is a zero base index. So the first one is known as a zero. So this will be baby. It says here the correct answer is three, which would be zero, one, two, three, which is lava. So you just remember that when you're numbering in an array, it starts, it's a zero base index. The first one is usually a zero and so on. So the format for this here is the format for all the questions inside this array. So all these are values of this variable called question. Everything here belongs to this variable called questions. So the format is the same. I ask a question, um, which is the property and then the value, which is the actual question. The choices are enclosed inside an array. And then we use the index base to pick out the correct answers. So the, all the format is the same all through. Okay. And that's the very last question. So you don't have to use the same. I've used um, baby names of animals. So you could do something you're completely interested in if you don't, if you don't want to follow, use baby names. So just as long as the format is the same, you should, the quiz should work as well. All right. But any parts of this you don't understand, please feel free to let me know. Line 55, 56 and 57 are new variables I have added. Um, the first variable is called here current question. It set, the value is set to zero and the correct answer, the value is set to zero. Variable quiz over is set to false. So all these, ver all these variables are set to zero or false. False is a Boolean value. Boolean means it's either true, or we say that the result is either one or the other. So it's either true or false. So if these are the values I've given the variables at the moment. I have added some more code here from line 59 all the way to line 91. All right, let me walk you through the code. Line 59, well, wherever you see a dollar sign, know that you are referencing a jQuery library. Line 59 basically says it's a document dot ready function. What this function does, it checks to make sure that the page is fully loaded before it executes the code. The, the dot ready is what checks to make sure that the page is, um, is fully loaded so that the code is not executed prematurely before the page is fully loaded. And the function, whatever happens once the page is loaded, is displayed within the function, which is this curly braces here, which starts on line 59 and ends on line 91. So let me run through the code with you. Line 60, display the current question. What that is, it will display the very first question. Okay. And then the 
61 the dollar and then the this inside the parameter this refers to the current element is referring to so it's saying this dot find in parentheses so it will look for the next quiz message dot hide okay so what that means is that it hides the others but finds the current one all right and then line 62 you then use the next button you say dollar and then it's passed in this what this the this method does using the dot find it will pick out the next question using the next button okay and you notice you have attached a dot on method here and this method takes in two parameters it takes in the click which is the event and the function so when there is a click on the button it will the click will be the event it will trigger off this function here which is the what happens between these curly braces and where's uh, yeah and this curly braces here so everything in here will be triggered once the next button is clicked so i've got an if statement on line 63 saying if the question mark the exclamation means that if the quiz is not over then the value equals to dollar which is a jquery input type radio button if the radio button is checked and the value if the value of the radio button is checked and the quiz is not over and if the value is not undefined that if the value is not unknown do this go pick out the document of find find look for the quiz message look for the text and then select the right answer. So it prompts you to select the right answer. Line 67, again, similar approach. It looks, picks out the quiz, and then it uses the dot show method to display the, the quiz. If, that is if, with an if statement, there are two conditions. It's saying, if the quiz is not over, do this. But if the quiz is over, do this. Find this document, yeah, dot find, using this find method, this quiz, and then hide. If the value is equals to questions, and it's passed in the current question, and the answer is correct, then the correct answer, you know, you add the correct, correct answer. That's what that means. If the current question plus plus means if it's in, you're increasing the question if the current question is less than the question length length of the question display the current question else display the score okay so it's again using the jquery library again if the document of find the next button is not once in next but basically what it's saying if you click on the next button it should display the, it should give you a prompt to play the quiz again. Say so if the quiz is over, if the quiz is over, the quiz is over means it's true. That means the game is over. You can start again. That's where this else else statement here. When if quiz over is false, yeah, that means the quiz is not over. Then do this. Click on the next button. Get the next question. If that's not the case, if the quiz is over, you can reset the quiz using this function, display the current question, and you can hide the score. So the score is hidden until the quiz or the questions have been answered. So that is it. We're going to stop here for this lecture because it's gone on a bit long. So we started off by defining a variable and setting the questions the question choices and the answers. Okay, and then we moved on. These are all the questions. Okay, and then we moved on to set three variables there. And we also have the document already method. And that's the rest of it. So that's it for this lecture. We'll complete it in part two. Thanks for watching. If there's any aspects you do not understand, please feel free to let me know. Bye for now.
Hello and welcome to the part two of this functionality for the app using JavaScript. I have added a chunk of code here from line 92 to 112. This function here will display the current question and the choices. So line 94, I'm doing a console.log and I passed it in display current question. So when the current question is displayed, it will show it on the console on the screen. Line 96 uh, declared a variable here called question and set it to equals to questions and then passed it an array of current question dot question. So that's the array. So you pick up the questions from that array. We remember we we defined a variable at the very beginning called questions. Okay. So, and we also defined some more variables here, line 55. We've got a variable called current question, and we've got one called current answer. So those are the variables it's referring to. All right, so when it says variable question equals to questions, which is that variable, and it's past it, current question dot question. Variable question class, again, equals to the way you see a dollar sign jQuery equals to this method. Again, it picks up this. This is the container container that wraps it. Dot quiz container. If say if this quiz container is greater than the question, then ninety eight. Where it's got choices, the variable called choices. Again, if that method dot quiz is greater than choice list. These are what the what the various variables have been defined at, and these are their values. Here we're using this here to set the question class. Okay, this here is a comment I've just put here. Question class dot text dot question. This will remove all current li elements if there's any. Okay, that's what this means. Choice dot find li and then remove them. Here, variable 107, variable choice, we've got a loop here, same for i, if the first value equals to zero, and the i is less than number of choices, then increase i, that is increase the question by one. If the choice is equals to the questions, current questions or choices, you pass to the i, which is the, represents the i acts as a counter, so it represents one. So here again, we're using the dollar sign and this the li list. Um, using the li is list to input a radio button. Okay, so it will add the radio button each time the choice is made. And then it appends it to the list. Okay, once the choice is made, it appends it to the list. The final function I've added here is from line 112 to 125 is a function called reset quiz. This function will reset the quiz and enable you to start again. So the, it, these are, this is what will happen when the quiz is reset. The current question, if say, if the current question is equal to zero, current answer is equal to zero, it will hide the score, it will call this function. This function is called, function or method called hide score. So it will hide the score. And then we've got here, another function, function called display, this function here will display the score. It's saying if the document of find the quiz container is greater than the result dot text, then it, it displays this text to say you scored X, X amount plus correct. You display what you, you, you display that text that says you scored plus the correct answers you've answered plus out of question. For example, you will say you scored five out of, you scored, you scored, say for example, four questions out of eight. Okay. That's what that means. And then it does the same thing. And then it shows the result using this show method. 
it shows the result here after it displays that. Then we've got a function called height score. This will use the document.find result and it will hide the result. So all these functions will be used at various parts of the code. So that's all the code for the functionality for the quiz app. If you have any questions, please let me know. So these are all the code. If there's any parts of it you don't understand, please let me know. So that's it. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this project, we are going to create RRS news feed. What is RRS? RRS stands for really simple syndication. It is used to share and view headlines and contents from various websites. It can be automatically updated once you have it set up. The files automatically update from the source where it's pulling the information from. RRS allows you also to personalize the views for different site contents. It is written in XML. You can create or we are going to create a simple RRS for a news item and we are going to use the Google Feed API to do this. API stands for Application Programming Interface. I am on the BBC website and the way you can identify a newsfeed is by the orange icon. All right, so these, this icon here is known as a newsfeed icon. You can see there are different newsfeed here. It's telling you to choose a feed you want. So you can have various news, various feed for different subject titles. As you can see here, there's one for world, UK, business, politics, and so on. So you can pick the relevant one that interests you and create a news feed for that. In this project, we are going to create a news feed, a BBC news feed, where it will automatically show us the current headlines as it occurs from that subject title. Let's have an overview. Let's have a look at what we are going to cover. Um, the objective and requirements. The goal here is to create RRS newsfeed. We're going to create an RRS for a news feed item. The tools we're going to use are basic HTML, some touch of CSS and some touch of JavaScript. We're going to be using the Google Feed API to implement this. We are going to need a text editor to write our code and a web browser to view the code. We also will to we also will see a basic introduction to the app. So we will see what we are going to build before we build it. We are going to implement a project directory and also create the structure for the RRS. And we also be creating the styling, basic styling for it. And finally, we'll be adding the functionality using the Google API and JavaScript. Hello, let's have a look at what we will be creating for this project. So this is what we'll be creating for this project. So this is a news feed from the BBC website. So we've um, extracted this feed from the BBC website. So as you can see there, it will, it's automatically updating from the BBC website. So you could, you could have feeds from different websites on different subjects. This news field, this feed here is just for news for current news all over the world. As you can see there, it's, it's called BBC News World. If I open up the BBC website, 
So this is the BBC website. You can see there are different feeds here. So the feed I am targeting here is this one called World. So it will be giving me all the updates on World News directly from the BBC. It also updates. If you can see there, it tells you the news as of one hour ago. Anytime there's an update, it tells you there 26 minutes ago. This is what happened. Okay, so if, if you're interested in knowing more, you just click on the link and you can read more about what's happening. So it's just giving you headlines, top headlines, all from around the world, and it will only update what has changed. You can tell you there it says 26 minutes ago, this is what happened. Um, some bad news there. And then an hour ago, it tells you this happened. So it gives you news updates around the world in as it happens okay so that basically that's what the news feed is so you can have news feed for different subjects but this illustration will be on just news hello and welcome in this lecture we are going to create the project directory and the files we will need for this project I have already created a directory for the project, which is this here on my desktop. And I've also created a couple of files inside that directory. So to create a directory or folder, if you're on a Windows, the easiest way will be to right click on your desktop, go new, create folder, and then just call it whatever you need to call it. Um, I'm using Sublime Text Editor. So once I created the folder, what I did, I opened up the directory, which is this, inside my Sublime Text Editor. Sublime Text is free to download and try out for a while. And then if you're happy, you can purchase. So it's recommended you purchase if you are happy with it. So the way I did it, uh, you just go file and then you go open folder and then you browse to the location of your folder. So once I picked up the location, all I did to create these two files, my index.html, this is a file that will be used to view the RRS feed. And this style here is just the styling, basic styling that will be applied to the RRS feed. Um, I'm not I'm not creating a separate JavaScript file because I'm going to incorporate the JavaScript inside my index.html because it's not going to be a large file. So I'm going to incorporate it inside there. All right. So that's basically how you create. You just right click and go new file. You give the file a name and then you save it as whatever extension. I've saved mine as index.html and then my style.css and it saves into the current parent directory, the root directory, which is the this one here. All right, so that's how I created the directory and the files. If you are on a Mac, you can do this via the terminal. On the terminal, you just do mkdir, that will create a directory. Once you're in the directory, you cd or change directory into that new directory you created. And then to create the files, you do touch. You use the touch command in the terminal to create the respective file. So you do touch index.html and then touch.mystyle.css and so on. All right. So that's it for this lecture on creating the directory and the files. Hello. In this lecture, we are going to create the structure for the RRS using HTML. So this is the HTML. I've already added code, so you don't have to watch me type. Thereby, we can save some time. So let me run through the code with you. Line one of the code is the doc type, which is a declaration. It's not part of the HTML code. What it is, it's a declaration and its function is to notify the web browsers or search engines that the content of the page that is about to be displayed is an HTML document. That's the main purpose of the doc type. The actual HTML content starts from line three and ends on line 22. So you can see you've got the opening tag 
on line 3 and the closing on line 22. We, you can see that the structure of the files are indented so that you can identify the parent and the child. So looking at the document you can say that the head and the body are child elements of the HTML while the meta tags and the scripts here they are all child elements of the HTML document. They are, sorry they are all child elements of the head and grandkids of the HTML tag. The content in the head section is not normally it's not visible it's there for informational purposes and also to assist the search engine with information on the content. So line 5 of the code we've got a meta tag and inside the tag we've got a attribute called car set. Basically it refers to the type of encoding used for the website. The standard um, international accepted encoding code type is UTF-8. So all websites should be able or all website browsers should be able to view this content. Line 6 is just the title for the web page. Line 7 we've got another meta tag with a attribute of name, value, viewport and another attribute inside there called content and the value is set to width equals device minus width comma initial dash scale equals 1. What this means is that this web page can be viewed on any device. The viewport refers to the device and then the content part of it refers to the actual size. So it's saying that this page can be viewed by any device regardless of how small or how big the screen for that device is. And I've set an initial zoom there on line 7 towards the end. So it tells you that you can also zoom in. So that is the initial scale where the zooming will start from. Line 8 is a reference to the style sheet we are going to use, which is this one here, the blank one. We'll put some basic styling in there later. Line 9 is a reference to the Google API and also to the dynamic feed. The, also a reference to the dynamic feed control. The dynamic feed control is a simple to use application for, it's kind of like a reference to the Google Ajax feed API. All right, that is designed to let you add feeds to your pages or sites. So I'll tell you what website I picked up that link from. Uh, if you go to this website here, I uh, typed in Ajax feed API. All right, so just type in Google Ajax feed API and it gives you some instructions here for adding the API to your site. So this is where I picked up the script from. This is the first script here. Um, and the, you don't need to worry about the key. You can just end that there. And then this is a script to the dynamic feed control. Make sure you've got all this copied exactly as I have done here on line 9 and line 10. Line 14 is a body tag. The main content of the feed will be inside the body tag. So inside the body tag we will implement our JavaScript later to access the news feed. So that's it for this section on creating the structure for our news feed. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome. In this lecture we are going to create the functionality for our RRS newsfeed using JavaScript. I have attached the JavaScript to our HTML file. So if you open up the HTML file, I've attached the script for this project to make it to make the newsfeed populate. So the script I've had it is from line 19 
to line 27. So rather than create a separate script and reference it, I've actually attached it. If you notice, I've attached the script just before the closing body tag. All right. So that's the beginning of the script here on line 19 and that's the end on line 27. The reason you attach the script to the closing body just before the closing body tag is that it enables all the other content on the page to load before the script is executed. All right. So line 19 is defines the opening script. Inside I've got an attribute called type and the value is test slash JavaScript. That attribute is not necessary. The script will still work without it, but it's just to make it fully compliant, but it's not necessary to attach the attribute to the opening script tag on line 19. Line 20, I've created a function called load and it inside, I've got inside the parentheses here, that's the opening parenthesis there and that's the closing on line 23. I have defined a variable called feed and I've passed and the variable I've set it to equals to the link, the URL to the BBC website where I am picking up the RRS news feed from. So this is a link to the URL. Now the dynamic this feed here you, you can have several urls attached or you know whatever urls you like so if i was to attach more than one i just um you know separate it with a comma a variable takes one stores one data so if i was going to attach several i probably will have to store them as an array line 22 um, what I've done on line 10, 22 there, I have added a callback. So I've added a new feed load callback. Don't forget we added a link here to the Ajax here on line 10. That's the link there. So line 22 there, I'm actually what I've done here, I've created a new, I've added a new feed load callback. So this would be a callback function. And the, the actual dynamic, the dynamic feed control takes either a single feed URL. Okay. Or you can take in an array of feed URL. So this new, this here, the feed, the callback, this would be the load callback. I passed it this variable here called feed. All right. And it takes, and also the, this field control here, which is this div ID. So I passed in two parameters here. The first is the feed, which is this variable here that I defined, defined the variable there on 21 called feed. So I'm passing it that variable called feed, and I'm also passing it this ID here called feed control. So inside this ID is where what this will do, it will take over this ID and inject the news feed inside this ID. That's what that means. All right. On line 24, um, what I'm doing here, I'm actually loading. So to load the actual Google feed API, I'm doing that with the Google dot load module. All right. The module takes in two parameters. The, the first parameter is actually the, the model itself. And then the next is the version. Okay. So currently we've got version one there. Okay. So this feeds here reference, reference is relating to the actual model we're using, which is a feed. And the one here refers to the version. All right. So line 24 will be used to load the actual feed line 25 it's an asynchronous callback function so this function is a synchronous callback to the google server to process the feed so line 25 we process the feed when the page loads all right so that's it that's all this javascript we need 
to implement this feed. So I'll just save that and I'll open up the web browser. I have also added some basic styling here to our CSS file. And basically line one here, I'm using the import. Um, before, if you want to use a certain type of um, styling, you need to import it. So that's what I've done here. I'm importing it from this location here. All right. And uh, line three, basically, I've got an ID called feed control. And this is what that I've got a, a div called field control. So this is what I'm applying to the vid to, to that div. So we've got a margin there, margin from the top, 85 pixels. That means I want the margin to drop to 85 pixels from the top. I want it to come down. So line five of the CSS basically uh, what auto means margin refers to the space outside the element while a padding refers to the space inside. So margin means from the left, I want it to center the div in all corners, right? So there are four corners, top, right, bottom, left. Line seven refers to the width, how wide it's going to be, the actual box, the div. I've uh, made it 450, 440 pixels. The size, I've given it 25 pixels. The size refers to the text. Um, again, the color, color refers to the color of the text inside. The border refers to the border around it. So I want the border to be blue. Padding refers to the space inside. So I'm saying padding from the top. I want you to move 35 pixels. Padding from the left. I want you to move from the left 35 pixels and then padding from the right and so on. So that's the CSS I'm, I've applied to the content of the RRS newsfeed. So I'll just save that and then let's go and view the feed and see what it looks like. So this is my directory. I'll just double click to launch it. Hopefully everything should be hunky dory. There we go. So we seem to have an active newsfeed. So you can see the news feeds are coming through at the moment. Um, you can see it, it will, it updates any current information that's been added to the newsfeed. You can sell, it tells you there three hours ago, something was added and then it keeps uploading. And then if you're interested in reading more, you just click on the link. Notice here that the content is being updated automatically. I've not had to go back to the BBC website to do something automatically. It feeds through. That's why it's called a feed. So it gets all the updates relating to the feed I have specified. So the feed, there are several feeds. I've only specified the feed relation relating to world news. So that's it for this project. You can explore more and also create more feeds that pique your interest. Thanks for watching. I hope it's been useful. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this section. In this section, we are going to be creating a contact form with local story. So let's have a look at the overview of what we'll study. So the objective here in this section is to create a contact form with local storage. HTML5 has local storage that enables the content you save to be saved locally inside the browser. Most modern web browsers have a local storage that enables you to store certain amount of data. So we'll be using JavaScript to implement the local storage. So you require a text editor and a web browser for this section. Um, I will be using Sublime Text, which is a cross-platform text editor that you can download for free. Um, it al allows you to use it, but it is recommended that you eventually pay for it if you decide you like it. Next, we'll look at the introduction to the app, followed by creating a project directory. 
then we'll move on to creating the structure for the app using HTML. We'll also be creating the presentation for our contact form app. And finally, we'll be implementing the JavaScript that will enable us to save the content that the form is submitted on. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I will be showing you a tour of the contact form we are going to create. And I will show you also how it stores data in local storage. This is the form we are going to create, the contact form. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to illustrate how it works. I'll just type in some details. So where it's got the name, I'll just type in discount. Master. Okay. And then on the email, I just say Udemy at discount dot com and then here message I just say discount coming soon and then I'll send it notice I've sent it the details are still on the screen so I use the reset to clear it so notice the name there Discount Master, Udemy Discount. I got the spelling wrong, but it doesn't matter. It's just an illustration purpose. And then I click Reset to clear the screen. So now let's have a look at where the data has been stored. So to access the local storage on your computer, just do F12 on your keyboard, and it should bring up a console like this. So if you, I am on Chrome, I'm using Google Chrome at the moment, but most web browsers should have the same functionality. So click on resources and then where it's got local storage, click to expand that and then click on file. You see that when you click on file, you see the sessions. This is what we've just submitted. The email was this, the message was this, and the name was discount master when you're storing in local when lo, when you're using local storage it uses what is known as a key value pair so every key must have a pair which is a value so the email is a key and the value is the content that's been submitted so these are the this is the data if i close my web browser and open it again this data here will still be there okay so that's what the local storage is here for so most modern web browsers should have a local storage facility all right so what i'm going to do i'm going to close the web browser and open it again and so that you can see that the data is still there all right let me close the web browser so i click on x to exit that and close that okay so i've just relaunched it that you can see is empty so if i go f12 and um, the data should still be there so i just expand that file and you can see the data is still there so we're going to use javascript to implement the local storage so that's it for this lecture thanks for watching bye for now Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to create the project directory and the files we'll need for the project. I am using a Windows based computer, but the process is the same on a Mac. So to create a directory, I've already created my directory here. Um, to, if you're on the Windows, all you need to do is right click and go new folder. 
OK, and then just name the folder whatever name you want. I've named mine contact form. All right. I am using Sublime Text Editor for this project. Feel free to use whatever text editor you, you like. Use what you're comfortable with. But the project will work regardless of the text editor. So once you've got your directory created, um, also name it appropriately and then open it in your text editor. I am using Sublime Text and I have got my directory open in my text editor. So these are the, this is my directory here and I have created three files that we will need. We've got the index.html file. This is the main view, what we'll use to view our contact form. And then we've got the JavaScript. This is a file that will implement the local storage. And then we've got the CSS where we'll use to style it. Okay, so if you are using Sublime Text, it's really easy to create files once you're in the editor you just right click and go new file if you want to create a folder it's the same process so i have already created the files here so i'm not going to do that again but you can do the same just create the three files index.html and um, notice that in the index.html i've already got some basic tags already in place I tend to have that for most of my projects so I can be up and running fairly quickly. So that's it for this lecture. We've got our directory created and we also got our three files. Um, you can name your files whatever name you like, but it's always best to name the in the HTML file index. Index basically is the first file that is kind of like the home page. Um, so, but name it whatever you like, as long as it's got the .html file, but good practice is to name it index. And also when you have projects, it's best to name your script and your CSS files as relevant as possible to the project. Notice here I've called mine contact.css and contact.js. Or do I've not used the same for index because index is kind of like commonly used for the home page of a HTML document. So that's it. Um, thanks for watching. Bye for now. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to create the structure for our contact form using HTML. I am in my project directory, so I'm just going to click on my HTML file here, which is the index.html. I've already got some basic tags already in the document, so these are what we'll, we'll be using for creating the struct. Um, I'll run through this. I'm sure you know what each of these tags do. Um, the first line here, doctype, basically lets the web browser know that this type of document is an HTML5 document. And then we've got the head section and the body section. Um, most tags, HTML tags are paired. So you've got the opening and the closing. Closing is identified with the slash, as you can see there. All right. And the you can see also the tags are well indented. It's always good to indent your code so do, you can read it better and it also helps others who have to read your code. So looking at this structure here, you can tell that the head and the body are both children of the HTML. I missed a tag here, so I just need to complete that. Miss the HTML opening tag. I missed out the L. Okay. All right, so the tags is now paid. You can see the under, the dotted underline there matches the one here. It tells you that the tags are paid. So we're going to start filling up each of these tags now. To make things move um, a bit uh, faster, because I don't want this lecture to go on forever, 
um, I've already read, written the code, so I will just explain parts, bits and pieces of the code as I paste them in. You can see I have also indented, so you can tell from the indentation that line four to eight are children of the head section. As you can see, I've indented them under the head. So let me run through the contents of the head section. So whatever is in the head section is for information purposes. They're not actually visible to the visitor. So the meta, meta car set, it's um you use that to define the code the character set you are using the standard is utf8 you can read up on it if you if you want to because i may not i don't want to elaborate on it too much in this lecture so that we don't miss out on the relevant stuff now, the meta name here again this viewport anything in green here is an attribute and the value are always enclosed in quotes. Wherever you see this viewport here, and you notice I've specified these values here, um, you need that so that any device can be used to view the web page or the application. So it will it enables the screen size, whatever screen size you use, it will fit and adapt to that screen size. That's what this all this bit in here is, the scale the scale basically is the zoom level. All right, on line six here, I've got the title for my form. Line seven, I have attached a link to my style sheet, which is the style sheet I have created here, which is this one here. So I've just attached a link to that. I've also got, because we're going to be using jQuery jQuery is a JavaScript library. So rather than install it, I have created a reference to it um, via a CDN. CDN means Content Delivery Network. Rather than install it, uh, installing it, I am accessing it directly from Google. This is very useful. So if you want to know how this works, just type in CDN. In, in your browser and it will tell you all about it. So I've attached a reference to that here. Okay, so this will enable me to use jQuery in this project. So that's it for this head section. Okay, so I have now pasted some code in. So I pasted some code in into the body section, which is from line 12 all the way to line 33. So basically this are the tags we'll use to create the actual form. So inside here, again, you notice I've indented them properly. You notice here the form, I've, this is what you, this is the tag you need to create a form. So this is the opening tag for the form. And then if I scroll right down, I've got the closing tag there. And inside that form element, we've also got, I've got an H1 tag. <coughs> H1 is an heading tag. And then we've got a field set for the form, which we'll use to identify the various fields. A label here is used to label the form. For example, label 
this is an attribute and the value is name so my form here when i launch it it will have this field here called name and it's got an input input basically is where you type in something that's an input field uh, give it the values text so everything in green here is an attribute and the values are enclosed in quotes so i've also given it an id here called name so if you notice the same thing here so that would be the name section where people will type their name and this i've also attached a class here called stored we'll use this class later in our javascript again same process this is where they'll enter the email the label again to label the field and we've got attributes and then we've got some id as well and also this class here remember that a class can be reused several times an id is unique so this is the text area where they'll actually type the message again we've got the label tag here to label it and this is the attribute to, and the value is message again i've attached the same class here called stored we're going to use this later for our script javascript and then this is the end of the field set for the form and i've attached a button this will be the submit button so when people are finished they will submit there and that's the end of the form and then i've attached a script here a link to our javascript that we will so this will be the link to the javascript it's always good to attach your javascript files just before the closing body tag that way it does not prevent other contents from loading so that is it for this section we have now created the structure for our form if i save this and then we can view and see what the form looks like at the moment i just click save all so this is what the form should look like at the moment without any css applied so you can see css makes it pretty um, so this is it for the form so if you've got something like this well done so that's it for this lecture in the next lecture we are going to implement our css to make this form look a bit prettier thanks for watching bye for now hello and welcome to this lecture in this lecture we are going to be creating the presentation style for the contact form we're going to use css to make the form look prettier so this is how the form looks at the moment by the end of this lecture it will look much more prettier than this okay i am inside my project folder in my text editor and this is the css this is where we'll write our css again to save time rather than you watch me type the format will be that the code i've already written i will paste in chunks at a time and then explain it to you so with css every in order to style an element in css you need to know the property and then the value so the body here is referred to as the selector so that's the item i'm trying to apply styling to so with every, this is basically how you write the css syntax you start with the selector and then curly braces that's the opening and that's the closing and in between the curly braces is where you specify what you want the selector to do i mean what styling you want to apply to the selector what i'm saying here i want the font family that is the text they use to be either sans serif or arial so when you are specifying font families it's always best to specify more than one when specifying the font family you need to specify more than one just in case the computer or device that is being used to view this page 
does not have maybe your first choice so this is the first choice if they haven't got it it will look for that if they haven't got that it will look for that so most computers really do have one or two of these forms so you're very you're safe to use um, these um, selection because you're very likely to find most computers have them and then here I've got notice when I have specified the font family I've separated each one with a comma and the final one that's the semicolon all your CSS the property must end with a semicolon the value for the property so again here I've defined another property which is a color so I want the color here to be this this is an hex value X, rather than use the actual color name I've used the hexadecimal value and um, this is a good website um, that I go to as well it's called color-hex.com again you can see different colors so try and use your own colors when you're creating this form so that it looks different and has your own um, impact on it so these are the hex colors so always use them or you can use the actual color names if you know what the names are okay I pasted another set of styling here from line 5 to 12 always end your values for your property with a semicolon if not it will not work it's very important little things like this if you miss that out it will not reflect in the styling okay so this is the styling for the actual form itself um, the width I've set it to that the margin margin basically is the distance from is the outside distance why padding is refers to the distance inside so when you think of margin think of outside padding is the space inside while margin refers to the space outside when you set the margin to auto auto means it will center the element on the page so notice I've used auto here I've also used 10 pixels when you set the margin you usually set top right bottom left so this will ap apply to two values and this will apply to two values when you use the how to remember the way the the margin works or how you apply them think of the word trouble and then take out the vowels which are the o's so you'll be left with t r b l which is top right bottom left that's how i remember the steps to style them okay so here i've given it padding 15 pixels and these two values will cover all of them when you are specifying two values for a padding um, normally what that does the when you this is kind of like a short form way of doing it rather than specifying the four values so when you specify two value the first value will be applied to the top and the bottom and then the second value will be applied to the right and the left okay so first value goes to top and bottom second value goes to right and left is the same process with the padding as well whereby you've got two values specified it will be applied in that order um, background I've used a hex value here this means black 000 padding again from the bottom what padding I'm saying that from the bottom I want you I want the space I want it to move to create a space of 55 pixels to move up and um, border radius is what gives it the rounded corner so I've set this to 25 pixels feel free to play around with these values so that you can see how it works I have pasted in some more styling from line 14 to 19 this is the styling I'm applying to the h1 selector um, these are the properties and um, the margin I've set it to that notice I've used all four values here font size I've set it to that font size means the text size I've, I have set the text to align to the center and the color is white this is the this means white in hexa value 
I pasted some more styling from line 20 all the way to line 34. The process is basically the same. Once you can style one element, the styling is the same. Again, these are the selectors and these are the styling I've applied to them. If you're not sure what any of these mean, um, you can read them up or contact me. I'll be more than happy to explain, but the styling basically the same for everything. Um, border, I specified that I don't want there to be any border. You've got the font size, height, padding, all these we've mentioned, I've mentioned before in the in earlier style. So the process is exactly the same. I did have um, a box shadow there, but I've taken that out now just to keep it really simple. I have pasted in the styling for the button, which is the submit button. So that's from line 34 to line 47. Again, the process is the same. Basic styling, padding, color, text align, and so on. It's basically the same thing. Okay, I've got more styling here from line 50 to 60. This is the field set and the label. Field set is what it's what um, houses the content of the form, like the label where you submit your name and stuff. So that's what I've given it. And this is the label, the actual name. And these are the values, the properties and values I've attached to that, to that selector. Okay, finally, my last style in here is from line 61 all the way to 75. Um, this is anywhere you see a hashtag here, that means it's an ID. So this ID here, this is refers to the button, the reset button. So when you've submitted the form, if there's any data left, this, this, the reset button will clear the data. So this is just the styling to make it look pretty. All right, so again, the process is the same, the same type of styling, background color, text align, margin, width. You can always, you can set width to percentage or in pixels. When you set percentage, it is relative to the container that the selector is in. So that is it for our styling. So let me just click on save to make sure all the work has been saved. Let me bring that. Always save your work once you've done it so that there are no issues. So work is saved. I just refresh the contact form and we can see, voila. So there you go. So this is how it looks at the moment. So you can see it looks a lot prettier than how it was. So we have now applied styling to our form. And next lecture, we'll be doing the, CS, the JavaScript to implement the local storage. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Let me know if you have any questions. Bye. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to create the function for the contact form that will enable someone to enter the details and also submit the details on the form. And it will then save it to the local storage on the local machine. So this is what the form looks like at the moment. At the moment, it's not very um, functional, so we can type in details in here and send it, but it will not go anywhere. So in this lecture, we're going to implement local storage. Before we begin with our JavaScript, let me just open up the index.html file and just highlight something for you. We created a class. Let me just go through that. So we have a class here called stored, stored. And I've attached that class to all the labels like the name field, the email field, and the message field. They've all got the class stored. So what, what this will be, the 
this will allow the form elements to be stored. So anywhere you have the class stored use, the data submitted to that will be stored using this stored class. So what I'm going to do in this lecture, like previous ones, is just um, to save time again, is explain the code as I copy chunks of the code in. So we're going to we're going to be using jQuery. jQuery is a JavaScript library. We've already got a reference to the library via the Google CDN, which is a content delivery network. So there's no need to install it. So the first thing I'm going to paste in here is this code here. Anywhere you see the dollar sign, know that you are referencing a jQuery library. So basically what this does, this um, code here, this document here is what's passed into the code and this dot ready method, what that does, it checks jQuery checks to make sure that the web page is fully loaded before the code executes. It doesn't want the code to execute prematurely. So that's, this is used to check that it looks out for the page and make sure that the content or the page is loaded fully before it notifies jQuery to inject the code or to use the code. So before any JavaScript is JavaScript code is executed. This here on line one is used to check that the document is ready so that the code does not execute too early. I have pasted some coding from line two to line 14. So I'll just explain what's going on here. Okay. So basically what's happening here is that a function called init. This init here is a function. The function called init is run when the page is first loaded. So what this function does, it checks to see if any data is stored for each of the field. And if there is data, it adds the data to the relevant form element. So as you can see here, this is what it does. So this is anything between this curly, this is the main curly braces here. So this is the end. This is when the init function is called. So to call this function here, this is what, this is how it's specified. You just write the name of the function followed by the parentheses and it will call the function. So I've said here line three that if Okay, if the local storage name trace the name that has been entered by someone, if the name is, if there's something there, this here, this dollar sign here is a jQuery and inside here is an ID. So if it looks for this selector here, this selector ID called name and it evaluates it. If there is a matching data, if there's anything entered, it will put it inside local storage under the title name. The same thing here, if it searches for this ID email, it will evaluate it and put it in local storage under this title email. So for example, if you've got several emails typed in, this is an array. Anywhere you see square brackets, you are looking, referring to an array. So these are arrays, these square brackets, which means it, they can contain more than one value. Okay. Um, again, the same process here, it checks if there's any message in this, in this um, ID here called message. If there is, it evaluates it and pops it into local storage on that the key or label message. All right. So that's basically how this init function works. So the function is defined on line two and it is called on line 13. Okay, so I've pasted another code in from line 16 to 19. 
Uh, basically, what this code this code is doing here. So what's happening here is that the this code here this dot change this dot um, this here is the class that is attached to each of the labels the message they like the message the email and the name this class and that's the jQuery here uh, inside there is the selector so this function here what the the change this is a change event for function basically what that does the change event only occurs when the value of an element has been changed it usually works with inputs text area select and so on usually with form elements this is used so it looks out for a change in event so what it does it will check if there's any change the function will then add the data that has been inputted into local storage this here this dollar sign and then this what this is this is actually is a selector it is used it references the current html element so wherever you see this use is referencing to the current html element so this is dot and then this is the attribute and this is the name all right so basically what's happening here in this little function here the function checks to see if there's any change and then pops the change into local storage okay so we're done now you just need to save always save your work just click save all and then i'll launch the form and see and then now we should be able to type something in okay so you don't have to watch me type i've just typed in a name here james bond um, email james at 007 and this is a message so if i click send okay and this and then i click reset if i go to the browser now just do f12 okay so the form has been submitted and these are the contents so this was what was typed in for the email james at 007.com and the message i said where is the party at and the name was james bond so it has saved what i typed in to the form into local storage so that's it for this project on creating a contact form with local storage please feel free to contact me if you have any any issues at all i'll be more than happy to help um, i hope you know you're not overwhelmed by it all but feel free to contact me i really would love to help take care of the best and i hope it has been useful bye for now hello and welcome to this project in this project we are going to create your own tip calculator the tip calculator will enable you to calculate the percentage you have to pay for a tip let's have an overview let's see what we're going to study the objective and requirements here the goal is to create your own tip calculator the development tools you need are html css and javascript the requirement environment will be a text editor well, you need that to develop or write our code. We'll also need a web browser to view the result of the code we have written. So what we will learn will entail the introduction to the app, creating the project directory, creating the structure of the app using HTML, creating the styling for the app using CSS, and creating the functionality for the app using JavaScript. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I will be introducing you to the app. This is the app we are 
going to create for this project. I've called it a tip calculator. It will enable you to calculate the amount of tip you have to pay. Say, for example, I go to a restaurant and after I've been presented the bill, we've been told that we have to tip 10%. So to help us determine what that 10% will be, we'll come to our calculator. Say the bill came to say $75 and we were told we have to tip 5% of that. So we'll type in 5% and go calculate. So it tells us here that the percentage we have to add to the bill is $3.75, making the total we have to pay $78.75. That's the basic functionality of this calculator to help you calculate the percentage you have to pay for a tip. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we will be creating the directory and files for our project. I have already created my directory. That's my directory there. If I open it up and you can see my files. So I've got the index.html file, my script, which is a JavaScript, and my CSS, which is a style. So to create a directory, if you're on a Windows machine, all you have to do, right click on your desktop and go new and then folder. And once you click on the folder, just give it a name and you can create the files inside that folders. I am using a text editor called Sublime Text. You can download and use it for a while and then purchase if you're happy with it. Um, there are other good text editors out there. For example, Brackets is a good one also. It's cross-platform. It will work on any platform. So will Sublime Text. If you're on a Windows, you can use Notepad++. That's a good one also. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up this directory inside my text editor. So I've got it open. So this is the directory inside my text editor. If you decide to use Sublime Text, it's easy to access your directory from the editor. All you need to do is go to File and then Open Folder and then Browse to your directory. Um, I've already attached to my directory. That's it there. And I've created three files. So if I expand the directory, these are the files. My index.html, my CSS, and my, my JavaScript and my CSS. So the HTML file must have a .html extension, the JavaScript must have a .js, and the CSS must have a .css extension. So you can name yours whatever you like, but make sure they have the right extensions, okay? And once you've done that, you can just, you know, get ready for writing your code. So that's it for this lecture. We have created our directory and files we will need for our project. Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we are going to be creating the structure for our app using HTML. I am inside my text editor. So I'm just going to expand the directory and click on the HTML file. So this is where we will create the HTML code for our app to create a structure. So the way I'm going to structure this lecture is to add a chunk of code at a time and then explain the code to you. Okay, I have added a chunk of code. So from line one to 13, these are the basic tags you will see on any website or web application. They all will have a doc type, the HTML tag, the head tag, title, and the body tag. The on line one, the doc type basically is to instruct or notify 
the web browsers or whoever is going to access this application to tell them that this document you're about to view is an HTML document. So it's for instructional purposes. The actual HTML code is from line two to line 13. As you can notice, the tags have been indented so that you can see the parent and child relationship clearly. So you can see that the head and the body are children of the HTML element, while the title is a child of the head element. All tags are paired from line two to line 13. So you've got the opening, which is the head, which, which is the HTML there, and then you've got the closing HTML. You can tell the distinction between the opening and closing tag because the closing tag has a forward slash before the name of the tag. So you can see the dotted lines under there and the dotted lines under there. It means that the tags match. If I do the same with the head, you can see the dotted lines, that means they match. And then the body, you can see they all match. I have added some more chunk of code. So line four to line nine, uh, the code I've just added on. So the meta tag, uh, meta tag basically are used to provide information. So most of the stuff in the head section uh, provide inf extra information about the document. And also you can add access to other external document like the style sheet on line eight and the script on line nine. Okay, so the meta car set, car set basically this attribute here is a represent and the value, every attribute must have a value which is enclosed in quotes. So the quotes there is UTF-8. What it means, the meta car set is the encoding type that this document supports. Most, um, the, the UTF-8 is the standard encoding type that most documents support. That means a lot of the characters can be read. The meta tag on line five with the attribute of name and value of description also provides description for the page. The content attribute is percentage calculator. So all this information will help the search engines to serve up the request that a viewer types into the search engine. Say for example, if someone's looking for a tip calculator, these information are provided here in the head section will guide them to this page. Um, line six, this meta name here is viewport. Viewport basically enables you to view, enables the application or the web page to be accessed and viewed correctly by any screen size, regardless if it's a cell phone with a little screen or a tablet with a large screen or a 20 inch monitor. Regardless of the screen size, it will automatically resize to fit that screen size. That's what this line six is saying. And the initial dash scale is the initial zoom that is set. So it enables you to zoom in and zoom out of the device. Line seven is the title. Line eight is a link to the external style sheet we'll be using, which is a style sheet here. And we are going to be using a JavaScript library to create the functionality for the app. And that is called jQuery. We haven't got it installed, but we have a link to the library. Um, Google, this is from Google. So if it's called a CDN, link. CDN stands for Content Delivery Network. Sometimes some of these content delivery networks like Google, Microsoft and others, they can host a lot of these libraries for us. And the advantage of doing that is that they are current and they can be updated without you doing anything. All you need to do is add a link to that library, which is what I've done in line nine. I have added some more chunk of code from line 15 
all the way to line 24. So let me explain the code for you. Line 14 here basically is a heading tag, uh, which is a H1 tag. I'll use that to define the title. The title is called tip calculator and I've added a span element. Span enables you to join two texts together so they appear as one. I've given the span an ID of percent PELC and also given the the the, the heading or the text that we show for the heading will be tip calculator. Okay, I'm going to enclose the actual calculator inside a form. So this is a tag for the form. I've given the form an ID attribute with a value of calculator. Every attribute must have its value in quotes. The IDs are also important because you can use the ID to style the element with CSS. On line 16, I've attached a paragraph tag and inside an input. So we've got a paragraph and inside the paragraph, I've got an input tag with an ID of amount. So this would be an input where something will be typed in. Anything called input, it means you have to type something in. Line 17, that's another paragraph. And then next to the paragraph, I've got another input called percentage. So again, this is something that you have to type in. On line 19, you notice on line 18 here, I've got um, a comment. So this is how you write a comment in HTML. Left angle brackets, exclamation, dash, dash, and then that. Anything that's a comment, will not be displayed by the web browser. So comments are useful. You can use them to troubleshoot and see what works and what doesn't work. So I don't need this, so I just get rid of that. And then on line, let me bring that up a bit. On line 18, I got a paragraph tag as well with some text and another input tag. And I've got the attribute for the tag and I've also got this attribute called disabled with the value disabled. What that means, the disabled attribute is like a Boolean attribute. Boolean means true or false. When it is used, it specifies that the input element should be disabled. What that means is that um, no one, the users cannot type anything inside this input box. And the reason for that is that I don't, the way the application will work, they will type in the bill amount, they type in the percentage, and then will we'll calculate before the input, before this tip and total value are displayed. So the calculator will control how these are displayed. So these are disabled, that means the users will not be able to enter or click on this. Okay, so the values will be populated by the calculate option. Line 20, I've got another input tag with an ID of add up and it says submit button. So this is the button we'll use to perform the calculation. On line 23 is the script. Um, is this is a link to the script. If I was going to use my own personal script and not the jQuery library, this is where I will add it. So, but for this project, I'll be using the jQuery library. I'll be using the jQuery library, but actually writing the script for the jQuery inside my script file. Even though I'm referencing the script I'm gonna be writing, it will be jQuery, which is a JavaScript library, but it will be accessing the library from Google, even though I'm specifying the script inside a JavaScript file. So that's it for this lecture on the structure of the application. So if I save the document, and open up the application, you can see what it looks like. So I just double click and go index. 
you can see what the application looks like at the moment. So this is what the application looks like at the moment. We've just created a structure using HTML. In the next lecture, we'll be applying styling to make it look prettier. Thanks for watching. Bye for Hello and welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, we'll be creating the styling for the app with CSS. I have got my text editor opened and I'll be writing my CSS inside here. You can see you've got a CSS file there highlighted. The way this lecture is going to work, I'm going to add a chunk of code each time and then explain the code to you. I think it will create more value um, me just explaining the code put to you rather than you watch me type and take up so much time. I have added some code from line one to line 11. So when you are applying styling with CSS, you need to first of all identify the element you're trying to style. Just like going to a barber, you need your hair will be the element. So here in this case, the ID calculator is the target here. So if we pop over to our HTML file, we'll notice here the form here is called a calculator, the ID. So with CSS, you, you identify an ID with the hash symbol. And when you write it, make sure there are no gaps between the tag, hashtag, and the name. So I'll run quickly through the styles here. So every, st every element you style, must act as a selector. So in this case, the ID is a selector. And then you you place the properties. The property is what you want to style. And then you have the value. And you separate the property from the value with a colon. As you can see the colon there. So what I'm saying is that I want the background color on line two. I want the background color for the calculator to be this value. So this is a hexadecimal value. This is a website I use a lot. It's, that's the address here for the website. So you have different hex values here. So if you're not sure what the actual color names are, you can use the hexadecimal values, which are preceded with the hashtag here. So this is where I got most of my colors from. And you have to end your your statement with a colon. So once you finish the styling, once you've identified the property and the value, you now end it with a semicolon. Without the semicolon, it will not work. Again, line three here is a width. I've set the width to 450 pixels. That's how wide I want the calculator form to be. The height, I've given it 350 pixels. The color is the color of the text. So any text that will be typed in will be white. So that is the value for white in hexa value. Padding refers to the space inside the element. So I've given it 55 pixels. And with padding, you can apply padding to all four corners. So you've got the top, the right, the bottom, on the left. So it's applied in that order whereby you specified a single value, like I've specified 55 pixels, it will apply it in the order of top, right, bottom, left. And you can remember that using the word trouble, taking out the vowels, which are the O's, that leaves you with top, right, bottom, left. Border style means you don't want any styling on the border. So that's why I've set it to none. Border radius, I've set it to 25 pixels on line 9. Uh, border radius is what gives the, the form a bit of a rounded corner. Okay, so play around with these values and see how your form looks. Margin, what margin does, margin refers to the space outside, while padding refers to the space inside. So what I'm saying is that I want the margin from the top to drop 50 pixels. All right, again, margin is similar to padding in terms of how you apply it. It's top, right, bottom, left. So when you have one value specified, 
it will be applied to top right bottom left okay notice i've used margin auto auto will automatically center the margin automatically okay will top right bottom left usually it centers it i've again used on line 11 i've added on another margin from the top just to make sure it come the form is dropped down from the top i don't want it too high that's what that does i have added some more tags here styling so from line 14 to line 27 line 14 here is the styling for the input so the actual input so i've set it to float to the right of the container which is the form it will move right and clear both property on line 17 makes avoids the input input element from colliding so where there's a collision it will separate the collision that's on either side that's what the clear both means i've set a width on line 18 height on 19 the margin on 20 text align means i want the text to be centered um, that's the property and then line 22 font weight means i want it to be bold that's what font weight means you can set it to be bold all right line 25 is the paragraph element the p stands for paragraph so i'm styling the paragraph with a font size of 35 pixels i have added some more styling here from line 28 all the way down to line 49 so let's have a look at this at this id attribute here so this add up here is the actual button that or the input type that you use when you want to add up so i'm applying styling to that so this is the styling i've given it a background color with this value border style i don't want no styling on the border border radius i've explained what that does. and I've got the width the height the color color ref refers to the text that you type inside that input okay font size is the actual size of the text and then margin refers to the space around the element so i'm saying that from the right i want the margin to come down 120 pixels so that's the styling for the add up id and then we've got the h1 element which is the heading so this is the styling i've given to the text uh, font size 65 pixels text align color i've given it that to apply if this is how on line 44 is a comment anything that's a comment is neglected by the web browser and the styling is not applied so if you want to troubleshoot something you can just use this asterisk to troubleshoot so that line 44 here will not be applied because i have commented it out line 46 to 49 this is another id called percent and i've applied a color to it just a color that's what i that's the property i am assigning to this id and i've given it a hex value so this percent let's see what it is percent if we go back here the percent here is the actual span element okay so the span element i've given it an id of percent so one part the span is used to join two texts together so this part here will be given a separate color from this other part that's what this styling is doing here so that's it for the styling if i save this okay so this is what the document looks like at the moment the app so if i refresh this the styling should be applied okay so you can see now with the styling it looks a little bit prettier okay so but you can't do anything with it you can see here you can type stuff but nothing will work I'll say if, because I've not implemented the JavaScript. So if I do that and type in that, I press in calculate, nothing would work. Uh, also, 
notice I can't type anything in here and anything in here because once you calculate the value will be popped into this the disabled notice when we were creating the input element I use a disabled attribute in the HTML part so that's what this does it prevents you from clicking or adding something to these two inputs okay these two inputs will be populated once you've calculated the values that's it for this lecture thank you so much for watching bye for now in the next lecture we'll implement the functionality using jquery which is a javascript library hello and welcome to this lecture in this lecture we'll be creating the functionality for the tip calculator with javascript i have got my text editor open and this is my javascript file and um, this is where we are actually going to be writing the jquery code to create functionality for the app jquery is a javascript library the way this lecture is going to work i'm not um, very good at multitasking say writing the code and explaining at the same time so the way the format here is that i will write the code and then i'll explain it to you afterwards so that you don't have to watch me type and explain at the same time so i'll write and then i'll explain okay so on line one here i have created a function um, so i've defined this is i'm going to define the function in between these curly braces so if i just tap to expand them and what the function will do it will perform the actual calculation so in between the curly braces there i'm going to define some variables a variable is used to hold some information so a variable will store a piece of information so i'm going to create a few variables to hold various information okay i have created some variables here from line three to six so i'll just run through them with you line three here i've created a variable called amount so we'll use this to retrieve the values from the amount and the percentage fields and then store them inside the variables okay so the variable amount will store that also line four here we've got a variable called percentage also this will be used to store the percentage values and then the dot val means it will calculate the, the value okay line four line five again created a variable called tip and the value equals to the amount times the asterisk there means times times in in the parentheses we've got percentage so notice that yeah in the parentheses we've got percentage divided by 100 okay so the tip amount we're trying to find the value of the percentage it will be whatever amount we enter for the tip times the percentage and this is how you find the percentage you you divide by a hundred that will give you the percentage that's what that line five is line six is a variable that will store the total amount plus the tip okay so this will give you the total so once we've calculated the percentage of the tip it will will add that to the value of the total amount so these are all um, the variables store various values notice that the every variable must have a value and the values here have have um, the values are equals to functions so we've got different functions here so this anywhere you see a dollar sign being used know that you are referencing the jquery library so the dollar sign indicates a jquery library so line three here we've got the variable amount equals to this um, function here this jquery function and the name of the function is amount that's the value we've passed into it okay and line four again that's another function 
line 5 is we use line 5 to calculate the actual tip amount and then line 6 6 here we've created a variable and the variable is equals to the number function and inside the number function we've passed it the the argument of amount um, one thing you need to know that the actual number function on line 6 the number function the amount is actually a string a string is actually a text so by adding a number to a string makes it makes it longer so the, so the string we actually have to convert it convert the string into a number first using the variable total equals number and then pass it an argument of amount then we add the tip okay i have added some more functions here from line 8 to line 14. again anywhere you see the dollar sign use know that we are referencing a jquery library um, just a quick notice notice that all the like this on line 3 here this here this id that i have passed in here is the, we define this id inside the html so we've got the id amount percent and total if we pop over to the html we can see where we've defined it so we've got an id here the input id called amount got another id called percent we've got an id called tip so that's where we've got the values from from these are all id attributes that we have defined inside the html so we are now calling them and using them as an argument in our jquery function okay let's focus on the code we've just added on so from line 8 to line 14 okay um, created some functions here note um, so we're going to use these functions to actually store the values in the result fields so note that we we can call the call to the fix, to fixed action this is on line 8 here okay the tip to fixed action note that the to fix action function uh, what big the what is it this is a property of all the numbers this makes sure that there are only two two digits after the decimal see the two in parentheses there is this function here it enable it makes sure that there are only two digits after the decimal point okay that's what it is used for same thing with line nine here the function here ensures that the decimal decimal points are only two digits okay make sure that the numbers are two digits after the decimal point that's what they are for and then the return basically it will return false if you know if the value is false the use of the return here on line 11 actually prevents the prevents submission so basically what is return false is usually used inside a callback um, to prevent default behavior okay so in relation to this this code here it will in it will um, prevent the form from submitting so it doesn't submit the form so in in a nutshell what that means is that any line of code after the return force will not be executed okay that's that's basically what what this return is so the we've now got a submit event function here which is on line 14 so this is a jquery here and the selector is picked is the calculator id which is the actual form and we've it's attached a dot submit event to the function okay and it's passed it 
calculate which is the actual button that you press to do the calculation so what that does is submit event functions must return false okay so to those this tells the browser not to load a new page that's what the return false is okay so it tells the browser not to load a new page so any code outside underneath this code here will not load a new page that's what the return false means okay and here on line 14 here we've attached this function here we've attached the function to the form submit event so this function we've attached it to the submit event so that's it for this function so we've created the function now and the calc the percentage calculator should work so i'll just save this and um, if there are any aspects of this lecture you do not understand if i've not made myself clear enough please feel free to contact me i'll be more than happy to explain a bit further also you could any of the code part of the code you're not sure of you can just um, research it or contact me i really will be pleased to help okay so i've saved it so if i open my calculator um, we should be able to perform some calculations okay this is a calculation so let's test it out say for example we have a bill of 80 dollars and we told we need to pay a percent of a percentage of say 10 percent so we'll come here and click on calculate Ooh, let's see all right i hadn't saved it properly okay so we can see here now let me do that again i clear that so that you can see i just clear this field okay i'll just refresh my browser all right so if i pop in a new value there say for example we had a bill of 85 dollars and uh, we're told we have to pay 5% in tips. So we click calculate and it tells us that the amount of tip we're paying is $4.25. So the total amount will be $89.25. So we've tested the calculator for the tip and it works perfectly. Thank you so much for your time. I hope the project is useful. Take care and bye for now.